otter is to fish is what surplus energy is to modern day man and woman. And just like fish are not aware of water, we are not aware of energy. And yet it is the single most important enabler for life as we know it today. This is the most important graph that I would like you to remember of my entire presentation. We're already halfway through, so not too many to come. The graph is only starting in 1790. So this is well below, before the discovery of coal in the United Kingdom and Robert Stevenson inventing the steam engine, etc., etc. Then you see where the blue line begins. That is around Robert Stevenson's engine, so 1850. And then it runs on till about now. Now, I could actually make this graph a lot bigger by adding years before and adding years after. And then the blue part will be looking like this. It will be a peak. Now, let me talk first about the energy that our ancestors used before we discovered coal, oil, and gas. They used renewable energy. They used sun, they used wind, both for windmills and for shipping with sails. And if they were smart, they used water power. And they were very, very aware about the limited quantity and the intermittent quality of energy. Because if there's no energy, then there's no economic activity. So society up till 1860 was an economy driven by energy supply. If there is energy, then there is activity. No energy, no activity. And that change, that, that was most of the biggest changes in the history of our species, that we actually were able to tap into prehistoric solar energy. Because coal, oil, and gas is solar energy, but it is prehistoric solar energy, whereby nature converted that energy in a battery of hydrocarbons made by plants, by trees. They convert solar power, the leaves are like the solar panels, and they convert it into building blocks that later on became oil, gas, coal, etc. So it's very important that particularly an elite like you, an intellectual elite like you, do understand the difference between solar flows and solar stocks. If I make the analogy with money, it's the difference between cash flow and capital. If you are very rich and you have capital, you can even build this, buy this building and pay it on the spot because you've got capital. I assume that most of you do not have that much of capital. You can still buy this Odeon Theatre if it is for sale, but you probably have to go to a bank and then demonstrate that you got financial cash flow over a long period of time, as a result of which you can fulfill the obligation to pay off the bank, and if you can do that, they will give you the capital to buy the theater. So please do understand the difference between cash flow and capital, and between solar flows and solar stocks. Because our history is that we lived for most of the two, three hundred thousand years that we've been here on this planet, we lived on solar stocks. And it is only a few generations that are able to live on solar stocks. After this, we'll have to live again on solar flows because the solar stocks are finite. And I can tell you how much there is. The solar stocks were created in a period of 500 million years. That's how long plants have been on this planet. And over the last 200 years, we consumed about half of that. So that means that we consumed 200 million years of prehistoric solar stocks in 200 calendar years. Well, that's easy calculation. That means that per calendar year, we used one million years of prehistoric solar energy. Now, of course, that's the average since 1860, but you all know that we consume much more energy now than 150 years ago. 
So whilst one million years of prehistoric solar flows as energy per calendar year, on average, in reality it went like this. And in 2019, we consumed 4.2 million years of stored prehistoric solar energy. 4.2 million years. Now, we have been here for 200,000, 300,000 years, so that's 0 0.2, 0 0.3 million years. So in 2019, we collectively consumed an amount of energy that nature needed 22 times longer than we have been on this planet to produce that. And we consumed it in one year. Now, that is something to pause about. And why is this important? Because this blue carbon pulse that we use a million times faster, the nature trickle charge. We all have got handies. You know, you know what a trickle charge is. So nature has trickle charged solar energy into a battery, a chemical battery called hydrocarbons, which we now can use. But of course, it has the disadvantage that we will release CO2. But it is very high energy. It did three things. With it, it, we were able to build the world around us. You know what will happen on the 26th of October of this month. On the 26th of October, we will officially be with 8 billion people on this planet. Before the blue curve start, we were never more than 1 billion. Never. And the earlier graph I showed you with the dashboard, all that rise came since the 1970s, so the last 50 years or so. So with that, we did a lot of good things. Because of those 8 billion people, about 5 billion people work. The elderly don't work, the very young are studying to work later on, so 5 billion people are working. But we do not realize that as a result of an energy of which a few liters of oil can do the same work as a person can do in an entire month, we have the equivalent of 500 billion energy slaves that work alongside the 5 billion people. So everything that's been built up has not been built up by those 5 billion people, but more by the 500 billion people equivalents in terms of energy. And so it has built the physical world around us. It has also shaped our economic theories. Because economists that lived in the green area, people like Adam Smith or Ricardo, the basis of their economic theories was land productivity and resource productivity. How much crop can I get of a pot of land? What can I do with a river flow that I have? How much grain can I mill with that amount of water? It was physical land productivity. And when we discovered this big source of prehistoric solar energy, also our economic theories changed. And we actually started to believe that what determines economic output is only achieved by labor and capital. We completely ignore what really enables it, and at that time we became energy blind and hence we think it is our ingenuity that has built up everything around us forgetting that in fact it was the work of those 500 billion energy slaves that did a lot of work for us it also has shaped our future expectations if you think about your own future or your children think about their future they kind of extrapolate, because we are linear thinkers, they kind of extrapolate the recent past. Now, I am an economist, but I have fallen off my faith. If I, as a physicist, would put a cup of tea in front of me, and I would put a pencil on top of it, and I want to measure, let's say, the electric conductivity of my pencil, well, I connect the wires, and that's the only thing that I'm interested in. But as a physicist, I cannot ignore gravity, or the humidity coming from the tea, or the temperature from the hot tea, or the light, or the humidity in the room, a physicist cannot ignore any part 
of reality. But I, as an economist, I can ignore vast parts of reality and actually develop a tunnel vision. Now, the problem with tunnel vision is that I do not see what I'm causing left and right of me until it becomes so big that I can actually see it through my tunnel and then I say, holy bony, what's happening? And then the problem is so big that it is much more difficult to tackle and treat it than if I would have seen it earlier on by looking at things holistically. So being an economist, I tell you, don't trust economists. Now, getting back to physics, many people rightly think that solar, sun and wind are free. They are free. But what they forget is that your lights do not work on sun rays. They work on electricity. So I need a converter. I need, first of all, to capture the sun. Then I need to convert it, photovoltaics, so they got the current. Then, well, the sun actually shines during the day and I have my lights on during the evening, so I need storage. And maybe the solar panels or the windmills are somewhere else as where I live, so I need the wires as well. I want to share one more story with you. In 2016, we visited the big mining companies in the world, Anglo-American, Rio Tinto, Billiton, you know, the ones that operate big bauxite mines, copper mines, etc., etc. And we asked them, what was the quality of the copper ores you were excavating 100 years ago? And they said, well, we don't have that on the computer, but uh, why do you need it? And we explained, they said, ah, that's very good. We will help you get that information. And so within six, eight weeks, we go back with the information. What do you think the content of copper was of the ore that we took out of the ground 100 years ago? It was 2%. The quality, the high quality ores 100 years ago were 2%. That means that to get one ton of copper, I need to excavate 50 tons of ore. And next question, of course, was, what's the quality of the copper ore you're extracting now? And what do you think? Was it more or less than 100 years ago? Of course, it was less. Because we are lazy, at least I am lazy, if I go to an orchard, I always go for the low-hanging apples. Why would I climb on a chair or even on a ladder? I go for the low-hanging apples. Of course, once all the low-hanging apples are gone, I have to take a chair to go for the higher-hanging apples. And if they are gone, we have to take a ladder to go and get the apples all the way to the top. Now, that actually is a bad comparison. You know why? If I wait and I don't want to climb because I don't have a chair or an apple, I just wait and the apples will fall down. But that does not happen with aluminium or with copper. So you are right, it's less now. The world average quality of copper ore today is half a percent. So that means that for the same one ton of copper that a hundred years ago we needed to excavate 50 tons of ore, today we have to excavate 200 tons of ore. And you're an intelligent audience, so if I asked you, what will it be in 2050? Will it be more or less? Well, of course, it will be less. How much less? I do not know. But it will get exponentially more difficult. So the whole idea that with renewables, we can substitute the solar stocks that we are used to will not work. We have to develop, don't get me wrong, we have to develop renewables. But renewables cannot power this society. So we will have to change society to meet the energy availability that we can dispose of to make society run. And here you can see that the green line is basically the system complexity. So burning wood or coal is fairly easy. But the orange line shows you the quality of the energy, i.e. the density. So once you go from wood to wind to coal to oil to gas and even to nuclear, the quality goes up. But now with renewables, it goes down. Have you actually tried to fry an egg in the sun? Just put an egg on the plate and hold it up in the sun? You will not fry that egg. Unless you put a magnifying glass, which you probably did, I did as a little boy, you know, to uh, get on your shoelaces. So we need to concentrate it. So on the lower right, what you see there is basically the exajoules per year that will be available to humanity. And so the blue part is basically the 
renewable part or the solar flows that we were used to. See, it starts in 1820. And so halfway the 19th century, we were able to put a completely different pulse on top of that, which is called fossil fuels. Now, there are two reasons why that will go down. First of all, we want it to go down because if we keep consuming it, we will grill ourselves. And secondly, it will be finite, like an apple tree. There's another problem, that for renewables, we need a lot of metals, aluminium for the turbine blades, cobalt for the batteries, copper for the cables, etc., etc., etc. Europe is a relatively small geography. We are import dependent on other countries, not only to get the energy, like coal, oil and gas, but also natural resources. So the whole idea to actually get rid of Russian oil and gas Let's call that cocaine. So we, as a doctor, are prescribing our patients, you have to get rid of the cocaine. We actually recommend Chinese heroin. Now, how good a doctor is that? You don't cure the patient. He has to slim down. He has too much metabolism. He has to slim down. So what is happening right now is that we see a congestion of challenges. Each little block here is a challenge. And as you can see, they are ramping up, and about mid-century, a lot of these tipping points are coming together. And actually, the resource crisis that we are seeing now is actually coming earlier by a decade, because we had forecast what is happening now on the prices and the availability of resources to take place end of the 2020s. But we are at the beginning of the 2020s. So to grow that awareness is important. I speed up a little bit, because otherwise, Cyprian, uh, I cannot cover what um, I wanted to talk about the blue. Um, cooling initiative. Two things. In a few weeks' time, thousands of people will come together in Cairo for the COP27. I was, for the first time, at a COP in Paris, the COP21, and I was pretty amazed. How people can disconnect reality with theory. And I've been studying that. And after the Glasgow COP26, the European Parliament asked me to come to the Parliament and explain why the COP process, as it is now, cannot work. It cannot deliver the goal of containing global warming to within two or one and a half degrees. And it's a very simple reason. To open the door towards a world in which we can reduce climate change, it's a door with three locks. Only opening one lock will not open the door. And the COP process already for 26 years is trying to open a three-lock door with one key. Because all the discussions, almost all the discussions, are about supply-side solutions. And of course we need those. But I hope that what I explained to you in the past few minutes helps you understand that we also need demand-side solutions. And we need nature-based solutions, and that is a nice segue into my final comment. But before explaining what blue cooling is, I want to tease you a little bit with geography. I tested this on the driver that picked me up at the airport yesterday. He's a young 23-year-old engineer uh, working in uh, electric installations. And I asked him, is Europe bigger or smaller than Australia? And he thought that Australia was smaller than Europe. He had never been to Australia, but those of you that have been to Australia will have seen the postcards where they actually project Europe onto Australia, and with the exception of perhaps Sicily and Gibraltar in the north of Norway, it fits completely into Australia. And if you take the northern part of your sideways, there's plenty of space. What you can see here is that Australia, which is therefore bigger than Europe, is smaller than Antarctica. Antarctica is also smaller than the United States. It is, of course, a very little-known continent. Over the past three years, I have been giving a present to friends, smart children, five presents, and it was a cork globe. You know cork, you know what's on the top of a bottle, but a globe. It's actually meant so they can put pins in there where you've been, where your girlfriends live, or where you still want to go, you know. But I asked them, Use it whichever way you like, but do me a favor. Cut out Antarctica and copy that. And then you stick Antarctica's 
on all the blue parts of the globe. And you send me an email and tell me how many Antarctica's did you need to cover all the oceans. And actually four out of five did send me an email and the answers were between 32 and 38, which is about right, it's about 34, 35. So 35 Antarctica's are equally big as all the oceans. So what does that mean, smart audience? If 35 meters of Antarctican ice melts, it will increase the average sea level rise in the world by one meter. Yeah, 35 meters at Antarctica, if that fits 35 times of the oceans, 35 meters melting is one meter water more. Now, most of you do not know is that Antarctica is the highest of all continents. I live on Lake Geneva, my garden is at 406 meters, and I look out on the Alps on the French side, where there are like high peaks over 2,000 meters. But no continent has an average height of 2,000 meters, which Antarctica has, with peaks of 4,500. So if 2,000 meters of ice is there, and every 35 meters means one meter level sea rise, then you understand we've got 70 more meters to go. And they will come. Now that we cannot stop because that's due to geological processes between ice age. We go from ice age to no ice age to ice age. And the amplitude of the oceans between the two extremes is 140 meters. And we are now halfway an upward trend, so we have already added about 70 meters. The North Sea, for example, did not exist 9,000 years ago. England was not an island, it was part of Europe. The Rhine, the Seine, the Thames were side rivers of a much bigger river which actually ended in the Atlantic, south of Cornwall and north of Brest. The geography looked different. And the other 70 meters will get added. Now that has been going on for zillions of years. The biggest difference now is that in the last 100 years, even the last 400 years, we have built an enormous amount of assets along the coasts. Osaka, Tokyo, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Constanta, Amsterdam, Marseille, Rome. And what you can see here is the ladder. So the first, there are many more, but the first well-known one that will disappear is Venice. Venice is sinking already. Amsterdam, I've got some colleagues here who live in Amsterdam, Amsterdam will next disappear. And these will all go because the vertical axis is only eight meters, and that is what the Greenland ice sheet will give us. This is not even the 70 meters. I learned yesterday Bucharest is at 20 meters, so you're okay for this stage, but not for the next. So, we may wait until COP100. I hope that they will change the scope to include demand-side solutions and nature-based solutions sooner, and that's what I am now working on with a number of colleagues. And this is basically to improve the reflectiveness of the planet by working with marine cloud brightening. Now, some of you may say, well, wait a sec, I heard about this SRM, solar radiation management, and this is not good. Next week, I'll be in Geneva in a panel talking about this. And indeed, there are technologies that, by the way, are very cooling effective and cost-effective, but they also have unintended consequences, and if you want to stop, you have to wait two years. And for that, we're not going to get, at this stage, political support. So, we are focusing on a particular methodology called marine cloud brightening, and, well, this is my first visit to Romania, but I presume you've got sometimes dark clouds here as well. Do you know what the difference is between a black cloud, a grey cloud, and a white cloud? Except for the colour? It's very simple. It's not the quantity of water, it's the droplet size. So if the droplets are big, the sun cannot come through the cloud, so we perceive it as a dark cloud. And what we all know, if you see a black cloud, it's a wetsuit. And if you see a grey cloud, it's 50-50. Pedal fast on your bike, maybe you make it dry, maybe you don't. And if you see a white cloud, you just know, no worries, this is not going to rain. So actually, as Chipian said, this technology is biomimicry. You all heard about Ian 
in Florida. If you would have been in the Caribbean a week before, the, we the water would be very nice and warm. But hurricanes build up in the Caribbean and go to Miami and to Florida, and as they do that, they take out an enormous amount of heat of the ocean because that's actually propelling the hurricane. So the strength of the hurricane is actually determined by climate change, not the frequency, but the strength is. The week after Ian, the water would be cold in the Caribbean because of the energy that has been withdrawn from it. So basically, marine cloud brightening is imitating a big storm. It is spraying seawater, the water will evaporate and the salt particles will just rise up in the dark clouds and make the droplets smaller. And as a result, the dark clouds became gray clouds and then white clouds and it will reflect back more sun radiation. Now this is, intelligent audience, of course, only treating the symptoms. So if the COP process, which should address the cause, will not be successful, this will not work. But if the COP process will be successful, the best possible outcome is operation successful, patient died. We want operation successful, patient thrives. So we are banking that the thousands of people that are working on COP will eventually get it right. Of course, it should have been gotten right by COP 5, not by <coughs> COP 28 next year in Qatar, where maybe there's some hope. But we want to do this to buy more time. Speaking of that... Very good. I'm not sure how we can buy more time at this what point. We'll do, this is what, how we buy time, Cipran. Because the more time we need for this multiple transition. So the reason why we got this conference is the climate change. And so we need to think of a climate transition. And I hope that I explained to you in my talk that we will have to undertake an energy transition in order to do that. But an energy transition will have implications for resource transition. And resource transition has an implication for economic and political transition. And that will require a social transition. The good news is that you cannot do any of these if the others don't change as well. But if you have to do them all at the same time, it's a hell of a lot more difficult. And for that, we want to give you more time. Chipran, where are you? Ah, just oh, that. Geez. All right, here. Thank you very much, Hans. <laughs> Next year, wait, don't go. Next year, we will do a summit just with Hans, because, because we will have a... Uh, online questions uh, that can cover uh, two hours probably. Uh, so I, <coughs> I need to pick two. Um, this one with electric cars, um, and we've talked about this in the past, in, in one or two minutes, do you think this is a viable future? And if no, why? The answer is yes and no. Uh, the yes part is that uh, we want to stop with combustion engines because they emit CO2. So we'd like to do that with electric cars, but I hope that the audience already understood that electric cars are very metal intensive. And they run on electricity, of course not gas-powered electricity, but renewable electricity, which is very metal intensive. So we've done those sums. Today there are 1.3 billion cars in the world. If society would decide to use all the metal resources we have for only one purpose, mobility over the road, and therefore invest in electric cars and the backup system, there is a maximum of 400 million cars. So since we also have other requirements in society, like heating homes and electricity, we won't even reach that. So it can be a solution, but only if it goes hand in hand with a transformation of the transport function, and notably car sharing. And the demand side. Uh, of course, yeah, the demand, so you will not have. But the good thing is, I presume most people here in the audience, perhaps except the youngest ones, have cars. Now, I ask them, Think for yourself in your head, what percentage of time in a week do you use your car? Most people will not get beyond 2 or 3%. So we've got a lot of assets standing in a garage or in front of the parking, which you only use 2% of the time. Now, if the other 98% you could use it and somebody else could use it, then we only need one asset. Because what many people do not realize, to produce a car, and for an electric car it's even worse, we emit a lot of CO2. So for the entrepreneurs amongst us, you cannot run a company only on variable cost. You also have to look at the fixed cost 
and amortization. An average new combustion engine car, before you run it out of the showroom, has already emitted the equivalent of between 400 and 600,000 kilometers in CO2 emissions in producing the car. So wouldn't it be a good idea that we do not use it for 2 or 3% of the time, but perhaps for 80% of the time? I have a question that's popping up. So, um, as an economist, what is, in terms of economic theories, the one that you adhere to? So is there an economic theory that you look at and say, this is it? Yes, I do, and it's one that you all know. It's Adam Smith and his famous book, The Wealth of Nation, because he was the last economist who understood reality. All the guys and ladies that came afterwards were reality blind. So they think that everything around us is due to our ingenuity. But, you know, there is far more to it. The, the, the major economic mistake, Ciprian, about the industry in which I worked so long is that... Let me give you this example. If, after this conference, you go to the bus stop opposite Odeon, you pay, what's the equivalent of two euro seventy in your currency? A lot. Uh, well, whatever, you know. So you pay a lot for the bus, uh, but, but not a huge amount, perhaps two beers, and you go to the nearest, whatever, BMW or Mercedes dealer. Then you walk into the showroom and look at the green one, the red one, and say, I'll have the blue one, please. By the way, here is the proof that I paid for picking it up. Do you think the dealer will give you the keys and give you the car to keep? Of course not. But that is how I price oil. I price the oil for the cost of taking it out of the ground, but not the cost of the creation, not the cost of the pollution. It's all not included. And that means that we have given fossil fuel, prehistoric solar energy, a very unrealistic, favorable pricing. In actual fact, we can talk about that over beer, that's another question. Petrol today, at two euros a liter in Western Europe, is still 500 times too cheap. And the last question, um, you mentioned that um, some things are, uh, some time ago, you mentioned that there is no one solution uh, to climate change. Um, I dare to ask, is the solutions the answer and if so how realistic do you see the the reducing of co2 and methane and all the others in the next 20 to 30 years well uh, there's two things there are things that we can do out of our own will political decision making and there are things that will be imposed because i've worked for many years in scenarios and a scenario is a internally consistent possible future with a plausible link to the present. So I can have multiple internally consistent possible futures and that can be bandwidth. But the bandwidth is actually determined by physics and chemistry. So if we as citizens or politicians make plans and physics and chemistry do not agree, those plans will not be realized for one simple reason, they can't be realized. What does happen if politicians promise things that are not possible, we'll find out you are not telling the truth or you are not understanding reality, and then you create dissatisfaction. And how do people react when they are dissatisfied? So yes, there are multiple solutions, and I think that different parts of the world will come up with different solutions. The good news, there is one silver lining uh, on what we have now, is that the correlation between happiness and GDP stops at about $12,000 per capita. So a country like... These days, dollar is, is not a bad, uh, a bad idea to have. To have, have that's right. So, yeah. so that's the, about the level of Guatemala. All of European countries are way above that. And what it means is that if you add more GDP per capita beyond that level, it gives you more GDP, but not more happiness. Well, I'm, so I'm happy, I'm happy to back. hear that, uh, and I would like to ask you for a big round of applause for Hans van der Lue. You can see Hans uh, the next year and the next year and the next year. I think he's going to be a permanent guest. Now, thank you, Hans, for a very exciting and, and in-depth uh, presentation. I think all these solutions are, are part of the futures that we, we need. Um, but in the end, solutions need money. We heard about dollars and euro and other currencies, um, and uh, in the end, it's all about funding. So I am honored to welcome on stage Ms. Anna Akalhatsi, uh, country manager of uh, Romania and Hungary for the World Bank. Anna oversees the World Bank's program and leads uh, policy dialogue with government counterparts, 
um, and, and private sector uh, at Georgia National. Um, she first joined the bank, the World Bank, in 1999, uh, when I was uh, roughly 15, I think, uh, as an economist, and later became the country representative for the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, in Georgia, before move, moving to Washington, D.C. Prior, uh, she was uh, stationed in Moldova as the World Bank country manager. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome uh, to Anna uh, Agalhazi from the World Bank. Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you. I'm not that old, and I will prove it now. <laughs> so, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity. We are here today because um, it is uh, starkly clear that over the last few years, we see that our planet is in crisis. Let me start the green. Yes, the green button, okay. Um, amid multiple threats, the war in Ukraine, we are still recovering from the scars of COVID-19, surging inflation, the reversals in development, global climate action is stalling. And uh, with dangerous consequences for people's lives, jobs, especially for poorest and the most vulnerable. Just a few weeks ago, uh, more than a third of Pakistan was underwater after the worst flooding in the country's history displaced more than 33 million men, women, and children. And uh, historic heat waves across Europe over the summer months have claimed tens of thousands of lives while breaking railroad tracks and drying out hydroelectric power stations. Also here in Romania, the drought and extreme temperatures have contributed to more than 700 separate wildlife, uh, wildfires this year alone, which uh, have ravaged local forests at around 10 times the normal rate, uh, causing a drop in hydroenergy production, significant losses in agriculture, uh, and uh, further water supply was disrupted in many communities across the country, and we all witnessed this here. Uh, these catastrophes are far from natural. Uh, floods and fires have long been uh, with us, yes, but our burning of fossil fuels um, has driven greenhouse gases in our atmosphere to levels not seen in millions of years, destabilizing our climate and exacerbating weather extremes. As we increase the concentration of carbon um, um, the concentration of um, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we also destroy the natural carbon sinks. And we all have seen the uh, pictures of the Amazon rainforests uh, that once a critical sink for carbon dioxide is now itself an emitter due to an epidemic of illegal slash and burn destruction that can clearly be seen from space. This and other tipping points, and we already heard this uh, phrase, tipping points, are quickly pushing us towards an unpredictable future, one in which the only certainty is profound human suffering. Developing countries, for example, uh, have endured eight times as many disasters in the last decade than in the 1980s, and this trend is worsening. Let me share with you just two numbers. Unchecked climate change could push up to 132 million people into poverty by 2030. By 2050, without urgent action, climate change could drive 216 million people to migrate within their own countries. In this new era, Disasters are no longer natural disasters. It is humans who are implicated in the strengthening storms, choking droughts, and rising seas that are bearing down on our communities. We are co-authoring our own demise, and worse still, it is often those out of reach of the pen who suffer most. 
Look no further than the small island states in the Pacific, who contribute only a tiny fraction of global greenhouse gases, but still find themselves slowly vanishing into the sea. And yet, a different story is already being written. Instead of a tragedy of ignorance and inaction, a new narrative of courage and cooperation is underway in institutions and communities around the globe. And it is this budding future that brought us here today, and this is this budding future that I'd like to turn our focus to now. At the World Bank, uh, we know we cannot deliver on development without addressing climate crisis. Ciprian said I will be speaking about finance, but we need to talk about climate crisis first. Unless we achieve radical reductions in emissions, our climate will continue to destabilize, pushing our planet past irrevocable tipping points. And even with aggressive climate action, we will still need to help countries, societies, vulnerable communities adapt to our already altered environment to prevent development gains from being washed away. Success will be difficult, yes, because the challenge is complex. Even with the right policy environment, low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure in low and middle income countries could require investments of around 1.6 trillion uh, US dollars, or it's 4.5% of GDP of these countries. Other sectors, from agriculture to industries, will only increase this financing need. Uh, in order to focus our efforts and better um, track our impacts, the World Bank Group has developed a climate, action, uh, climate change action plan uh, to help drive the transformation in five key systems responsible for more than 90% of all emissions. And I have them on the slide. Energy, agriculture, food and water, cities, transport, and manufacturing. In our plan, which is for 2021-25, uh, we have committed to leveraging 35% of our total investments directly for climate-related activities, of which at least 50% will be specifically targeted towards adaptation efforts. In our financial year uh, 2022, which we closed in June, this resulted in more than 31.7 billion US dollars in climate finance being provided by the World Bank globally. The Climate Change Action Plan has helped make the World Bank the single largest climate financier for developing countries. But we know we must do much more. In order to expand available financing, we are focused on aggressively mobilizing domestic and private capital and supporting global efforts to raise and deploy concessional finance. These funds will spur efforts in renewable energy projects, building resilience to climate variability, strengthening hydrometeorological services, green bonds and green buildings, and more. Many of these areas uh, are part of a strong and ongoing collaboration between the World Bank Group and Romania. Uh, to give you um, an example, World Bank is providing support to Romania for climate change adaptation and in particular for safeguarding water security. Our experts help the Ministry of uh, Environment, Water and Forest to strengthen their capacities for managing the increasing flood risk. Going forward to safely provide water for human consumption, for agriculture, for energy production, Romania needs to urgently increase its water storage capacity. And action is required today. Speaking about water, uh, this year the International Finance uh, Corporation, the private sector arm of the uh, World Bank Group, provided a landmark 100 million um, uh, euro loan to Banca Transylvania, enabling the bank to expand access to water and improve water, uh, wastewater treatment in Romania. This was the first loan of its kind in Central and Eastern Europe. We are also supporting uh, the design and implementation of the energy transition agenda in Romania, as well as the optimization of its energy markets 
to chart uh, a more sustainable future for all Romanian citizens. Uh, this effort is being coordinated with the European Commission through DG Reform, DG Energy, DG Competition and the global donor community. Romania, for example, has committed to significant investments in energy efficiency, as you know, that will reduce the country's energy consumption by 37.5% by 2030. And this is well above the EU target of 32.5%. But we already heard how huge will be uh, the overall investment needs to modernize uh, and support green transition. And so to, uh, the estimate for Romania's investment needs uh, are um, between uh, around 60 billion euros between now and uh, 2030 huge amount of money and while part of this could indeed be funded by EU and public funds there is no way that we can support this green transition without financial sector and private sector investments they will play important role in closing the investment gap needed to reach Romania's climate and environmental objectives the current share of green assets in Romania's banks portfolio is relatively low, it's at 3%, and uh, this is half of the uh, euro area average. At the same time, banks in Romania significant, are significantly exposed to climate-related risks, where about 50% of Romania's loan portfolio is comprised of firms that are vulnerable to physical risks from climate change. Green bonds, green loans, green equity funds and climate risk insurance have all helped pave the way for investors to inject money into financing sustainable projects. Opportunities abound, but require the right institutional and governance framework coupled with political decisiveness so that the financial sector can allocate capital and create opportunities. All of this is happening, of course, within a radically shifting global financial landscape. We have had two decades of immense progress and harsh lessons. We have seen international public climate finance skyrocket since 2009, now well above 55 US dollar billion globally. We also saw major challenges for the Kyoto carbon market and wait in earnest to see now uh, how, uh, the, it will uh, how the Paris uh, Agreement and Article uh, 4 can change the situation. Uh, so uh, the rapid progress of technology for sustainable energy is a source for hope with free falling costs of solar panels uh, beating even the most optimistic of projections. At the same time, subsidies for coal and other polluting power sources remain far too high. We have clearly observed the economic and uh, financial benefits of clean development, but we have also seen the devastation of the global economy from the outbreak of COVID-19, yet another symptom of the ailing nature. In this midst of the pandemic carnage, however, we caught a glimpse of a world without polluted skies. We all remember the images. A vision we can achieve without shattering the global economy if we invest boldly and wisely in the years to come. While the suffering from COVID-19 was great, it also opened a once-in-a-generation opportunity to channel unprecedented funds towards a green recovery that has left us better poised to meet the challenges of an environment in crisis. But while the pandemic has brought much of the world together in mutual support, we have also seen recently the resurgence of the terror of war on the European continent. As the destruction of communities in Ukraine continues, the true impact of this aggression on global finance is still unclear. It is in this shifting landscape that climate finance must find roots to grow and thrive. But what does this financing look like exactly? And how will it spur the greatest social transformation since the Industrial Revolution? 
it may be helpful to think of climate finance as having three distinct types. At least this is how we look at it. The first of this is the dedicated climate finance. This includes the concessional financing and grants leveraged by development finance institutions like the World Bank Group to fund climate-related programs like adaptation projects in agriculture, concessional loans for a share of energy efficiency programs, and results-based payments for solar energy generation. In 2019, dedicated climate finance among all multilateral development banks hit $3.1 billion, with uh, World Bank contributed a approximately one-third of this amount. Development finance with climate co-benefits is the second type, which includes investments that are confirmed to have substantial climate impacts, such as an interest-free loan for a road project that improves drainage to withstand increasing rainfall from climate change, for example. In 2019, this type of climate financing exceeded $54 billion, with nearly $18 billion coming from the World Bank alone. The final category, the, the bigger box out there, is... Uh, uh, climate uh, additional funds that are mobilized by the first two categories. This includes private finance, carbon finance, and local government resources, uh, and can consist of projects like commercial investments in offshore wind plants, the construction of green buildings, carbon trading schemes, and more. This pool of funds will be essential to transitioning the world to sustainable pathways of development. But finance alone cannot deliver sustainable future by itself. There are several lessons learned that uh, we can uh, share uh, with you today. One is that climate finance must be joined with a number of other levers like policy reforms, innovation, and resources to ensure sustainability transformations are wide and deep enough to solve the climate crisis and ensure a livable planet for future generations. This includes areas like financial sector reform to catalyze green investment, sound uh, fiscal policy to safeguard public resources for climate action, tech transfer and accelerated innovation, functional carbon markets, and a growing ecosystem of climate data that can intelligently guide policy and investment decision. Lesson number two, throughout all of these efforts, we must shift our thinking to plan for the long term. Near-term political horizon can no longer blind us to the existential risk that awaits us beyond. Lesson number three, we must combine and coordinate our levers of action if we are going to affect the track of eight billion humans striving for a life of security and plenty. And finally, we must address the system as a whole, from economic to ecosystem dynamics and back again, if we hope to leverage lasting change. If this all sounds terribly complicated, that's because it is. So how do we go about unpacking this complexity, identifying trade-offs, and locating virtuous feedback loops to guide our way? To help with this monumental task, we in the World Bank have recently announced a new diagnostic report, which will be undertaken for World Bank Group client countries. Um, it, it's called the, uh, the, the Country Climate and Development Reports. These reports analyze how countries' development goals can be achieved while seeking to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. We already uh, started publishing the first batch of these reports uh, so far for Turkey, Vietnam, and the Sahel region, and a couple of additional ones are coming out soon. The second batch of reports is just beginning their work, including our report on Romania, which will be the first for the EU member state. While we will develop this uh, CCDR, the Climate Change and Development Report, with our Romanian counterparts over the coming months, I'd like to provide a preview of what this report intends to capture. I wanted to provide, but I went way too... Okay, let me uh, describe it to you. 
Uh, the report will consider Romania's high but volatile growth uh, over the last 20 years as a starting point. While Romania's wealth has seen a robust upward trend, uh, this has come at the cost of its natural capital, which has declined over time. Clearly, sustainable dynamic growth going forward will require the development of a more holistic and inclusive development model. So CCDR will, uh, um, will um, be uh, focused around three thematic pillars to answer the following questions. First, how will the path and speed of decarbonization position Romania in regards to its climate targets? What will these efforts mean for the economy, development objectives, and inclusion? The second set of questions is, what are the priorities and, importantly, the vulnerabilities for resilience and adaptation action? And how can synergies be leveraged with mitigation action? And the third group of questions is around how will the climate and green transition affect the economy and inclusion? In other words, how ready is the Romanian private sector, including both companies and workers? Decarbonization, um, a growing and uh, inclusive green economy, and increasing the resilience of critical and urban infrastructure, which is particularly vulnerable to climate and disaster risks, are key areas where the future of Romania will be formed. We are looking forward to finalizing next year this critical roadmap for Romania, and more importantly, working with all our counterparts in the country to make concrete the course of action it outlines. These efforts will complement other critical work that uh, is being done to boost digital technologies, expand access to education, and strengthen the country's institutions to better serve the Romanian people. To conclude, uh, while our planetary situation is complex and challenging, I hope Romania will turn into an example that provides inspiration and encouragement for how the world can continue to help communities thrive while also transforming our economies into safer, more sustainable, and more resilient ones. Climate finance will continue to play a critical role in aligning these necessary and complementary goals. And we at the World Bank will continue to explore ways to leverage even more resources and help countries around the globe undertake this critical journey towards a better future for us all. It is my sincere hope that the climate story we write over the next decades will be the one we are proud to share with the generations to come. Finally, I would like to invite you all to contribute to another important analytical exercise that we are currently conducting, which is called Systematic Country Diagnostic. It will be launched next year, and together with Climate Change and Development Report, it will contribute to shaping policies and programs to ensure Romania's sustainable, inclusive, and green growth. Please visit our web page and uh, share your opinions so that we hear your views. Uh, climate change is one of the key priorities, one of the six key priorities that we identified for Romania's future, and uh, uh, this is what we will be proposing uh, for a develop, uh, to, to, to make sure that development priorities are shaped in a way that will accelerate Romania's future sustainable path. Um, let me thank you for your attention. Uh, we heard, we started, I think, this day by hearing that future is in our hands, that there is a hope, indeed there is a hope. Let's go back to making this future together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Anna. Um, I think um, if you're Romanian, um, uh, there's a recent uh, study by the World Bank that does an x-ray of, of how Romania is and where Romania could go. So I strongly uh, suggest you, you go there. Now, <clears throat> we continue and uh, I think uh, security in its rather basic form has been on everyone's mind lately, especially considering the war uh, in Ukraine. But security has many faces and one of these faces is climate security. Um, and, and we're very, very honored to, to have a, a guest that, that uh, is uh, 
highly engaged in the topic. Um, I am honored to to have uh, here with us uh, Gidrimas Yelinska, uh, his Assistant Secretary General of uh, NATO. He has overall responsibility for management of the NATO headquarters and is Secretary General Primary Advisor for NATO-wide management issues. He was the Vice Minister of Defense of Lithuania, graduated from West Point with a BSc in Political Science and Computer Science. He holds an MA in National Security Studies from Georgetown University uh, and an MBA in Strategy and Finance from Columbia Business School. Um, it's a pleasure to, to welcome uh, Gedrimas here, Assistant Secretary General of NATO. Uh, please join us on stage. Hi, good morning everyone. Great to be here. I'll just, I'll just put it here for now. Um, well, uh, great to be in a beautiful country, Romania, in a bustling city of uh, Bucharest. Uh, first of all, it, obviously it's a great honor to be here. I also wanted to thank Ciprian, Smaranda, other organizers who've, who've done so, and of course the sponsors of the event who've put it together. This is so, so important, not, not because climate change is important, but I think it's important to raise the profile also of, uh, of, uh, of the discussions, of the topics to the broader community, both in, in Romania, but also in Central Eastern Europe, in Europe in general, and, and across the alliance as well as NATO. So I, I, that's right, I serve at, at NATO, and I, and I think oftentimes, uh, you know, or at least several years ago, people would ask, well, what, what, what does climate change have to do with, uh, with security? Is that, is that even relevant to, to connect these, these, these subjects? I think nowadays we, it's, it's pretty self-evident that all of us are connected. All these topics, it's about, it's about connecting, it's about uh, looking at the range of things, subjects, and it's, uh, you know, it's absolutely essential. So that's what I will, I will talk about today. Now, first I want to, you know, I have really two slides, two simple slides. These are just also almost for my, probably my own uh, orientation here, what to talk about rather than uh, information. But uh, what I want to talk about, I want to start with, I think, do we, the question is, do we live in historic times? Is, is this a sort of the, the time when the arc of history can be changed? Um, I think some will say yes, some might say no. I think we all, through our own ego sort of uh, uh, aspect, we all want to think that we live in incredibly important times. And I think, but it truly is uh, in my, uh, sort of history changing developments that are happening in the world. We see a war happening right across the border from, from this, this country. Um, uh, we see, of course, the, the whole climate change, climate is all, all around the world. So it's, a, it's I mean, it's, it, things are happening. It just is a sense in the air that we are in a very special moment. And I think it's great to be at this, you know, incredible place. So I think, you know, when I talk about volatility and uncertainty, this is also evident, not just in security matters. Um, yes, in security matters, that's the, the primary thing that's, that's, I think we're all preoccupied with it on TV and, and actually live seeing people and refugees uh, in the, on the streets. Um, but also look at the markets, the gyrating markets, the, 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 the unknowns, truly uncharted waters of our monetary policies where monetary policy authorities don't know what to do about inflation. We know we need to raise rates, but you know, by how much, when to reduce? It's, it's, uh, it's more unknown than, than there's more certain, there's more uncertainty than, than really kind of knowing what what to do about it. Look at the supply chains. I think whether you talk about um, you know food food supply chains or technologies or or any any goods, any physical goods, it's a challenge to get anything on in your hands. So it's a, it's a really a, a, that that uncertainty, that volatility that permeates this this environment. So. Um, I think, and I think, you know, when we look about look at the polarization and, and division in the world, so in the political sense, in the social sense, it's been it's been it's been tough. Now, on a natural, on a kind of climate side, we've seen Hurricane Ian go ravage Florida the past weekend. We've seen we had seen Pakistan, uh, uh, huge parts of Pakistan underwater. We've seen a lot more droughts, fires. So, so we know something's happening with our environment. So there's no question. There's no denying that. Um, and yet we see, and what I say, yes, there's a fragmentation politically, but there's also uh, collaboration. We've seen some slivers, great slivers of collaboration and, and, and success of, of how people come together and collaborate. And I, I think the best example to me is the, is the vaccine development, which took a lot of collaboration from different parts of the world to develop those vaccines. And really, COVID has been 
tempered and has been really we've won the battle i think through collaboration through 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 partnerships and that's probably one of the best examples another example is when uh, of great collaboration is of course in in uh, after this ra you know savaging war has been started by russia how democracies came together how we all united it, truly the moment right after the divisions of covid we go into this uh, really moment of unity and trying to help Ukraine doing whatever it takes to win this battle because again this is existential not only for Ukraine it's existential for our own values our own democracies as well so I think there's there's a lot of uh, magic magic in that collaboration and I think that's that's part of like what bring together different different people from different uh, walks of life here is the example of that kind of magical collaboration so that I really congratulate that so but in short these are complex times, and we live in these, as this is complex, it's not complicated. It's very different between complicated and complex. Complicated has a solution. Complex is, means we don't have a solution. We probably don't have a solution for climate change, but we need to develop it. We need to emerge with a solution by, by collaborating. So I think that's, that's the beauty of, uh, of, this, uh, of, of this meeting, of this day. Uh, now, talking about the trends, I wanted to really stress two trends that are, I believe, are most important really in in today's world and uh, I go back uh, if you, the previous slide is still 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 oh yeah this one sorry yeah okay um, so strategic competition and climate change it's um, you know we we are we are where we are we are democracies and I think what has emerged recently and it has been probably emerging for some time but now with, with the war uh, Russia's sort of aggression against uh, against Ukraine we see China's actions. We are in this just strategic competition environment where, you know, I think, um, you know, in 1989, 1990, the history must have ended, meaning that, you know, the liberalism won, we're all going to be democracies, we're all going to live in prosperity and economic growth, uh, sort of a momentum. That did not prove to be, to be correct. That post-Cold War period sort of uh, slowly ending into, into some sort of different uh, uh, scheme. But um, it's also that, you know, the, the China, the, the hope that was that China would enter the, the World Trade Organization and is going to create more democracies, more, more shared values, I think has proven, you know, unfortunately um, not happening. So with that growth that we had, and I know in Romania, I know in my own country, which is, which is sort of a bit north from here, it's um, the period has brought up incredible prosperity. You know, look at this. You know, look at Romania. Look at other countries. Look at many countries in the in the Asia. A lot of people has been brought from poverty, from uh, from underdevelopment into development, into into some sort of economic prosperity, from scarcity to more abundance. So there's there's a lot there's a lot that great that happened. But of course, um, the narrative has shifted now. And let me give one one short uh, anecdote from a personal. Perspective. So. 2012, I was working for Citigroup, a major, a major global bank in in Singapore, and uh, really the narrative there then was that well the the world the, the, this century the 21st century will belong to Asia. It's clear economic growth, uh, investments that followed through in in various sectors in China in other parts of Asia. This, was, this century belongs to Asia. China will, of course, will lead that growth because it's, it's a power engine, so powering, engine powering whole economic growth for the, for the world. And it has been doing that for, for several decades almost. Now, and, and writers were talking about, well, this, this, is, this is the Asia century. Now, if you, look, if you fast forward to now, we see President Biden about a month ago uh, say very clearly, uh, well, 21st century will be defined by the battle of uh, democracies versus autocracies. So, then what we see is the narrative shift. It's a huge narrative shift of how we perceive the world, how we perceive the world order, and that sort of tells us in kind of the future to come. Now, that may change as well. The century might as well belong to to whoever you know. Maybe 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 China will emerge again. Maybe something else will change. It's you know this is a decade in the in a, from 2012 when I was in Singapore. Now this is 2022. So the narrative has shifted dramatically, and um, you know it's and we have to live under this narrative. We have to adjust and we have to think about how in terms of geopolitical terms what that means to what it means for us for all of us. You know. 
Um, now, of course, when we say just to competition, oftentimes it's implied that the, the U.S. rhetoric that has been, you know, um, sort of uh, talking about the China's rise and what we need to do to uh, to tame sort of the the sort of market unfriendly terms of, of China and sort of the, their policies is also true at NATO. So at NATO's um, heads of state this uh, this June have approved the next strategic concept. Uh, in which China, for the first time in history, has received a couple mentions. There are a couple paragraphs. That's 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 a huge thing. Again, it's a piece of paper, but when NATO agrees on something, that means 30 nations all agree on that. That means 30 nations, as a consensus, they de they, they they determine that that China is the strategic competitor to the democratic values to our alliance. So, it does set the tone. It does set a tone, and it's um, it's an important development. Now, I think is also important is that this sort of strategic competition is not just a military, it's not just economic, it's also, it's, it's very broad in scope and scale. It, it, it's very different from, from previous ones. And it's, it, it's um, I think, when we include things, domains like military, economics, uh, sort of political developments, technology, disinformation, hybrid aspects, so everything becomes hybrid, everything becomes gray zone, including, including the, the climate change narrative, which is the, the second trend here is, I say, climate change. That's, again, that's the second trend that I think we're very clearly here, not just at this conference where we have a like-minded, we understand the, the issues there, but I think in a broader sense, the narrative is shifting that, well, this cannot be denied. We've seen hurricanes, droughts, floods, fires, uh, as, as I mentioned before, as I'm sure many speakers will talk about t today. It's evident. It's here. It has arrived. And now, of course, it's time to you know, get together and, and, and really, really to see what we can do. Um, now, I think uh, there's also a bit of a confluence, and I think it's finally there's a confluence of a narratives with national security means and what climate change means. Climate change, you know, probably long, like some time ago, it's, you know, a lot of, you know, just, it's not just, it was the, not, not, not a very politically correct word, like uh, tree huggers and so, it's, it's, and it's very different from a kind of hardcore defense establishment. We see this as a, con as a confluence and I think that's the right way to do it. Complex problems require complex solutions and complex solutions means that we need to bring together people and all of us kind of uh, resolve that. So I think that's that really this narrative is an important. That's why I think climate change is the trend that will, of course, naturally will change a lot of uh, um, a lot of things uh, to to go forward. Now NATO also in our strategic concept that I mentioned um, that was approved in June also has a, a full paragraph, which is it's it's actually a lot. It's actually we, we when we talk about climate change, we say that it's a defining challenge of our time with a profound impact on allied security. Now, profound impact on allied security, that's a profound sentence, I think, to, 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 because it's, again, agreed by all 30 nations, because recognizing that there's a change, there's a, there's a, there's a clear link between security and, and climate change. And, and you know, if we, if, you kinda, if we go further down that, that paragraph, which is, uh, so it's really about the, that climate change is a crisis and threat multiplier. So all that, all that's happening in our climate, in our surroundings, in our environment, eventually will affect climate. It, it was, you mentioned will, will affect security. And security is the most fundamental layer of any security. Like, look at Ukraine. When that layer is punctured, everything else stops. Men go to fight, women go protect the, you know, the families. That's how, that's how important, how critical it is for economic, cultural, educational activities. This is all built on a fundamental security layer. So in that sense, I think, you know, does NATO have anything to do with it? Absolutely, and and I think, um, you know, as we as we go forward, I think, um, again, it's it is not necessarily new to us. We're, we've we've seen f earlier dislocations of people. We've seen, you know, all people say the wars often happen for because of resources. A, so resources are affected by climate change. So it's a, again, this is something that we'll uh, we'll have to. That we'll have to look in the future. Now, also from NATO's perspective, I wanted to say one thing that the Allies have agreed is that NATO should become the organization, the organization meaning the, really a leading organization that, that talks about the nexus between security and climate change. So, 
of course, it would be a lot more work that NATO will do because, again, it's, it's important. It's all connected. We're all, we're all in a connected world. And for us to de deliver on our mission, and our mission, I'll, I always reiterate our mission, is just to defend freedom and preserve peace, you need to be accounting, you need to be looking at everything. And 2030 vision that, that Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has put out there uh, a couple of years ago is, again, it's very clear. I mentioned it yesterday at the dinner. So our, our vision is, is it really has three, three heads. By 2030, we need to become more technologically, more military, uh, military stronger, politically more united, and operate at a global, global approach. Now, that global approach means also looking at what's happening in the world globally, but also looking at areas that are not necessarily historically been deemed to be hardcore security, because it's you know to to deliver again the purpose is to de to deliver on our mission. We need to defend freedom. We need we see it very clearly in Ukraine. We see it very clearly in in a kind of eastern eastern part of the alliance. Defense of freedom is essential, and I think for that we need to to stay relevant. Now, now can we change the next slide? Um, my last slide. <laughs> um, so again, some takeaway points, and they're they're quite uh, loose in their structure. They're more like for my own, for my own um, uh, sort of a clarity of what to talk about. I think on neutrality, I want to say that both climate change and uh, and the war is showing that neutrality is no longer an option. We see that we have seen that materialize. Sweden, Finland, sort of historically neutral. I mean, I, I never thought of them as neutral, but okay. So let's say neutral co countries joining in the alliance. Uh, I think we see there's a more fragmentation in the world. We see the votes in the Human Rights Council in the UN, where we see a clear line with fracturing, some supporting Ukraine, some actually just sort of withholding their support. But that, and, and going forward, you cannot, you cannot stay neutral. That goes for states, that goes for corporations. Now, I think, um, you know, we've seen that corporations leave Russia, rightly so. Going forward, I think um, you need to be thinking about what, if, if there's more crisis, what do you need to be, do you need to stand your values? Do we, do we, neutrality can, it's really, what I'm saying, neutrality is no longer an option in this world, in this sort of polarizing world. So we have to choose your sides. And we're, we know we're, which side we're on here in this room, but, uh, I think it's, um, if you go globally, that's something we're, we need to be aware of. Now, on values. On values, I think uh, NATO, NATO's strength is, is manifold, but uh, the key strength is that we all share the same values. We all share the values of democracy, of freedom, of, of uh, human rights, and so forth. So any future alliance, any you know, as we as we kind of as the world again polarizes and, and and fragments, I think that values alignment is essential, and that also means that you know we have to, um, as we tackle anything and everything really, any challenges, including climate change, we need to get on that values perspective that you know very clearly, and nationally and internationally. So when you talk about nationally, it's about the whole of government approach. When you talk internationally, it's about aligning with the countries that are, you know, that, that share our values, coalitions. So climate battle will be won along the same lines. We need to get people on, and countries on the same, same lines. Now on, on security, I think that's, I mentioned briefly before, security is the, again, it's a fundamental principle that, that's, so we need to take care of security first. And, and that's why I think that the debates about the, in, in Romania has been an incredible ally, for example, on defense spending, on, on leading the, the alliance in, 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 in paying enough attention on defense and security matters. But security broadly is, is, is not about 2% of GDP, as, as NATO's guidelines have been, been saying for, for, for decades now. It's about whatever is needed. Security is, you know, you need to ensure security. You cannot allow the puncture of security layer, otherwise, Everything else stops. Economy stops. Education stops. Culture stops. For at least for some time, then of course people adjust, as we've seen in Ukra Ukraine. But you, you don't want to be in that situation. We need to ensure that deterrence works as well. So especially in the kind of Eastern Central European part. Now on pessimism, optimism. Here, um, I, I think um, I'll be very, uh, very clear. I think you cannot win 
any battles if you're not an optimist. You have to be an optimist. There's no, there's no other way. If you, if you, you have to be optimistic. You have to project confidence, and you have to project that optimism so the people, you know, because especially because we all need, need need together, all of us to 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 win these battles, whether it's in climate or in Ukraine. Optimism is is absolutely key. So when we look at the and uh, but sometimes when you look at the certain numbers, for example, for climate change, to become a climate neutral planet, I think mean, McKinsey has estimated there was a need for investments in a range of 250 trillion or so dollars uh, globally, which is an, it was just a crazy amount. Now that seems like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. Now, but of course, the big sort of uh, big equalizer, a big optimist project, projecting aspect is technology. Technology is, uh, and currently, the Oxford, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of weeks ago, there came a study from Oxford University which actually states that because of the learning curve or the rights law, which means that, which essentially rights law states that the more, the more you produce of technology, the cheaper it becomes, and, and they sort of estimate that a lot of technologies have these learning curves, especially the, the renewable technologies, they have these learning curves. Because of these learning curves, it's not about 250 trillion. It's about you know what, I don't know what they estimate 50 billion or 100 billion. Uh, it's again it's it's fa by factor much less because the sooner we get the faster we get those technologies deployed, the more you know the the more the, uh, you know the less it will cost to us. So I think it's a this is a profound this is a profound uh, unappreciation of of the exponential power of technologies. But I think the more and when you look now, there's, there's work happening on geothermal, on solar, on wind, on, on nuclear fusion, on, on many, many, on many, many fields. So as these technologies start progressing exponentially, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that these technologies can probably lead us to a better world much faster and probably much cheaper than if you just take sort of linear projections. Now, noise and signal. How important is it to, 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 to get through the noise and signal? Absolutely, it is important. Even climate narrative is sort of um, uh, tarnished by a lot of these sort of misconceptions, so it's important to do that. Resilience imperative. The volatility of the world means that, you know, we're really lacking resilience. So here, again, all institutions need to work together. All, all of us need to kind of tackle these resilience challenges, which are critical. And I want to finish with the two points here. How do we prosper? Well, we need to win. And now the, the first thing we need to do first, I mean, this message coming from, uh, from my boss and coming from, from NATO from allies, we need to help Ukraine win. That's the, that's the battle. That's the most immediate battle we need to win. As we win, we, it's, it's not just Ukrainian's victory. It's, it's democracy's victory. It's, it's all of our victories. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. I could talk, could talk more or less, you know, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really privileged to be here. And, you know, it's, yeah, so let's, let's do, let's win. Cool. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. You said at one point that we don't really have much time left, uh, but we do. That's not what I want to say. I just want to uh, say hello to all the people that are watching online, uh, from our, also from our partner, from wedonthavetime.org. Uh, this is a global um, organization connected to, to climate. Uh, we have 4,250 people watching us, um, either in the event app, we have about 700 people uh, watching uh, on Twitter, about 850, and, and YouTube, about 2,060. Um, so the, what that means is that I have a million questions <laughs> that I just got. Um, but I will try to, and I apologize to all those questions, really good ones that I can't really put, but uh, there's a couple of them. Um, there's one related to the war, um, and it says that there's immediate or small effects uh, that have happened, of course, and then there's a longer term effect which is related to political will at the global level. Uh, how do you see this, um, speaking about Russia, India uh, and China, of course, um, climate change has no borders and therefore it cannot be solved by Europe or, or the US. Um, what's your take on this? Uh, well, I think, uh, yeah, I fully agree. No, no one institution, no one country, no one person can, can solve this. And, and this is Again, as I mentioned, the, there's a problem of complexity, but it's also a fundamental challenge. Climate change is a fundamental challenge of collective action. And this means that we all need to act together. Now, does that mean that 
institutions like UN need some reform or, need, or maybe we need to revisit the whole global governance for that, maybe we do. And that, that's the thing, that the growing trend that you, see, you hear that, you know, yes, we need to preserve the international rules-based order. That's one thing that I think NATO is doing, uh, try, you know, our goal is very clear. Uh, to preserve that that international rules-based order, that we follow certain rules, that you know the strong the stronger cannot have its own way against the weak, um, like you know the, the big the, the big cannot have its own way in, in, in versus a, a small country or so forth. Uh, that, but I think on climate change, I think there's um, yeah we're all in this together, and I think if the global governance has to adapt, then mm -hmm. it needs to adapt. But that's you know. We, this is the kind of events that's, that are important to, to raise I have, that awareness. I have three to ten, actually, at least three questions related to China. As you mentioned, China is the, the competitor. Um, um, and I'm going to mix these questions up. Um, many climate solutions are related to products, uh, hardware, solar panels, cars, etc. Right? Um, and many of these put Europe and the US in the form of dependency. Um, is dependency a security risk, and how are you addressing that? Well, I think um, this is really comes back to the question of resilience. Now, resilience is, uh, I would say, three areas that are three areas that are most important, and that they connect to to, to what the you know the whole dependency on, on on faraway places. First, energy powers progress. So I'll leave the so the question from that. So for any progress, you need energy. So how do we ensure that the transition to, to energy is, is, um, is actually politically, socially, economically, ethically uh, right? You cannot just simply, trans, you know, you cannot, you cannot just put on now uh, all Tesla batteries in all cars. There'll be other unintended consequences. So you have to be really socially, socially minded about these things. On, on supply chains, I think we realize after COVID in the current supply chain environment, that physical goods are still essential. You still need an iPad, you still need the TV, you still need a suit. And now, how do we make sure that our supply chains, we build those supply chains, or have, how we have resource, access to resources by mitigating geopolitical and transit risks? Now, if we lose our ability to manufacture to cheaper places, that may be good for business, for, some, for an exporter importer, but is it good for a resilient society? Probably not, not so. So there's automation that may become in place. There's other sort of onshore, offshoring, nearshoring aspects could become in place. So I think this, again, it's a realization that it's becoming more important. So maybe I'll stop here. The two kind of items yeah. here that I think um, are important. How is NATO going to avoid future energy crisis like the current one within ally member countries? Well, again, as I'll say, NATO is a defense Security Alliance. We don't have a legislative power. We're not a supranational organization like EU, which can actually have a, you know, impose fines. They can have certain, they can other tools. What we need to do is to raise awareness of this. We need to raise awareness that actually any energy crisis, which is sort of climate-related crisis as well, actually is a security crisis as well. So we're all together. The point is here to work together with EU with the uh, U.S. bilaterally as, as a big sort of hege hegemon, but we're, we're working also with other countries and, 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 and organizations globally to ensure that, we're, that there's awareness of that and that energy crisis can actually easily become, uh, you know, it's, everything's weaponized these days. You know? So we say, well, mm -hmm. energy is weaponized, finance is weaponized, you know, it's... Uh, truth is weaponized. Truth is weaponized, absolutely. So it's, everything is weaponized. So we're, we're in this very interesting gray zone kind of warfare environment. Um, I have uh, literally 22 questions, but I'm <laughs> going to pick two, sorry. Yeah. And I thank all of you that, that in, in the room as well. Uh, as well. Uh, military spending uh, to go to more climate-related uh, issues, and maybe you can connect that with IDEA as well, uh, and what you do there. Well, uh, the military spending is, uh, well, defense spending, as I said, it's, this is all, we understand in this world, when the big bad bear is right across the border, you have, to, you have to spend whatever it takes on security, because if you build the security layer, that's, that's the most fundamental things that then allows everything else to prosper. I don't think we can prosper as a society. As Mike, one of the questions there was like, how do we prosper? Prospering is by investing in security. Now, it's also in you know it has to be done in in a in a, in a transparent way. It has to be done in a, in an impactful way. 
But um, I think you cannot take away the defense spending is is it ensures the fundamental layer of a society, which then allows us to tackle other problems as well. Yeah. And final question: um, In June, NATO stated that climate change is the overarching uh, challenge of our times. Yeah. Um, fake news is also an overarching challenge of our times, and fake news about climate, therefore, is or should be uh, addressed by NATO as well. How are you addressing that, uh, or how are the allies doing that? Well, disinformation is absolutely a key, or like sort of fighting disinformation and, and uh, fighting the narratives battle is a key aspect. We have a whole division really dedicated to our public diplomacy division, which is which deals with these questions. And I think the key here is how, you know, we can project our own, we can say our own truths, but if they don't resonate with people, that, that means we're losing, you know. So it's a, it's a very complex battle, but we need to, again, what we do is re ensure that we get the right message out there. We, have, we get the right message in the right way. So there's, it it's not only resonates with, uh, you know, with people in this room, but what about the more, more, more younger generation? What about the older generation? How do we, tackle all the elements of uh, segments of within the society with the, with the proper tools. And one of the probably best tools to, to project this information is, you know, if you are, you know, really it's ed through education. If you have a great education with a critically minded kind of, you, you develop critically minded young leaders uh, who, and then give them more range, meaning deploy people working in different areas and they connecting these different dots, you realize that, well, uh, the truth is somewhere out there, but the truth is also, you know, it's very clear at some point. Well, the truth is that we're running out of time, well, um, but uh, it was really great to have you here and very insightful presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a pleasure of, of uh, meeting our next speaker, uh, I think, in, uh, in roughly in June this year at the CE Sustainable Finance uh, Summit organized by Linda Zeilina, who is coming up on stage after the break. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to have with us Ms. Eila Krevi. She's the Chief Sustainable Finance Advisor at the European Investment Bank, uh, and she's going to share her thoughts on sustainable investments, so how do we uh, push for, for these solutions and how do we finance them. Um, from 2011 to 2022, she was Director of the Capital Markets Department of, of uh, the EIB. Before that, she was Head of Funding for the Americas, Asia, Asia and Pacific. Uh, prior to joining the financing arm of the e uh, EU in 1995, she worked for the Union Bank of Finland and Societe Generale. Uh, so it's uh, sort of coming back um, in Helsinki and Paris. Uh, in 2022, she was elected a board member, board of directors of the International Capital Market Association. Ayla, thank you so much for joining us. Please. Well, thank you, Ciprian, for the uh, introduction. And thank you also very much for the invitation to this great event. Um, I think it's really impressive what your team has put together here. So first, I understand, but first of many, exactly. So, um, so thanks, thanks again. So um, uh, I think we have heard some, some great uh, presentations already this morning. I'm taking a slightly different uh, angle. I mean, not totally different, of course, but talking from a point of view of, uh, of a financial institution, public institution, what we think should be done, what kind of investments should be done right now in order to improve the situation where we are right now. And uh, at the end, I'll also say a couple of things, examples of what the European Investment Bank could offer. We have the, um, the head of our Bucharest office. She will be here uh, tomorrow morning. So you will um, make her acquaintance if you don't know her already. I'm from Luxembourg, so uh, I don't know the local circumstances quite as well. Um, so uh, clearly we are here discussing a topic which is uh, one of the most urgent challenges, not only for the whole world, but, but Europe in particular today. And um, we are in a moment of great uh, uncertainty, of great human suffering and lots of concerns. So we have... Russia's invasion of Ukraine has plunged Europe into the biggest security uh, emergency and refugee crisis since the Second World War. There's also an emerging food crisis. We have a rampant inflation, just to mention a few challenges that we need to work on at the same time. Now, um, 
when global energy demand is uh, more pressing because everybody is clamoring to get the, the, the energy that you are not getting from the usual sources. Um, fossil fuel prices continue to rise and be extremely volatile. Then we have an energy squeeze and we will, are facing a very difficult winter. So Europe's energy supply as a, as a whole is still very dependent on fossil fuels and 90% um, of the oil and over 60% of the gas that we have been using is uh, uh, imported and some countries import a large part of what they use from Russia. Uh, so we need to find other sources of energy which are affordable, which are reliable and independent. And at the same time, we also need to uh, decarbonize, uh, which is why it makes sense not anymore to invest in any fossil fuel solutions. Uh, it's one thing what one does for the, for, the, for the purposes of this winter, but for any longer term use of money, frankly, it makes no point. You know, there is a name for this kind of behavior when you repeat the same silly thing over and over again and you expect a different outcome. We all know what that means. So there have also been those voices in this situation. That, ah, now you see too much talk about green transition, uh, too little investment in fossil fuels, and, and, and this is why we are in this situation. But of course, this is totally the opposite. It's exactly the other way around. So today's crisis is precisely a reminder why it is unsustainable to stay addicted to fossil fuel and uh, this can really be a turning point for a move um, faster towards uh, um, an affordable uh, and clean and uh, independent, more secure energy. Um, we have seen um, in the US, the, it's called Inflation Reduction Act. I think it's very wisely named, by the way, no talk about green or anything. Uh, we have the Repower EU package and, and many more economies who have a similar kind of action. So there is some momentum. Um, some of you may rem remember, and not many in this audience, but I think there are two or three who may remember the 1970s oil crisis. I do. Uh, that's when OPEC countries declared an embargo on certain countries uh, for uh, exporting oil to them. And then, of course, availability of oil got very difficult and the price of oil shot uh, to multiples overnight. But at the same time, or just afterwards, the, these shocks, they also instigated uh, vital progress in energy efficiency and in renewable energy, solar, wind, even nuclear. And there is no reason why today's energy crisis can't drive an even greater and an even more positive uh, change. So back then, for example, we learned to cope with less. Uh, I think uh, those of you who remember, it says, shut out the lights, close the door. This is what I remember from my, from my childhood. This was what you heard all the time. But back then, in order to produce one million US dollar of GDP, one needed, in average, 850 barrels of oil to make that happen. Today, that is around 250. So we are far less dependent on oil. But now we need to do the same with other fossil fuel energies and uh, find energy so other sources. This is not a mission impossible. Um, and really, uh, this energy transition, we need to decarbonize at the same time. So I think all of this is only going to one direction. So we need to um, boost renewable energies. We need to foster innovation in new energy sources and the carriers. Uh, we need to make a best and lowest use of energy through energy efficiency and just saving energy. And this is a really, really important point. And in order to make all this happen, we need, well, actually what, is, what we need and what needs to happen is a systemic change to the whole energy sector. It's not just that you uh, uh, pull the plug on this old installation and you pull, uh, put in the plug on the new one and you continue your life uh, as, as, as you did before. It's not. The whole system changes. These are different machines. They work differently in different locations, at different time, under different conditions. So we need to adapt and upgrade the, the, uh, to new ways of transforming and transporting and storing and using energy. So let's go through some points uh, more, more in detail. The most important one right now immediately is saving energy. Saving, not using it uh, or using it less and using it more efficiently. Um, so, um, energy has been uh, too much maybe in abundance, it has been too cheap in the recent years, so in spite of a lot of talk, not much 
has really happened because the incentives were not were not there. Take buildings, for example. They use 30 or they uh, cause 30, 40 percent of global carbon emissions in average. Um, i.e. they consume a lot of energy, which is a big part of which is wasted. So buildings can be renovated, and there are several innovative technologies which can be used both in existing buildings and also in new infrastructure. We have energy management systems, uh, like smart meters, for example, which allow uh, a very efficient monitoring of, of, uh, uh, of the energy uses, and they automatically adapt to uh, changes in, in prices and periods when others have a low demand. Uh, one example of a more traditional energy e efficiency project is one financing which EIB has recently approved. It's, uh, our part would be 80 million euros uh, for the Bucharest Sector 2 thermal rehabilitation program for residential buildings. And this means that the energy efficiency will be improved for 428 buildings, which means almost 17,000 apartments. And the focus is on thermal energy uh, efficiency on the building envelope, so the roof and the walls and the cellar insulation, uh, window replacements, uh, improvements in the heating and domestic hot water system, and re replacement also on the indoor lightning in the common spaces. Um, so for energy efficiency purposes of buildings, one should indeed combine such programs with local subsidies. They exist in, in most countries together with uh, public um, uh, institution, public bank uh, funding, which does exist for, for most of us. Uh, another thing, a small thing maybe, but uh, a very practical thing, more in southern countries where they have plenty of sun, you can uh, install solar uh, thermal collectors on, on the roof to create hot water as an example of solutions which buildings can do to generate their own energy and their own hot water in an effective way. So that was about saving energy, first of all, and we all need to do that by yesterday. Then the second thing is uh, grids and connectivity. And I think this is sometimes less uh, thought of and talked about because it's not quite as clear, but this is very important. So, for example, all EU countries would benefit from a greater connectivity of their grids. So you can import and export power when you have a lull as somebody else has high, higher needs or vice versa. We saw a very good example of this in Finland, which is my country. In May, Russia cut off all the electricity supply to Finland, sort of permanently. But we were able to import a little bit more from both Estonia and Sweden, and it didn't really cause any hiccup. So um, obviously the amount was probably not huge, but it just shows you that, that, uh, that uh, the, this can be done and it, it is very helpful. So um, we also need to be smart in how we apply technologies that already are in our hands, like the power lines that exist, where they can iron out congestions. Uh, and at the same time, we need to look ahead, what can be there, and tackling network, network issues before they even materialize. Um, so grids need to be managed actively and instantaneously, and power lines be, need to be monitored more accurately so that we can max out their true transmission capacity. So save energy and then look after your grids and your connectivity. And then comes investment in renewable energy. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the whole list of what we need to do because otherwise I would be here for a week probably. So I'm trying to sort out this in a half an hour. Um, so renewable energy investment, we need to construct green energy infrastructure, of course, in solar and wind in those grids I mentioned, in connectivity I mentioned, and then in storage facilities. And what is very much talked about today are those LNG terminals. Everybody is scrambling to build LNG terminals. Please, if you have to build them, build them so that they can also store hydrogen later on, not only gas. Um, also, this renewable energy, like solar and wind, it makes sense in the, uh, to, to invest in these because they, uh, they are quick to build, when the capex is done, your opex is pretty low. It's just the maintenance. You don't need to pay for the fuel anymore. Just like if you build a gas pipeline, it takes longer to build. It's quite impo important capex, but you also have uh, uh, opex in the future, which is to be paid and also is quite volatile. Uh, one example here is we have recently financed a floating wind uh, project in, um, in, uh, off the coast of Portugal. And this is a new technology which is quite simple. Instead of having an oil drilling platform, you have a 
wind turbine platform, uh, which can be anchored. And the advantage of this technology is that you can use it anywhere, any kind of coast, shallow coast, deep coast, it works everywhere. And uh, this can also then serve as a base load because out there at the sea, there is more wind, you can build higher wind turbines and capture more wind. So this is uh, more reliable in that sense. Um, some estimates have been done about the poten potential of this technology, that if it was uh, sort of uh, technically and, and financially operational on a global scale, this could produce more than 10 times the electricity that is now used globally. I don't know who made those numbers on which basis, so please don't challenge me on those, but it is clear that there is a very big potential. Um, and then, of course, our rhythm of lives and rhythm of our economies, so how we create energy and how we use it, uh, that needs to be managed. Uh, the sun and wind energy, they take a considerable amount of storage. We know this, and this is one challenge. Um, and uh, we need to put all possible efforts into that also that we find that storage and we find the carriage and it's not one single silver bullet. We can have batteries, hydro dams, hydrogen, synthetic fuels, thermal storage. All of this will have a role to play. I don't know how much for each, but they will have. Uh, and in batteries, innovation is happening. We just recently financed a giga battery factory in northern Sweden. And um, uh, they are uh, producing lithium uh, ion batteries. And um, we need that, of course, in the electrification of the economy. Um, now that batteries are used not, not just for phones and for, for laptops, but they are used for houses and for electric vehicles, we need uh, more um, uh, powerful batteries. And availability of lithium has been one thing that has been mentioned, all, or not only lithium, uh, that may be an obstacle, but um, it's an interesting fact that in 2016, which is not a very long time ago, global lithium market was worth of 70 gigawatt hours approximately. Today, apparently there's one single company who produces 280 gigawatt worth of lithium. And back then, consultants estimated that the annual growth of lithium market would be 4% per annum, whereas it has been more like 40. So one has to be a bit careful making long-term projections out of today's knowledge and today's numbers because many things happen on the way and certainly innovations happen. Um, so we need to improve all of these, we need to invest in all of these, um, but what I mentioned about the storage and everything, it's not only for the energy sector purely, we have the industrial sector and we have the transport sector, and they are at the center of all the high carbon levels, they are the heavy emitters. So we need to invest also in hydrogen-based solutions. Uh, it can be a substitute for fossil fuels, and as an energy carrier, achieve a balance between uh, energy supply on the one hand and demand on the other, in a centralized way. So, the two biggest hurdles uh, between us and a net zero emissions future would be production of enough of clean energy and proper long-term storage, and then of course what I mentioned at the beginning, save energy first of all. Um, if we manage on the storage side, this would open up perspectives for clean cities, uh, investing in companies that innovate in, in this area, and uh, we could have um, uh, cleanly powered industries, which produce things that we will still continue to need. We will still need steel, and we will still need aluminium, and we will still need all of that. Um, but it needs to be produced more efficiently. Um, Sorry, I have a bit technical sort of hiccup here. I could only use my telephone for my notes. Um, then um, one important thing which is not getting enough of attention at all, and this is adaptation to climate change. So we talk mostly about mitigation, about energy, about uh, all the things that I already talked about. We also need to see what we can do with the damage that has already been caused by the, the emissions that, that have been there until today. So even if we stop emitting green, greenhouse gases as of now, we still need to face this. And this is an area where public funding has been dominating until now. We hope that one can also crowd in private uh, funding in, on, on, on this area. Because this is money well spent, because what you can, 
if you can invest in order to avoid damage by floods or wildfires uh, or climate resilient agriculture, uh, they all save a lot of money from uh, the devastating consequences on even more frequent extreme weather events, which we certainly do see. We have seen this in this last two years in Europe. We have seen huge floods. Then we have seen uh, bushfires, uh, forest fires. We have seen droughts that we have never seen before. Um, we have uh, river levels in, in uh, Central and, uh, and, and Western Europe at levels that have not been seen since 1600s. So I think we have our fair share of those events. So adaptation projects, what could it be? It's, it's not as clear cut as the mitigation, but it could be flood management, coastal protection, resilience and regeneration of cities, protection of infrastructure networks, nature-based solutions to reduce the impact of, of all of this. And very often adaptation is about water, either there's too much water or too little water. So when somebody says adaptation, think first of water, it's not the only one, but it is a very big part of it. So what does one need to do? One needs to assess how floods and droughts and extreme heat, sea level rise, as we have seen, uh, and other climatic changes may affect something that you are going to invest in or finance. Um, uh, for these purposes, for example, we have an advisory service which is called ADAPT, very uh, appropriately, which will help both public and private sector clients understand how climate change affects their operations. So you are investing in, in a school, whatever, building a school. You may be, if it, uh, you may be want to know what, is there something that we could do differently in order to be more resilient to climate change. Uh, we are, by the way, we have focused very much on this adaptation now, um, and we can even go higher in the percentage that we finance when it is a very clearly adaptation-oriented uh, financing compared to something else. So, in conclusion, save energy first and foremost. Invest in your grids and your connectivity. Uh, invest in renewable energy, in uh, storage and, and carriers, and then do not forget about adaptation and resilience. Uh, is this clock here correct? Is that uh, my time already? Okay, I'll be much lower than I thought. So, um, EIB's modus operandi is, 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 is to go where the private sector doesn't really dare to dip its toes to the extent needed. So, we already started financing wind power in 2007 when it was not very popular for private money. Um, now we are going into the heavy emitting sectors. We want to look into uh, hydrogen, all of these sectors which are new technologies and a little bit more uncertain at the moment how they will actually work. So that is what we do and uh, that's what we do best. We employ not only finance people and bankers, we also uh, employ uh, an army of uh, engineers and, and uh, economists who will evaluate all of this. And like I said, there's also um, technical assistance provided. I think I need to stop there, then it's zero, zero. Thank you. Well, thank you. I have some uh, easy questions and some uh, complicated questions. Well, um, should I start? Well, not easy. But <laughs> there are no easy ones from so this topic. Yeah, well, no. So there's a lot of questions related to, I'm looking at all, all of the, the, the things. There's also questions about hydrogen, but there's also a question about nuclear. Mm. Two questions now. Uh, what is your, I'm not going to read because uh, they roughly say the same thing, but w w how do you look at nuclear as EIB um, and, and uh, when you talk about green energy, um, are you looking into that type of uh, investment and what's your uh, expecting, you know, next 10 years, let's say? Yeah, well, EIB has not really financed uh, a new nuclear power since, I don't, I think early 90s. Uh, for the simple reason that our, our shareholders uh, do not agree on, 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 on the topic. So we have done some uh, improved security financings, but that's all. Uh, we are neutral in that sense on, on, the, on the technology. Um, and I think it's, it's just that, um, just from the energy security point of view, this is now my you, personal opinion, yeah. that it's not something that happens overnight. In Finland, we just had this year starting a nuclear power station that was supposed to start operating in 2009. So it's not exactly available. And this was not even built by Russians, it was built by the French. So, <laughs> um, uh, so it, it's not something that comes overnight. There's also plenty of uncertainties. It's not, I hear sometimes that people think that fossil energy and nuclear are the say, reliable baseload producers, but look at France, France is, 
half of their capacity in nuclear is down uh, due to maintenance technical problems, which meant that they have become an energy or electricity importer instead of being an electricity exporter, a big one. So, and look what happened to gas pipelines. <laughs> they can be turned off. So I don't think there's, there is any safe energy and reliable which can be used at any time. So all of them have their, their challenges and, 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 and their, their difficult situations. So we just need to see that we have, we save and we have enough and then we have reliable carriers and, and batteries. There is no silver bullet to this situation, not even for self fuels. Yeah, true. I have a, a loaded question, let's call yeah. it. Do you think it is enough to rely on future innovation or that the more extensive redesign of our society or financial system is needed? A redesign of, a redesign of the financial system, the ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, financial system, I think that there's, um, at least in Europe, there's plenty going on. They're trying to be herded gently towards a certain direction. But uh, I think as previous speakers have said, and uh, as I'm also trying to make the point, that it's not enough to just, you know, you switch off the gas and you switch on the wind power. You need to be economic with this energy. And we have not have had incentives to do so in the last years. In my country, people think that it's perfectly normal that when it's minus 30 outside, it's perfectly normal to walk in a T-shirt and barefoot inside, that you have 25 degrees inside your house. That is such a waste of energy. Put on your wool socks and, and, and get on with it. So, so we have to just get this 1970s, uh, I think, uh, philosophy, uh, thinking in our heads that we need to save energy and then we need to see when we need it, where we get it from, what it is as energy and that it is something that, well, planet can live with, but we can live with it. Yeah. I, I have a question because uh, I can choose my own questions as well. Um, and it's, it's actually connected to where we met uh, and, and the region that we're in, like Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, what's your take on when you talk about sustainable finance and sustainable investments, uh, what's the outlook, uh, outlook sorry, um, that you see in the next uh, three to five years? Short, but... Yeah. I think that... The, the, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, but, but I think it, it is uh, looking good in the sense that there's so much talk about it, there's so much sort of... Uh, people make all kinds of declarations which sometimes are worth more and sometimes less. I, I totally agree on that. But all of this talk about it, it just doesn't go unnoticed. It's, there's too much going on. Uh, and there's too much scrutiny on everybody, and, and uh, you, you can't just consider or, or pretend that this did not happen and this doesn't exist. You have to think, whatever you want to do privately, this is not going away. The train has left the station. We know where it's going. We don't know the speed. We don't know how many stations there are on the way, but we know that it has left and it's not going back. Yeah. Um, and it's a train in which more of us need to be on. Uh, what's the role of banks, not just the EIB, but the national banks? Uh, how do you see and what's the biggest challenge for banks that you also see? Yeah. Um, banks, of course, I mean, they want to make their business and earn their margin. And uh, if they have a client who, is, uh, who looks like a reliable client, they want to make lending to them, right? Um, but I think the challenge for banks is that if those clients get away with not paying for the externalities, then they look too good. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hans van der Lue was saying that as, as an economist, you look away from certain things. Uh, as, as a physicist, you could not. But this is exactly what banks and financial institutions and investors are doing. They look away from the externalities. So you have baked in a lot of sort of free riding in your, in your business. And if one day you start to pay for it, well, it looks very different. And I think this is going to be a challenge for the banks. And they should really look into this. If the client doesn't understand to do it, then the finance providers should definitely do that. Yeah. And one final question, uh, which is uh, out of the four that I have about hydrogen. Mm. Um, uh, what's the outlook from a, a return, if you like, for hydrogen, which is a long-term process? Yeah. I mean, yeah. le let's go to 20. 28, 2030, when we have other technologies around us, 6G, advanced AI, advanced uh, automation, uh, hyper automation, how do you see hydrogen uh, and how fast do you think we can uh, go to more ambitious uh, projects? I'm not a technical expert at all, but I hear people talking about that this is maybe like takes 10 years or depends what you are, what you are uh, looking at. But to me, hydrogen is really for the heavy emitting sectors. It's not for everyday, you know, yeah. your car and my car. 
if we want to have a car. Uh, it should be saved for the ones who really can't do with batteries. Um, and and that, that is to me the, the main usage of hydrogen. And it's not without technical challenges for sure. It's still too expensive to produce uh, because you need a lot of energy to produce that hydrogen. But okay, it's a carrier, it's not an energy. So um, I'm confident that we will find solutions to that. But I, th I think we are talking closer to 10 years probably, se seven so to 10 maybe. So I have a job for you now. Uh, after break at 12.28, Ideally, we have a session on called "How Do We Finance a New Economic Model" with uh, Stefania Racolta Crucero from EBRD, Linda Zelina from the International Sustainable Finance Center, and Koku Agboblua from Société Générale. And I would like to ask you to ask all this panel a question. Okay, I'll so think the, the, of something. So the topic is how do we finance a new economic model? So what okay. would how, what would the question be? Uh, can I come back on that when I hear a bit what they're saying? Yes. Yes. That well, might be pick easy. up and you need to yes. write the question. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you by mail or by message. So, Thank you yeah. so much, okay. Ela Krevi from EIB. And? So, thank you. And Mulsumesk, I just used 100% of my Romanian. That is very good. <laughs> thank you. So, um, lovely, there's Ela Grey from the uh, European Investment Bank. As I was telling you, after break at 12.28, uh, we have a session called How Do We Finance a New Economic Model with uh, Stefania Racolta Crucero from EBRD, Linda from uh, Zeilina from the International Sustainable Finance Center, and Koku Agbu Blua, Global Head of Economics, uh, Societe Generale. And then after that session, we have another one with Hasina P, Chief Sustainability Officer from Group Societe Generale. On that note, uh, see you soon, 12.28, not a minute later. Thank you. Welcome. In the world, people have the courage to imagine a better future. Follow you the platform Climate Change Summit. BRD, you are the future. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. At Mastercard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy, and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another. To create prosperity, protect the planet, 
and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. The scientific consensus is clear. The world has a huge carbon problem. Humans have released more than two trillion metric tons of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the first industrial revolution. And the vast majority of these emissions have occurred since the mid-1950s. This is more carbon than nature can reabsorb. And every year, humanity pumps out more than 50 billion additional tons of greenhouse gases. This blanket of carbon in our atmosphere is heating the planet and changing our climate. And this isn't a problem that lasts just a few years or even a decade. Once excess carbon enters the atmosphere, it can take thousands of years to dissipate. Already, the planet's temperature has risen by one degree Celsius. And if we don't curb emissions and temperatures continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. In fact, scientists agree that if we don't do anything, temperatures could rise somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. So what can we do? Well, it starts by understanding and getting real about carbon math. Scientists account for carbon emissions by classifying them into three categories or scopes. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions that your activities create, like the exhaust from the car you drive, or for a business, the trucks it drives to transport its products from one place to another, or the diesel generators it might run. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions that come from the production of the electricity or heat you use, like the traditional energy sources that light up your home or power the buildings owned by a business. Scope three emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all the other activities in which you're engaged, including the emissions associated with producing the food you eat or manufacturing the products that you buy. For a business, these emission sources can be extensive and must be accounted for across its entire supply chain from the materials in its buildings, the business travel of its employees, to the full life cycle of its products, including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. Given this broad range, a company's scope three emissions are often far larger than its scope one and two emissions put together. And this accounting is important because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things. First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies, like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove, by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. 
În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At Mastercard. Sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. The scientific consensus is clear. The world has a huge carbon problem. Humans have released more than two trillion metric tons of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the first industrial revolution. And the vast majority of these emissions have occurred since the mid-1950s. This is more carbon than nature can reabsorb. And every year, humanity pumps out more than 50 billion additional tons of greenhouse gases. This blanket of carbon in our atmosphere is heating the planet and changing our climate. And this isn't a problem that lasts just a few years or even a decade. Once excess carbon enters the atmosphere, it can take thousands of years to dissipate. Already, the planet's temperature has risen by one degree Celsius. And if we don't curb emissions and temperatures continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. In fact, scientists agree that if we don't do anything, temperatures could rise somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. So what can we do? Well. It starts by understanding and getting real about carbon math. Scientists account for carbon emissions by classifying them into three categories or scopes. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions that your activities create, like the exhaust from the car you drive, or for a business, the trucks it drives to transport its products from one place to another, or the diesel generators it might run. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions that come from the production of the electricity or heat you use, like the traditional energy sources that light up your home or power the buildings owned by a business. Scope three emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all the other activities in which you're engaged, including the emissions associated with producing the food you eat or manufacturing the products that you buy. For a business, these emission sources can be extensive and must be accounted for across its entire supply chain, from the materials in its buildings, the business travel of its employees, to the full life cycle of its products. 
including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. Given this broad range, a company's Scope 3 emissions are often far larger than its Scope 1 and 2 emissions put together. And this accounting is important because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things. First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies, like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit, including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove, by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. At Mastercard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own control and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless.
The scientific consensus is clear. The world has a huge carbon problem. Humans have released more than two trillion metric tons of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the first industrial revolution. And the vast majority of these emissions have occurred since the mid-1950s. This is more carbon than nature can reabsorb. And every year, humanity pumps out more than 50 billion additional tons of greenhouse gases. This blanket of carbon in our atmosphere is heating the planet and changing our climate. And this isn't a problem that lasts just a few years or even a decade. Once excess carbon enters the atmosphere, it can take thousands of years to dissipate. Already, the planet's temperature has risen by one degree Celsius. And if we don't curb emissions and temperatures continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. In fact, scientists agree that if we don't do anything, temperatures could rise somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. So what can we do? Well, it starts by understanding and getting real about carbon math. Scientists account for carbon emissions by classifying them into three categories or scopes. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions that your activities create, like the exhaust from the car you drive, or for a business, the trucks it drives to transport its products from one place to another, or the diesel generators it might run. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions that come from the production of the electricity or heat you use, like the traditional energy sources that light up your home or power the buildings owned by a business. Scope three emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all the other activities in which you're engaged, including the emissions associated with producing the food you eat or manufacturing the products that you buy. For a business, these emission sources can be extensive and must be accounted for across its entire supply chain. From the materials in its buildings, the business travel of its employees, to the full life cycle of its products, including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. Given this broad range, a company's scope three emissions are often far larger than its scope one and two emissions put together. And this accounting is important because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things. First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies, like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove, by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. 
tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At Mastercard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. The scientific consensus is clear. The world has a huge carbon problem. Humans have released more than two trillion metric tons of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the first industrial revolution. And the vast majority of these emissions have occurred since the mid-1950s. This is more carbon than nature can reabsorb. And every year, humanity pumps out more than 50 billion additional tons of greenhouse gases. This blanket of carbon in our atmosphere is heating the planet and changing our climate. And this isn't a problem that lasts just a few years or even a decade. Once excess carbon enters the atmosphere, it can take thousands of years to dissipate. Already, the planet's temperature has risen by one degree Celsius. And if we don't curb emissions and temperatures continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. In fact, scientists agree that if we don't do anything, temperatures could rise somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. So what can we do? Well. It starts by understanding and getting real about carbon math. Scientists account for carbon emissions by classifying them into three categories or scopes. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions that your activities create, like the exhaust from the car you drive, or for a business, the trucks it drives to transport its products from one place to another, or the diesel generators it might run. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions that come from the production of the electricity or heat you use, like the traditional energy sources that light up your home or power the buildings owned by a business. Scope three emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all the other activities in which you're engaged, including the emissions associated with producing the food you eat or manufacturing the products that you buy. For a business, these emission sources can be extensive and must be accounted for across its entire supply chain, from the materials in its buildings, the business travel of its employees, to the full life cycle of its products, including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. 
Given this broad range, a company's Scope 3 emissions are often far larger than its Scope 1 and 2 emissions put together. And this accounting is important, because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things. First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit, including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. Hope. There is no such thing. We cannot fight climate change. We refuse to believe that our generations can build solutions for a sustainable future. The world will never switch to clean energy. It's a lie that we can change the course of global warming. Power and profit are more important than sustainability and responsibility. There is no silver lining. We no longer believe that there are solutions for this climate crisis. It's in our nature to destroy the environment. We cannot imagine climate change can be slowed down and even reversed. Intense heat waves will multiply forever. Ice caps melting is permanent. The sea level rise is inevitable. We don't think that we can build a better future for all of us. But. What if we could choose to rethink our tomorrow? We can build a better future for all of us. We don't think that the sea level rise is inevitable, ice caps melting is permanent, intense heat waves will multiply forever. Climate change can be slowed down and even reversed. We cannot imagine it's in our nature to destroy the environment. There are solutions for this climate crisis. We no longer believe that there is no silver lining. Sustainability and responsibility are more important than power and profit. We can change the course of global warming. It's a lie that the world will never switch to clean energy. Our generations can build solutions for a sustainable future. We refuse to believe that we cannot fight climate change no such thing. There is hope. And we're back. I hope the coffee was uh, good. I know there's a lot of people um, still outside, so if they can hear me, um, which they most likely can't, um, I just want to say let's go in. Uh, also, don't forget we have uh, sessions uh, at the Climate Future stage, which is down the stairs. There's a session now on CEE Energy uh, Futures with uh, Ukrainian, Turkish, and Romanian um, uh, speakers. And then later on, from 1.30, Minister Burduja, who is the Romanian Minister for uh, Research, Innovation, and Digitalization, will be interviewed on stage, on the Climate Future stage, downstairs by Teodora Tompat from DG24. Now, Coming back to what we do in the next 44 uh, minutes, let's say. Um, as I was telling you, we do talk about something that is, um, I think, in everyone's mind these days, um, which is uh, how do we finance a new economic model? And there's a question of 
is there any new economic model? What is the new economic model? Who's making it? Who's deciding it? What are the rules? Is this like Hans uh, was saying, an Adam Smith perspective, or is more institutional and regulated? Now, um, on this note, I want to uh, kindly invite you to give a warm welcome to our speakers. I'm going to ask them to join me on stage, and I'm going to introduce them uh, after that. So, uh, Linda, uh, Stefania, and Koku, please join us. Lovely. So, um, as I was saying, we have a session now called How Do We Finance a New Economic Model? I have a million questions to ask, um, and it's a very uh, uh, good position to be in. Um, also because I represent a lot of other people that have a lot of other questions already. Now, um, we have with us um, um, uh, Stefania Rakolta Kuruceru. She's Head of Climate Strategy and Regional Delivery for C Central and Southeastern Europe, EBRD. Linda Zeilina, to my right, uh, she's uh, the CEO and founder of the <coughs> sorry, International Sustainable Finance Center, and Koku Agbobloa, Global Head of Economics, Cross Asset and Quant Research, UK Head of Research at Societe Generale. Just a bit about um, all three of them. Um, Stefania, in the middle, uh, joined EBRD in 2006 and worked on the design and implementation of a variety of sustainable energy finance uh, facilities. Um, uh, she headed new product and business uh, development activities. Linda uh, oversees the activities of this uh, think tank. Um, and she's a fellow of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of, Encouragement of Art, Manufacturers and Commerce. Um, and uh, she's also a policy leader fellow at European uh, University Institute School of Transnational Governance. And Koku uh, Agbubulua joined Societe Generale in 2014 um, he was then later on named uh, Global Head of Economics, Cross Asset and Quant Research. Um, he used to work for a lot of other companies, uh, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and many others, which I might not know. Um, and he's uh, born in Togo and educated in China. He has an MSc in Management from HEE, uh, HES, sorry, School of Management in Paris. And he's a regular at CNBC and Bloomberg and these days Climate Change Summit. So uh, on that, and I'm very, very excited to have all three of you here with different perspectives on a matter that is relevant to all um, stakeholders, be it the business, uh, the government, um, citizens, uh, and NGOs. Now, um, I would actually start with, um, with a question for all three of you. Let's say, let's, let's pick two, three minutes each. Um, how do you see uh, European finance mechanisms, let's, let's call them like that, be private or institutional in the next years? Uh, do you see any opportunities or, or any challenges that we might or should uh, be aware of? Um, so, you know, taking a, a I mean, three years is very short term, uh, but let's look at the three years and maybe later on we can talk about the future. So, um, if you want to give it a go. Thank you, Ciprian. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today, and I would like to start by thanking the organizers, congratulating you for this event. Um, at EBRD, we have um, always put the environmental protection at the core of our agenda, and uh, in the next two, three years, in fact, through our strategic capital framework and the green economy transition approach, uh, the bank has committed to um, reach over 50% of its um, annual volume investment in low carbon and, and green um, uh, investment projects. Uh, this is coming together with uh, a set of um, other commitments and ambitions. We have said that we will be fully aligning our financial flows um, with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we are also stepping up the policy support that we are providing to national uh, authorities and local authorities with regards to improving the regulatory framework to enable more investments in the future. And we are developing a series of uh, programmatic approaches, uh, recognizing that the climate change is um, a problem that requires urgency in action and um, scale. So we have set ourselves a number of thematic priority areas, which include various um, sectors of the economy. So we want to invest in um, clean energy, industrial decarbonization, uh, green buildings, 
green buildings, sustainable food systems, um, cities and uh, environmental infrastructure, and uh, of course climate change adaptation angle is becoming more important and more prominent. As a European institution, we, um, we cover not only Central Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans, but our activity goes beyond towards the Caucasus, Central Asia, and, and also North, North African um, region. Um, we are structuring various types of financial instruments. We are trying to um, use the financial instruments to address the market barriers present in those countries where we operate or in those sectors. We are trying to address risks, perception of risks, and um, we, we provide both loans, we invest in bond issuances, um, equity, so we have a, a wide range of instruments. I want to echo something that the our previous speakers have, have mentioned before, very important, um, leveraging climate finance, working together with other partners, collaboration, and trying to find solutions that work on the local level. And if you were to put on the table one big opportunity you see in the next three years when it comes to, to financing in Europe, uh, from your perspective, what would that mean? I can't come up with only one. I think <laughs> investments in renewable energy will be uh, critical. We want to work with local financial institutions to step up financing for smaller uh, companies in the market for uh, residential energy efficiency, so not just the big players, but also um, the SMEs and, and the um, households and individuals and cities. I think um, climate infrastructure in cities will be critical. We did a study, uh, a Romanian uh, study, national study, uh, and uh, we asked Romanians, among others, what should be the main source of energy. And renewables was like almost 80%. So investment in renewables is also a topic that the people cares about deeply. Now, um, um, Linda, um, when you look at the next three, maybe five years even, um, oh, the same question, basically. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll take a slightly different approach. Um, so I think that we face two big challenges. We have the macro challenge and the micro challenge. And in this case, in the micro setting, what we're seeing is three very challenging years where we have huge inflation, big political volatility and uncertainty. These are the things that the financial systems don't really like. Investors try to shy away from putting more money into things that are not certain. So, so that will be a big challenge. Also, what we're facing is a much more polarized geopolitical uh, landscape, as our colleague Gerdimas explained. So in that kind of an environment, what is absolutely crucial is that we think, what, what do we need to achieve in the next three years so we don't jeopardize the 2030, 2050 goals? And that is financing, essentially, transition, sometimes even transformation. So thinking which are the critical nodes in the system. So renewable energy, absolutely. We all know that there's gonna be huge need for electrification. It also goes hand in hand with digitalization and efficiency gains. So that is something that needs to be prioritized. But again, looking at micro and level through level, what needs to happen is we, have, we need to have a much better grand political bargain amongst the big countries in G20, G7. We need to signal that this is the direction we're going, we really are going to keep climate on the agenda, and that we're also going to start through different disclosures, through different actions, trying to tidy up the misallocation of capital. Because currently what you have is, well, you have business models that are profitable, you can create loads and loads and loads of emissions, but that does not mean that you are not profitable. And that is a bit of a skewed incentive landscape. You actually need to give rewards for those who manage to cut carbon, who actually manage to transition or try to do it. So capital expenditures that, going, that are going into some sort of positive direction should be rewarded. And eventually, one way or another, we will have to deal with the negative externalities, whether that is through taxation, whether that is through managed divestment. And I think it would be also very interesting at some point during the conference to talk more about divestment. Um, because COP26 uh, in Glasgow, everybody was arguing that divestment doesn't work. Well, investment with no teeth 
or transition plan also doesn't work. So I think we have a lot of homework to do on the macro level to set the conditions right and to keep the direction of travel. And then on micro level, I guess we can talk later about the power that taxonomies can have or the power that tidying of the data landscape can have. And also, how do you operationalize all the pledges that you have from banks and others mm -hmm. to reach a net zero? Yeah, speaking of banks, um, yeah. Uh, to you. Transition. So I, I run a, uh, uh, the research department at Société Générale, so this is about 200 people um, from economists, um, rates, FX, uh, equity strategists, etc. And we obviously work a lot with companies and our colleagues in the uh, sort of financing department uh, have launched what's called the SHIFT project where we uh, look to help transition the auto sector, the aviation industry, transportation industry. Um, and there have been estimates by the McKinsey uh, report saying that the amount of uh, sort of financing required is $275 trillion by 2050. Uh, and this is you know, roughly $5 trillion a year. To put that into perspective, the world GDP is around $100 trillion. Uh, and the US economy is roughly 20, 20, 22 trillion dollars. But if you take a step back, I want to highlight one important point, which is time. So if you look at uh, since 1850, the pre-industrial era, the amount of uh, emissions in CO2 equivalent that was put into, into the atmosphere is 2,250 tons. Um, so that's what created the US, Europe, etc. Um, there's a concept called a carbon budget. So uh, we try to, the reason why we talk about net zero is to avoid reaching the 3,000 billion tons of CO2 equivalent because this is where temperature go, uh, you know, 2.5, 3 degree, and it's hell on Earth. That's like Mars. Um, so to avoid reaching the 3,000 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere, we have roughly 275 uh, sort of billion tons left. Uh, so actually, 2,250, and it's, it's actually 750 billion tons of CO2 left. So the world currently emits 50 billion tons every year. Um, so, and we need to reduce that by 50% by 2030, which means it's barely six, seven years from now, right? So but is that, I mean, is that possible, really? So that, that's the, to put that into perspective, because we talk about financing, and we talked about reducing emissions, and to finance all this energy also require energy. The first presentation was quite interesting in terms of solar wind, the amount of uh, sort of uh, tons of cement that's required. All of that requires energy. So the problem is that we have a carbon budget and we have a limited amount of time. Uh, and to put this into perspective, in 2020, when the world was in hibernation, uh, no car, no travel, etc., global emissions fell by 2.5 billion tons of CO2. That's roughly 5%. Um, what we need to do by 2030, over the next six years, is roughly 3.5 billion ton of CO2 in terms of reduction. 3.5 billion tons. So in 2020, we were in hibernation. Central banks, governments had to spend 25 trillion dollars of fiscal and monetary stimulus to keep the world economy alive. And we only achieved 2.5 billion tons. So in other words, to get to 2030, we need roughly 1.5 times a COVID crisis every single year on top of each other just to get to the level we need to make the Paris Agreement alive. So to keep temperatures below two degrees by the end of the century or roughly one uh, and close to 1.5 degrees. So the challenge is not only financial, it is uh, uh, also linked to the laws of physics in terms of what is achievable in terms of emissions. Um, and at the same time, it's not just about a supply problem. We don't need just to decarbonize the supply, we need to decarbonize the demand. Uh, and the last comment I'll make on, on this financing over the next two, three years is, you know, if you look at history, the energy intensity of the economy or the emissions intensity of the economy has, going, has been going down. Let's say it's down 50% over the past, at least 100 years. The problem is the world population went from 1 to 8 billion. And between now and 2050, the world population will go from 8 to roughly 10 billion. So we'll have 2 billion more people on Earth which is roughly the size of China, who will obviously want to have an iPhone, eat some meat, and uh, come to some uh, travel the world, etc. Um, so if you reduce emissions intensity by 50%, but you are twice as many people, or you are twice as many in terms of consumption, you're back to square one. 
So I think this is very important to put into perspective. The world of finance clearly has a role to play, but it is a, clearly a societal problem. And we should avoid the laws of unintended consequences, which is essentially addressing the supply and the financing without uh, addressing the demand. That is a bit pessimistic. <laughs> well, I mean, or realistic in the end. So, so the question yeah. that I actually have to all of you, but, but coming to that, mm. um, is that what you're saying is that we cannot do what we aim to do. So what should we aim to do? Um, there is a, a quote that says a pessimist is someone who sees uh, obstacles in, in front of, uh, behind every opportunities. An optimist is someone who sees uh, opportunities behind every obstacle. Um, so what we, I think what can be done and what is being done is number one, awareness, because the more people are aware of the size of the problem, the more things can be done. And number two, it's a combination of regulation uh, and also society, societal behaviors. Uh, to give you a simple example, when we had the COVID pandemic and crisis, we didn't create incentive to ask people to wear masks and give you uh, some brownie points. We said, you have to wear a mask and stay home because it's for the collective good, uh, in addition to other different measures. So my, my, I think my point is that there will be finance, society, uh, uh, companies, but it requires a collective uh, change uh, and collaboration uh, because one's economic agent alone is not enough. Yeah. Uh, reactions to that on, from you? Yes, I want to link to what Goku just said. I think um, even if we hear the scientists saying we are reaching a tipping point, uh, there is no turning back. There will be an increase in the frequency of uh, extreme weather events. There will be economic consequences, loss of human life, etc. So this is a, a, a dire um, image of what's to come. But I think we absolutely have to, um, to increase our efforts to accelerate um, the investments, we need to increase our ambition, and um, I'm, I choose to, to work with optimism in this direction. Um, at EBRD, we are uh, collaborating very closely with other development finance institutions, with all the MDBs, uh, to align methodologies, to, um, to report and um, um, report progress on uh, what we do in the, in the climate finance space. We uh, participate in working groups. Um, we are contributing to setting standards, and um, we were the first IFI to um, publish a report, reporting, um, um, a report on uh, TCFD. So, linking back to what Linda just said, it's important to look in your organization and uh, assess what risks you are uh, subject to, how you can mitigate those risks, what you need to do to address them, to set up targets, to set up a strategy, and uh, report on progress. So I think we will be doing this um, internally, but we are also setting up a special um, advisory facility that we will make available to our clients to help them um, look into their uh, climate corporate governance and um, start asking these questions, start putting together an action plan, and then report on it. I think that's, that's great, and I think also a lot of banks are doing that, starting to do that, private banks, not just um, EBRD or EIB for that matter, to see how they can actually support their clients to get a loan or to get a type of uh, financial um, um, instrument uh, closer to their business, because a lot of businesses are technically but governance wise unable to actually do the transition uh, to the new economy um, I know you had a reaction but I want to lead you for like two minutes three minutes all of you into a question that is bothering me for a lot of time what is this new economic model I mean how does it look I mean we're talking about transition to a green and digital economy in Europe but, you know let's say we have transitioned we are there how does it look? What's, what's the difference between what we're doing now, who's winning and who's losing? Well, I actually want to come back to the supply and demand question, and it actually links into this, I think. Um, I agree that there hasn't been enough uh, demand bottom-up for change, 
right? Realistically, it is Fridays for Future. It's scattered all over the system, and one actor can only do as much. Uh, and then the reality is we have, even in Europe, you have um, regions where, you know, your primary needs need to still be met before you can even start engaging into a nice conversation about climate change, because that, for you, is not imminent threat. That, for you, is uh, further away. And I think that's also for a lot of governments, and governments run on a short cycle. Um, I think how, how to think about the systems change is um, one of the things that um, needs to happen, and I guess the Commission, the European Commission has started that, is talking about double materiality. So in any kind of a transition system, you would really account much better for your impact on the natural environment. So you would have much better accounting of water, resource use, natural capital, your impact on biodiversity, etc., etc., And it will be should be incorporated just like um, an accounting statement. So if you could reach that point where you pick up a financial report and you see, okay, these are going to be the, this is the profit loss statement, etc., etc. This is also the social and environmental impact statement. That would actually be quite transformative, or that should be the way we go forward, because then you can also align better the regulation. Because currently, the space that we're navigating is a very slow pace of disclosure. So you have a variety of initiatives that we're going to have standards, you're going to disclose against these standards. Fantastic. But if you don't do anything with the standards, you don't incentivize uh, transition, then the standards kind of become nice thing that leads to an ESG rating that then is open to attack because nobody understands how it works or doesn't even measure anything meaningful. So I think in a transition system, you would really see the lessening of the impact. You would try to have positive versus negative impact. And also, realistically, uh, we would also then need to tackle the redistribution question because you can only accumulate as much money in certain parts of the system without redistribution before the system starts creaking. And you get the political volatility and you enter um, different cycles of crises. You open the Pandora box now. Oh, I love talking about tax. It's a very interesting <laughs> conversation. Um, so, so coming back to you know the, the the way the economic system should look, what what should happen in it, and what is the role that that a, a bank like uh, Societe Generale could play in the future? Let's say 10, 20 years from now, um, uh, in this we make a transition. We're there. What happens there, and what's the role of a bank in the end? Because there's a lot of people that works in uh, work in banks here. Mm. Uh, and then what will they do to this? <laughs> well, I was about to use the uh, the uh, analogy of the matrix. Do you, have, you can have the blue pill or the red pill, <laughs> depending <laughs> whether you want to see the reality uh, of what's g uh, going to happen. So I think there are two scenarios. I think number one, to answer your question, in terms of what banks will do, I think banks, uh, in terms of through the regulation, the taxonomy, and what uh, also investor require will essentially think very carefully in terms of what project they finance. So they have a huge fiduciary duty in decarbonizing different industries. So I think uh, in the future you'll see industries that will survive in terms of their ability to be profitable whilst taking into account all the externalities. Think about carbon tax or a carbon, a carbon, carbon border adjustment tax. So where the price of carbon is taken into account into the supply chain. So it also might mean less globalization. So if you can buy uh, or companies who are essentially able to produce uh, closer to where the consumer is, as opposed to having a supply chain that turn, goes around the earth 10 times, with a high carbon footprint. So, so what it means is that the world will be uh, different to what we are, we have today. Smarter in terms of supply chain management, smarter in terms of production. Uh, and there's a, also a question which is the theme around greenflation. Because as we said earlier in the first presentation, greenflation is, is, is a transitory period where we might see higher prices uh, linked to the transition of the, of the economy. Um, uh, and to put it a quick example, so we have oil and gas, mining companies, all these fo fossil fuel related companies who are needed to build wind farms, solar panels, but also are now reducing their investments and paying dividends and doing share buyback because of their bad carbon footprint. Uh, and that point, it raises the price of all these very commodities that are required. Um, so what it means for that world and how banks can help is sort of alleviate that stress but central banks will also have to uh, a, a role will have a, a role to play. Um, so net net, I think it will be an environment where 
not every company will survive and be able to thrive in that world because it's potentially expensive, but it will be more sustainable. Uh, and I think that's, that's really uh, the, the key message uh, around that transition for a more sustainable, stable environment. But that transition is, is going to be quite volatile, in my opinion. EBRD being a development finance institution, um, we, we have an operating model which integrates finance with the technical assistance that we provide to clients to help them identify, assess and shape the investment um, opportunities. And we also integrate this with, as I said earlier, um, policy um, dialogue to support and enable reforms in, uh, in our countries of operation. So while indeed climate change poses a risk to financial stability and we are starting to look into the composition of our portfolio and look at the different industries and how they are affected by the carbon transition risk, by the physical climate risk, um, we are also um, going to work with our clients to, to help them through this transition. And of course there will be winners, there are certain segments of the economy, um, the producers, manufacturers of, um, of goods that enable the green transition um, and there will probably be other sectors where we will see a, a phasing out a, a divestment in, in the coming years. I think this is um, something that will, will be supported with funding from various sources. It will be interesting to see how these funding sources will complement each other so that the best possible uh, results are achieved so that we can maximize the impact with the available sources yeah. that we have available. But I think project preparation is, is going to be key and advisory services complementing financing will be key. A heads up, um, in about seven minutes, uh, I'm going to ask each of you to ask somebody from the panel a question. <laughs> it's not just me asking questions, but uh, you know, uh, let's let's see some other. Um, we heard about um, taxes, um, and, and one way to go towards the new economy is to tax heavily or heavier. Um, but that requires a lot of political will, and uh, having in view what's going on from a politics and even geopolitics perspective in Europe. Uh, recent elections, and I'm not going to name the countries, but I think we all uh, understand where uh, and what could happen in the future. And recent, including non-EU, but UK perspectives, um, do you think we can go into debt, into taxing more, or are we going into um, uh, something else? I mean, again, there's a micro and macro perspective there. There's the global tax system, which is um, complicated and completely misaligned with what we need very often. But then there's also the national tax system. And I mean, it's not always about taxing more. It's about taxing differently and taxing maybe even less on certain things and uh, more on others. I think... Um, it's been very interesting conversations in the last, I think, two or three years where people were starting waking up to the critical uh, minerals needs for the transition, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what actually was already mentioned on the panel is um, I think CBAM discussion was very eye-opening because, yes, if you want systematic change, you will need to figure out how to take the carbon out of the entire system, step-by-step -step supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. But that does come with one hand, you're taking the carbon out, but you need to pay for that. Because the governments locally are tied to their societies. And I think that's one of the big things that Europe needs to engage a bit more in, is what is our reliance and what are our relationships with the critical minerals, countries, um, commodities, markets, etc. Because if we want to transition, if we want to meet that carbon budget, guess what? We're quite interlinked and being politically antagonizing or not wanting to pay for a, a climate adaptation loss and damage, it will be quite damaging in the longer run. And this is the one thing that needs to change in the system is that we don't think in the financial cycles and reporting cycles of quarters two years, four years, five years, and also politically, we keep the same time cycle. So we just keep making two steps forward, one step back, depending on how the political 
pendulum swings? And I think that is a very good question then. What is everybody's personal uh, responsibility as an individual? What is beyond my role at work where I can make maybe some change? I have a colleague who joined us from BlackRock and he created BlackRock Green Teams. That was the only thing in that particular system he could do, and that was educational, and it actually reduced some plastic use. Um, but the idea is that think beyond that. I have another uh, old friend who decided that he hated that there were not enough trees on his street. Well, guess what? He went to the local um, government, talked to everybody on the street, got together a group. It actually, they even went to the elections for, I think, um, European Parliament in the end. So the point is there's much more than you can do and I think often we lack imagination because guess what, you're working 12 hour a day and then you fall into bed and you just think, I just can't do this. So the point is um, with what time we have left, we do need to start thinking beyond just day jobs mm -hmm. but also what else can we do, what could be a very impactful small and tweak to the system and then push through our political choices maybe something more positive. Mm -hmm. And to add to this, I think to your tax and then to, to rebound um, what Linda just mentioned, I think there's a clearly a, a big clash between monetary policy and fiscal policy. So if you look at in 2020 and the $25 trillion that I mentioned, it created a massive amount of revenge spending and some sort of inflation uh, and an imbalance between supply and demand. Uh, but government intervened and did whatever it takes to save human lives. And that's what governments do when their population is at risk. Central banks do whatever it takes when they have a deflationary problem or a in high inflation problem. Today, central banks are doing whatever it takes to deal with inflation mm -hmm. through higher rate, interest rates uh, and um, quantitative tightening, etc. But this is conflicting to some extent with what government needs to do, which is protect lower income households in making sure they can uh, get enough money to heat their homes, etc. So and that was the example of the UK. So as governments try to spend more, cut taxes, potentially to finance a, a few projects, then you increase financial instability and inflation start to rise. And then governments, and then the central bank comes in and say, oh, wait a second, uh, you're overheating the economy. So not only do we have a global warming problem, the planet overheating, but the economy itself is overheating by trying, A, to transition faster than it can, or trying to find the, 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 the financing. So the point is, it's not just about tax, and because government will not be able to solve the problem. They already have high level of debt to GDP. It's the private sector that needs to allocate resources. But again, to go back to the first point, it's not just about the supply side of things, it's the demand. Because if you keep increasing the supply, sending money around, and people consume more, as if nothing has really changed, then the whole system breaks down. And I think that's where, at some point, there needs to be a wake-up call. Uh, to quote Mike Tyson, uh, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, uh, and it doesn't feel good, <laughs> but sometimes you need to have a reality check, and, uh, and I think this is you know, what the war in Ukraine is forcing, a faster transition, but also dealing with energy security. We talked about the NATO uh, presentation was quite interesting about security. I mean, these things are real. It's infecting people's lives um, and livelihoods, and, and, and that, that decision, you know, it has to become a national emergency crisis with the appropriate sequence of, of rule regulation to make sure we meet the, these uh, targets. To approximately uh, quote Michael Jordan, uh, he said that whenever you get hit, uh, you just need to think of the hoop and, and put the ball in. So perhaps you know, SDGs or other types of ambition that, that companies have and, and the world uh, was what we, we need to look at. Um, I was curious, I w wanted to ask you something. If you can give us one, um, one example mm -hmm. of a success story that you've seen in this transition to the new, to the new economy uh, from what, what uh, EBRD has done uh, in the region or in, in Romania for that matter. I think we do have um, a few examples of success stories which are actually unfolding. These things are happening at the moment. So um, EBRD is working, for instance, with uh, local partner financial institutions in, in 28 countries, um, more than 150 local banks, through which we deploy financing for uh, smaller scale uh, investments in energy, resource efficiency, climate change adaptation, small scale renewables. I think this is a success story because we have reached um, a very 
substantial number of end beneficiaries. We estimate, I mean, not, we don't estimate, we have reports to, to say that more than 200,000 sub-borrowers have tapped into the, uh, these programs, which combine commercial financing with very small incentives, just enough to encourage people to go for the higher performing technology, to go for the best available solution. And um, of course, we package it with technical assistance uh, to identify the solutions and then to, to verify and, and uh, uh, monitor their results. We have developed some um, information tools which are also enabling people to have access to information about the high-performing technology. So we have this green technology selector, which is like a catalog of different technologies, equipment, materials with uh, high uh, performance characteristics. And I think this is uh, a tool that we want to expand and make it available in, in as many markets as possible. Another example I would like to give is uh, is one of the biggest framework facilities that we have set up together with um, donors. It's called the EBRD Green Cities. And here we work with uh, municipalities to not only provide them financing, but actually helping them to uh, look into the medium and long-term actions and um, investments and policies. So we help them um, put together green city action plans. So in Romania, we're working with um, with a number of cities, Craiova, Yash, uh, Timisoara, um, we, we have uh, Bucharest, Brasov, Constanza, Mediash, um, so Bakou as well. We think this, this is a very good example. And um, another important thing to say is that we are also, um, we are also piloting a facility to encourage green R&D, green innovation. It's a joint program together with the European Commission Horizon 2020, whereby we want to support SMEs and mid-caps to um, look into opportunities, to look into new green products, new uh, green processes, and new business models which are friendlier to the environment. I want to apologize. I'm, I'm not just watching my phone for nothing. Uh, I have a million questions. We have about 5,000 people watching from all over the world, so um, uh, we don't have time to get their questions, but we have time to get your questions. So let's, let's, we don't have a lot of time, but let's see um, if, if there's a question from the panel for, for Koku, for example, um, and, and you know, vice versa. So just go. Um. A, a, a question I have is, is um, around transition. So, as I said, I think for the EBRD and, and also for, for Linda, how do you see this idea of uh, Darwin process of, of evolution by natural selection, so in terms of profitability? So, if by 2050 we start to have to increase carbon tax and things like that, not every business will survive because it will be unprofitable for them uh, to maintain the cost attached to being green, uh, even though there's economies of scale. So are you, do you think we might see a wave of companies uh, defaulting uh, uh, by 2050 and having to be absorbed by other companies? Well, I think that's without a doubt is going to happen. <laughs> I think uh, trying to argue that there won't be any disruption is a little bit naive. And it is going to be a trade-off, right? Wherever you sit, you will need to make choices, whether you sit in a bank or somewhere else, right? Uh, and I think often when we are very pro-climate, we forget that somebody will suffer, and sometimes it's a bit of a dishonest conversation. And I think we need to be a little bit more honest about uh, which parts of the system will be hit. Um, I was uh, speaking on a panel with Klaus Knut, the mm. head of the chair of the Financial Stability Board, and he had a very interesting point that during COVID, which you mm. mentioned, where everything stopped, you artificially stopped the system working. Mm. So now you're actually going to have a bit of a reset over the next few years with Ukraine on top. You will see things um, failing, businesses going out of business, and you will also see other ones springing up. But the issue is that you also need to figure out where the incentives are completely misaligned, and one of them is subsidies, right? If you're subsidizing heavily uh, polluting industries yep. with no transition plan, then what on earth are you doing? You're shooting yourself in the foot, um, which is actually very relevant in this region, right? We have highly um, industrialized countries where a lot of businesses don't have any idea about the transition or have very little, 
or have suppliers that are at real risk of getting pushed out of the supply chain. And I think that's a very strong message to send, saying that if you have, as a bank, maybe, I wonder how you look at that, is, listen, if you have targets that you will set a proper transition plan year by year where you revisit, you dial up the ambition, yeah, then sure you will you get better financing or we will mm. stay on board with you. Um, however, if you don't, then you know There's you will penalty, get questions yeah. and there will be penalties. Because mm. I think the voluntary system, it just doesn't work. Mm. And I think it's time to actually admit it to ourselves. That's all nice PR marketing spiel. Mm. But in reality, if it doesn't bite your profits or your bottom line, why would I bother? And a, because you're not held accountable for it. A, to finish on that, there's a quote by Einstein who said, there are two things that are infinite, the size of the universe and human stupidity. <laughs> and he was not even sure about the but size the of the universe. universe yeah. So it tells you how much uh, there is to do in bringing the whole planet uh, in line with the objective. Speaking of, of size and time, uh, <laughs> we ran out of it. Um, I think this could have gone uh, on for at least roughly three hours. Um, we have a, an online uh, a session now with Hatsina um, uh, Api from, uh, from Société Générale in Paris. And I know she doesn't have a lot of time, uh, but I just want to um, ask you one final question and you can answer with, with from one to five. One is not that optimistic, let's say, and five is I'm pretty sure that this will happen. Um, when you look at Europe 2030, um, from an economic perspective, would you say we're going to be very aligned with our ambitions or not? So one is no, five is of course. It's hard to tell on that scale. I think um, in terms of global, if you take a step back and look at the global system, I think Europe will do quite all right. We have a lot of the technolo technological and also financial, etc., know how, how to work with sustainability, a lot more, by the way, than any other region, which is quite a big firepower. I'm still a bit upset about the disparities between uh, maybe the UK, where you have a lot of education, and Switzerland, etc., versus even in Europe, regions which are behind. But I think that in terms of the alignment, it's going to be a bumpy ride. So about 3.54? Yeah, I'd say so. Okay, yeah. We'll be Stefania. getting somewhere, at least, hopefully. I think it's a big challenge. I think we really don't have a lot of time, but I, I, am, I have to be optimistic. <laughs> and I see a lot of um, uh, firepower and a lot of um, political will, um, that there are regulations that will come online. There is um, a lot of pressure that will be put on the market, not only pressure, but also funding opportunities. So I'm hoping that we will at least make a big step in the right direction by yeah. that time. On my side, I'll just say two things. Um, I think Europe will be probably four out of five, uh, because pretty much aligned. Uh, aligned. Um, so Europe, greenhouse gas emission is 3.3 billion tons of CO2. So e if Europe is net zero today, we'll, we'll still need to do 22 billion tons over the next six years. That's the first point. Um, and I'll just conclude by saying uh, that um, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Just make sure it's not an oncoming train. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on that uh, happy note, uh, I want to wish, uh, uh, wish uh, you a, a pleasant uh, summit uh, day. And tomorrow, you can see Linda tomorrow morning from 9.30, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and some of you will actually see Koku tonight for a special session. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you all thank for you. tuning in. We're going to take a half a minute break, and then we come back with uh, an online uh, session. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Now, um, well, we don't leave. So uh, I think we can go online. Uh, we stay in the same field, and uh, we do move to Paris. And um, I'm not sure if uh, if Hasina uh, P can can hear us. Just a couple of thoughts um, of um, of uh, what we're talking about now. We're talking about sustainable, <coughs> excuse me, sustainable business making. Um, Hasina P is the chief sustainability officer with the Globe Société Générale. Uh, she joined Société Générale in 1995. Uh, and has developed as a uh, she was appointed global head of export finance in 2015 um, uh, and and uh, head of impact finance solutions in um, 
sorry, <coughs> in 2019, um, she graduated from EM Strasbourg Business School and started finance at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. Um, I would like to know if we can have her on screen. Um, this means something, one minute, two minutes, something like that. I can seconds. So, uh, until we get uh, Hasina on board, I just want to have a show of hands if you have enjoyed the summit so far. Uh, I see two people that have not enjoyed the summit, so I'm very happy that 100% uh, 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 is, is never good, you know? It's never good. Oh, hi, Hasina. Can you hear us? Hello, yes. Can you hear um, me? One second, so that we also hear you. Um, you know, it never works, these things, uh, at the beginning, but it will work eventually. So, uh, let's see... Can you hear me now? Not yet, one second. Can I have a... Hello? No? Yeah, can you say something now, Hasina? Yes. Hello. Hello, everybody. Can you hear mm, me? Not yet. For some reason, it doesn't seem to work. So give us uh, half a minute. Um, uh, in the same, I mean, you can hear me. I can tell you, we've had an amazing day so far. Uh, we had uh, speakers from um, uh, all over Europe, and many of these, uh, many of the topics that we. And that is a sound that you never want to hear. <laughs> Um, uh, many of the topics were actually uh, highly connected to how do we create uh, a new business model, a new economic model, and in the end how uh, we do sustainable business. And sustainable business making is not an easy task and it's uh, usually quite expensive. Um, so let's give it another Can you round. Hear me now? Um, um, apparently not. So I need to fill up some space now. So uh, I'm going to tell you something that happens after, uh, after the break. Uh, so after lunch, uh, we're uh, very delighted to have Andreas Beckmann, the CEO um, of, uh, for, for Eastern Europe from World uh, Wide Fund. Um, then we meet with Mark Campanale, the founder of uh, Carbon uh, Tracker. Um, and then uh, uh, we have uh, Malin Berge, who's the Global Head of Sustainability Innovation Lab from Mastercard joining, and a really, really, <coughs> excuse me, a really, really special session from 4.30 um, that, <coughs> that gathers four um, business leaders operating in Romania, François Bloch, CEO of BRD Group Societe Generale, uh, Cecilia Tudor, Managing Director, Renault, Southeast Europe, Cosmin Vladimirescu, Country Manager, Mastercard, Romania and Croatia, and Stamatis Sapkas, uh, CFO from Global Worth uh, Group. Um, I have a question to the tech team, if we can give it another go. Yes, no, one second. So, I will entertain you in this uh, in the, in the next uh, minutes. Now, uh, until we get this um, uh, connection up and running, I'm sure you have all lived through the pandemic in a million uh, Zoom uh, teams uh, and uh, Skypes and, and all the others. Um, and um, I just wanted to say that I'm very happy that we can do this uh, offline. I think it's important that we reconnect uh, also as uh, uh, individuals, uh, not just uh, as uh, avatars on, on screen. Um, I'm uh, very happy that I can see you because usually this would have meant most of you would have had your cameras uh, closed. Uh, so uh, a face is always a good, uh, a good thing to see. Um, and uh, we're also very uh, happy that we can um, uh, continue these conversations in the next weeks. Um, Something else that happened in September that I really didn't have the chance to meet, to, to tell you. So uh, we gathered 160 key stakeholders from Romania, business, authorities, uh, NGOs, entrepreneurs, in a foresight exercise uh, looking at Romania uh, 2030 to see what are some of the biggest uh, um, um, opportunities, but uh, what are some of the scenarios um, when we look at Romania. Uh, and some of these uh, scenarios were uh, very much in line to what we've uh, discussed so far. There is a lot of ambition, both in Romania and in Europe, to move forward and to move uh, towards a, 
you know, green and digital economy, but in the same time, there's a, a continuous challenge uh, that comes from um, um, the uh, difficulty of entrepreneurs and companies to adapt and to move towards these, um, uh, this you know, new world. Uh, we see this uh, quite often at, at Social Innovation Solutions. We work with uh, hundreds of startups and companies every year to help them transition as well. Um, and one of the main things that happens is that um, the reason why they can't really go forward is the lack of capital, in particular capital that is related to uh, becoming more sustainable. So uh, the question is where do we get this capital from? And I'm sure in the next days we can also uh, chat about that. Now, give me Shall we try? Can you hear me now? I see. Um, I can't see you now, but I can hear you, and that is amazing. I can also see you. This is a victory. This is what I call a victory. Uh, by the way, this was staged. So we have been planning this for weeks and weeks, how to actually uh, get this as a victory. So Hasina, welcome, and very happy to have you with us. Thank you, and, and thank, thank you for the good job of uh, trying to to entertain our public in wine, so it was interesting what you said, I shared your views. Hi everybody, next time I will be joining you directly live for sure. I would like to um, use the time that I have been offered to exchange with you some views and then I'll be happy to take questions if you have some. Some views about sustainable finance, green finance and transition. I'm always uh, asked by people about the uh, EU taxonomy, the Green Deal, sustainable finance, labelized finance in general. But the reality is that in our day-to-day, -day, what is most complex is not really financing what is green. It's financing what is not green yet, what is not defined, what is transition. And being sure that what we call transition is ambitious enough, credible, and follows science-based targets or tries to invent new technologies, new solutions that will be on track for um, a trajectory that will allow us to decarbonize the economy. That is what I found in, in the last months the most uh, important uh, but the most challenging times uh, for us. So in reality, everybody is about green, but if you want green is the target, green is the end of the way. But today we are more in the olive shade, going from brown to green. And sometimes it's a big challenge because it's not as if we are going to transform the economy that is completely brown into an economy that is green. A thermal car by an electrical car for everybody in the same proportion. That doesn't work. We don't have enough you know, if we want to stay within planet boundaries. We need to do something that is much more in rupture. So marginal innovation won't work now. We are really in a interesting times, for sure, in a big challenge about reinventing this economy so that we keep the same level, if possible, um, of service, of, you know, getting access to very important things for us, but we cannot go on pretending that we are going to use as much as we did so far. So coming back to my example of the cars, thinking that each person having today a thermal car will in the future will exactly have the same stuff, which is a car but electrical, won't work. And probably what we are trying today to invent is the conversion from the ownership to the usage thinking in the end of what is very important is it to own a car or is it to have accessible affordable and sustainable mobility so that's the big thing at the moment reinventing what we want to have what we want to possess what is really important that's one thing and it works well, if you if you do it seriously you will realize that maybe we can have second-hand goods, second-hand cars, second-hand clothes. We can, but that's a shift in probably in our collective desire or collective dream, collective program. So th that's one thing, and that's what I found the most interesting and complex at the same time. Because we all work looking at climate scientists, IPCC, for example, but now we try to have a look as well at IPBC, 
IPCC is about climate change, scientist groups, IPBC, B stands for behavior. We have scientists working on sociology, philosophy, anthropology, realizing that in reality, if we want really to organize the big challenge we are talking about, we need to attack not only scientific proofs about climate change, but on top of that, attack in a way um, what the human being is searching for, and, and this is all about this uh, behavioral challenges. So that's one thing. Uh, that means that when we work as a bank, if I come back to my own uh, work, we need to invent new ways, like instead of just waiting for a customer to ask for a loan to finance an acquisition, then we are developing services about leasing, about sustainable mobility, which could be you know, across uh, different modes of transports. So you can have access to a small electrical car for the week, but you can have access to an electrical bike, but you can have access as well to a card allowing you to switch to public transportation or uh, sharing of cars with you know, some systems that will help you find the most appropriate way. So it opens a lot of opportunities. But again, as I said, it's a challenge because we need to rethink a little bit the way we work. So I gave you the example of the mobility uh, for private customers. But in reality, the same applies everywhere in, in an institution like a bank, where you finance the shipping industry, for example, and you are organized with product lines. One person finances a vessel with a mortgage loan. Well, tomorrow or already today, the issue is no more this one. The issue is what is the evolution of the sector and hence of the ship owner? Well, probably he wants to use some vessels not propelled by heavy fuels, but by LNG gas. But he will only do that if the shipyards are going to promise that they are going to engage into long series of these new vessels because he doesn't want to buy a prototype or he wants to ensure that is buying into something that will keep value for a long time. But at the same time, he will agree to invest into these new types of vessels if in the harbors, in the port infrastructures, he is for sure finding every week where he calls around the world in the various ports, he will find LNG bunkering facilities. And there you see, you have the shipyard, the ship owner, the port facilities, and the energy company in the port facilities that will bring the, the gas to, to, to fuel the vessels. So all of a sudden, uh, where before you had one interlocutor, your ship owner client, then you engage with a whole value chain that is across various sectors. So it's a cross sectorial discussion where in many institutions, you will have four different silos. And now you need to put everybody around the table because together, they can design a solution, taking into account the fact that, yes, they can finance the energy because they know the harbor and the way infrastructure works, and they can count on the commitment of the ship owner to come and pay for the gas every week uh, in this harbor, for example. That's an example, but we have many of them. So what we have to do today, of course, is to provide green financing sustainable financing. But more than that, we need to reinvent our mandates, our business models, to be able to provide the right solution to our clients. So it's, a, it's about co-construction within an organization. But much more than that, what we're doing right now is working in alliances with the clients, with the scientists, with the other banks, with NGOs. Because what we know is that we all commit to 2050 for some carbon neutrality. But before that, most of us will have to commit to 2030. And to do that, we are a bit blind because we know that we have to rush collectively, but we don't really have the GPS because in many industries, technologies are not completely there yet. So to take commitments in the short or medium term is tough. 
But as a bank, we signed for the net zero banking alliance with another 100 banks. And for that, we need to start putting concrete targets before 2030. And so that makes us uh, uh, our life <laughs> interesting because we don't really know, as I said, in many sectors, what is going to happen. Are we going to have vessels propelled by hydrogen? Probably not. Are we going to be able to plug them, uh, you know, on Earth uh, with electricity? Is it going to be renewable electricity? How does it work? Is it in so many questions? And so that's that's what's going on at the moment. Keeping on with what we know, pushing sustainable finance and green finance and using the taxonomy and the Green Deal. But more than that, and that's kind of revolution, rethinking in all of our industries. What is going to happen? 2050, most companies have committed to carbon neutrality. Before that, decades before. And so once we have that understanding, what do we need to do as a bank to reinvent what type of risks are we supposed to take? We need to open up to new actors because champions of the transition maybe are small companies that are not, you know, the usual big clients of our institutions. We need to open up to new business models. If you look at electricity production, for example, we used to have mega power projects. This is what we know. We know how to structure them in project finance. We know that the electricity is sold to the incumbent utility. We know many things. But today, for the one billion people on the planet that have no access to electricity, Almost nobody will have access through these mega projects. What we see today are small solar powered installations, sometimes tiny ones. So we need to standardize them, to aggregate, to distribute. It's a very different business, very different risk from what we, we knew before. So, and that's just one example. In many different instances, we see that we need to take a, a new look, new eyes, because what is going on has to be taken differently. And on top of that, very importantly, there is the social aspect of it, because there will be no transition if it's not fair, just meaning that people have access uh, you know, to, to what they, they should be um, having access to, as today, like uh, energy, of course, but then many other things in the new agriculture and so on. That's another very important but not easy dimension as well. And again, we cannot think that we will go from brown to green, from thermal car to electrical car. Think that electrical car is more expensive. And to be fair, we need to subsidize. It, it's OK maybe for a few years, but it is not a sustainable model. So what we need to do is not that. But as I said at the beginning, rethink what people need and they need access to sustainable and accessible mobility and maybe it's not in the form of the ownership of an electrical car maybe it's more in a multimodal access to a transportation card access to shared cars uh, within the communities and that means rethinking more than just what people want but rethinking the infrastructure the cities you know what what the countries are planning for the future in terms of infrastructure, in terms of how do you draw the cities or the new parts of the cities of tomorrow. If you build them, uh, as we did over the past 50 years here in France, uh, out of the city, you have houses. 30 kilometers ago, 20 kilometers ago, you have supermarkets. And another 20 kilometers ago, you have your job, you know. It, it, it can't work with a system where you reduce your mobility because you want to have access to transportation that are public and so on. If you want things to improve and to change, then you need to rethink and have parts of the cities where you can walk, you can use your bike, you can have local uh, grocery stores so you don't have to go 20 kilometers away, meaning you buy local and so on. So you see, Banks, in a way, have a, a big role to play, of course, because we fuel the economy with finance. But in reality, we have to be very modest because we are uh, 
behind or dependent on what the citizens, the consumers, are going to change for their habits and their needs, and what the states are going to be uh, organizing for the future. So we need to be three here to tango, if we can, together. So it's a very um, it's a very interesting topic. Of course, I'm not talking about the current crisis because uh, we are very conscious that it is strange to talk about these long-term plans, in including some energy efficiency and sobriety, right in the middle of an energy crisis where people are very scared about, you know, are they going to have access to energy? But at the same time, we need to solve that. But we have this huge pressure to engage and not to stop this engagement, to engage into um, the alignment of our portfolios of credit into a carbon neutrality trajectories. We committed to that, and that this is what we are building. So we have commitments on oil and gas, on power sector, and you know, on improving the energy efficiency of our portfolio. And we are, um, we have uh, automotive uh, targets the automotive industry will work for the next year when we'll issue some commitments on cement on steel on shipping we have already some on shipping but we'll renew them and so the most emissive sectors of a bank like ours will have to be covered in terms of trajectories so we will need to engage and so that's a challenge because of course we will do that on a scientific way but we are called to align ourselves to a 1.5 degree scenario whereby the industries, the economy, our clients are not always there, far from it. Most of them are above 2.5 degrees. So this is a bit the, the situation where many banks are at the moment. And so we are tr working hard, again, as I said before, to invent new solutions, new ways to accelerate the transition of uh, the economy uh, and uh, helping our clients in their own transitions. I could say much more, but maybe it's better if I can stop so that if you have questions or comments, uh, then then we'll have some time for that. So you can hear me now. Okay. Yes. I, I, have, I have a four to five questions on my own and uh, significantly more online we have now about 408,000 people watching online 4,800 so uh, from all around the world um, I was driving through Paris in August which is the worst thing you can do anywhere so I was driving through Paris in August this August um, and then uh, that reminded me of I mean what you said about how we re how we build uh, cities uh, was was wrong uh, I wanted to ask you how do you see and what is the role of banks and your bank in particular in rebuilding cities and making cities more resilient what are uh, what is the vision and, and and what are the challenges that you also uh, might face in in uh, taking on this this role of, of financing the the future in the end yep so several things here thank you for the question um, first, we finance the cities, so we accompany their development, and we can structure for them some financing where they can commit with some KPIs uh, linked to the, uh, the evolution of the urbanization in the right sense, decarbonization, accessibility for people. There are many ways to help them uh, structure that. Then we have different other ways. We are a big player in uh, leasing of cars. Um, we, we have partnerships as well for the installation of infrastructure, of recharging infrastructure, you know, for, uh, for cars. We'll uh, acquire um, a, a, another group in uh, next year, this plan, and so we will create a major actor in the electrical car vehicles. And so we can display, we can, we can put on the market more second-hand cars after a while in the electrical market to boost it. And we can as well play what I told you before, this mobility card. On top of that, we have um, some uh, design, um, quite smart design thinking uh, startups on the uh, urban sphere, where you know they can, um, they can help the public actors to design parts of cities and they play on the, um, the calculation of impacts. So what type of impacts do you want for your citizens? 
like uh, less than 10 minutes walking to go to the uh, transportation, uh, so much green parts for the kids to play, whatever. And then depending on that, they help modelize and then they help co-construct with the citizens, you see. We have also some um, real estate developers. They work on very interesting eco districts where contrary to what I said before, you don't have uh, to, to, to go like 20 kilometers to shop. Everything is integrated and you can walk around and then you will have as well people living, uh, elderly people houses, they care for kids in a way that at some point people can help each other, can benefit from the, uh, well, the free time of some others, the need of others. So it's a rethinking uh, quite deeply in the, the way we live in reality, the way we use um, the cities. Yeah, I have a question, uh, and I think it's from uh, somebody that works in a bank, actually, quite sure. Um, and there's a lot of people uh, also in the theater, um, but also online that work in the financial sector, in particular in banks, in particular Societe General, of course, uh, and Bered. Um, and the question is related to how can we better communicate with our clients and with uh, ourselves. So I would rephrase the question, how, how, what would you say to people working in banks is the best approach to help their customers understand more about sustainability, but also within themselves as, as, as individuals and, and professionals to uh, talk uh, like we used to talk 10, 20 years ago about digitalization. Uh, I think we're at that point where uh, we need to talk about sustainability and sustainable business making. Uh, so what's your, your uh, view on that? I think it's a great point, a great question and a great point to make the parallel with digital. It's exactly that. So what we need to do, all of us, is to get awareness, to understand what's going on, to get training and to help our clients getting awareness and training. I'm thinking about SMEs and small structures who don't really have the means then why not organize, you know, for example, we do this game, the climate risk, the climate college. Uh, you can do that with your clients as well. We are thinking about developing an academy whereby some of the training modules that we use for the, the bank could be used for SMEs as well or our students. So really like getting out of the walls of the bank to share our knowledge. But as well, you can invite your own clients in specific sectors to talk and teach to your people as well. Now with, you know, replays, I mean, you can register what you do and, and you have a replay that everybody can, can have a look at. So that, that's really the key point. But the good thing here is that if you're curious, you will get podcasts, you will get excellent books, you will get so many things on top of what your own organization has to offer. Yeah. There's another question. But you know what? Sorry. Please, the, the, please. the big no, no, please. challenge for me, the big, big challenge is how do we play with the contradiction between the short term? We all have short term objectives. We are in a short term world. How do we combine that with long term, um, for example, 2050 commitments? What does it mean in terms of urbanization now? What will it bring in 2030? We need to understand the long term, the evolution, to come back to the present and invent something. But the problem is that we live in such a short-term world that for most of us, it's tough even to find time to train or to, to envision this, this future. But I mean, we need to make that effort, otherwise we're a bit, uh, we're a bit lost. Yeah, I have a, a challenging question uh, coming up. Um, we had a panel earlier on and one of your colleagues, uh, Koku Agbo Bloa, is Global Head of Economics, uh, the re head of uh, research at the UK office. Uh, he actually mentioned something about globalization and how the future might be about less uh, or a, sort of a less globalized world. Uh, I was reading uh, in, a, in a, an article recently that a sustainable uh, business making operation means less globalization because you would produce locally, buy locally. Um, uh, do you think I mean, when you look at the future, um, you know, 10, 20 is uh, into the future. Do you see a world that is more globalized uh, and sustainability plays a role in that? Or do you think we will actually be uh, even more globalized than, than we are now? Uh, 
And bear in mind this, this uh, tension about local production um, of, of goods uh, and even uh, obviously services as well. I think that uh, we, it, made, it became very clear after the COVID crisis uh, that people wanted to rethink a little bit their dependency towards essential goods, means, medicines that were produced somewhere else in the world. Blocking your production of cars because you don't have this tiny little thing that is made somewhere in Asia is not completely acceptable anymore for many companies. If you add the current crisis that I think will accelerate the need for states in terms of security, Dependent, independence, uh, it will accelerate the willingness to relocalize. Uh, that I think it's for sure. Plus, uh, but I mean, you're, you're still in a country with an industry, but bear in mind that many countries have shifted away their industries, their production, and so they have transformed themselves in a city in white collar people, white collar citizens, and so they lost a little bit this this capacity to produce, and and that will be a challenge because they are fit for globalization. But if you are in a country where you have some industry, then you can adapt, I think, better and quicker to this new paradigm, meaning that uh, you need to reuse, you need to repair, you need to think differently in the way you operationalize things. And it's in your hands. And, but more than that, globalization was based probably also on the, the promise that it, you know, economic, ties will bring some peace in the world. Uh, plus, we were all very much driven uh, by you know, the, the same driver, which was money in a way, making money and shareholders return. If, little by little, we believe that we need to look at something different, I look at the external, you know, the negative uh, externalities on the environment, on the fact that the, the planet has some boundaries, then maybe you will think twice before having your pair of trousers uh, produced in 20 different countries of the world and shipped away whatever the CO2 emissions. So that, that is another yeah. driver for relocalization, I think. Yeah. True, we don't have a lot of time left. I know you, you also have a very busy schedule. Uh, one or two uh, final questions. Um, and the first one is, uh, if you were to address um, people working in the banking sector, what would you say are the main uh, challenges or the main risks that they should look at in the next years? And what is the biggest opportunity that they might miss if they're not paying attention? We need to pay attention to the risk of adaptation more and more. We used to talk a lot about climate mitigation, climate risk mitigation. Now, I think that adaptation is going to be something uh, strong. We, we see it every day. And in terms of opportunity, uh, I think none of us in our careers have been facing such a huge opportunity to finance CapEx. We're talking about trillions. It's uh, several trillions per year in the coming decades. We never experimented such a huge potential of financing in such a short period of time in all our careers. So for me, uh, if we manage to understand the risks and be careful, if we are quick enough to decide on you know, what is the new way, uh, if we adapt in order to help our clients in the transition, then that's, uh, that's a huge opportunity. Yeah, um, and one final question, um, what is the most difficult question you ask yourself as a, as a leader in sustainability? It's a good question. I, I, I am struggling with time frames. <laughs> I, I read scientific evidence about the fact that we need really to hurry up. And at the same time, I see that I have to serve my clients and I cannot just switch off all the liquidity from the bank. And so I'm struggling very much between, okay, how, what is the pace that is enough to make sure that we are not going to have this huge problem, the train coming from the tunnel, as Koku said, and at the same time serving the economy and helping it to transition. That's my big struggle, personally. I think it's a struggle that most of us uh, have or will have, even if we're not uh, in, in, in positions of, of uh, decision-making sometimes. Uh, I want to thank uh, a lot, and I want to... Uh, um, thank the, the audience uh, 
um, and also for the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Hasina. Uh, this was Hasina P, Chief Sustainability Officer with Group Societe Generale. Uh, thank you so much, and let's give her a big uh, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. a very nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Hasina. Uh, <clears throat> we are in fast. Um, do you like to eat? Of course, we all do. Um, we will also talk in the coming days about food um, and agriculture. Um, uh, we're ready to go to lunch. You can exit the theater um, and you need to you know, make a right. Our volunteers are here to help you if you want to eat, of course. Um, uh, you go to Stadio restaurant, which is a very nice place. Uh, but please, please be back here by 14.45. So you have uh, 40... <laughs> Oh, we have a lot of minutes. So we have uh, almost 50 minutes for this. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's see um, uh, each other back. We come back with Andreas Beckman from WWF, Mark Campanale from Carbon Tracker, um, and uh, many other amazing speakers. Thank you very much. Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. The scientific consensus is clear. The world has a huge carbon problem. Humans have released more than 2 trillion metric tons of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the first industrial revolution. And the vast majority of these emissions have occurred since the mid-1950s. This is more carbon than nature can reabsorb. And every year, humanity pumps out more than 50 billion additional tons of greenhouse gases. This blanket of carbon in our atmosphere is heating the planet and changing our climate. And this isn't a problem that lasts just a few years or even a decade. Once excess carbon enters the atmosphere, it can take thousands of years to dissipate. Already, the planet's temperature has risen by one degree Celsius. And if we don't curb emissions and temperatures continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. In fact, scientists agree that if we don't do anything, temperatures could rise somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. So what can we do? Well, it starts by understanding and getting real about carbon math. Scientists account for carbon emissions by classifying them into three categories or scopes. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions that your activities create, like the exhaust from the car you drive, or for a business, the trucks it drives to transport its products from birthday, one place to another, she was or the diesel generators it might run. Something that she would Scope really two emissions love. are indirect she emissions that come from, from the production of the electricity like or heat you dinner. use, like but the traditional like energy she sources she that light up your home or power the buildings owned by a business. Scope three emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all the other activities in which you're engaged, including the emissions associated with producing the food you eat or manufacturing the products that you buy. For a business, these emission sources can be extensive and must be accounted for across its entire could be found alongside food items from all over the world. Their the business travel of its employees to the full life cycle of its products, including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. Given this broad range, a company's scope three emissions are often far larger than its scope one and two emissions put together. And this accounting is important because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things. First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies, like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. 
That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit, including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove, by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At MasterCard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy, and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day, guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At MasterCard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition.
level of its employees to the full life cycle of its products, including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. Given this broad range, a company's Scope 3 emissions are often far larger than its Scope 1 and 2 emissions put together. And this accounting is important because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things. First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies, like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit, including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove, by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At Mastercard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own control and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At MasterCard, sustainability is core to our business. 
It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. The scientific consensus is clear. The world has a huge carbon problem. Humans have released more than 2 trillion metric tons of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the first industrial revolution. And the vast majority of these emissions have occurred since the mid-1950s. This is more carbon than nature can reabsorb. And every year, humanity pumps out more than 50 billion additional tons of greenhouse gases. This blanket of carbon in our atmosphere is heating the planet and changing our climate. And this isn't a problem that lasts just a few years or even a decade. Once excess carbon enters the atmosphere, it can take thousands of years to dissipate. Already, the planet's temperature has risen by one degree Celsius. And if we don't curb emissions and temperatures continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. In fact, scientists agree that if we don't do anything, temperatures could rise somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. So what can we do? Well, it starts by understanding and getting real about carbon math. Scientists account for carbon emissions by classifying them into three categories or scopes. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions that your activities create, like the exhaust from the car you drive, or for a business, the trucks it drives to transport its products from one place to another, or the diesel generators it might run. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions that come from the production of the electricity or heat you use, like the traditional energy sources that light up your home or power the buildings owned by a business. Scope three emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all the other activities in which you're engaged, including the emissions associated with producing the food you eat or manufacturing the products that you buy. For a business, these emission sources can be extensive and must be accounted for across its entire supply chain, from the materials in its buildings, the business travel of its employees, to the full life cycle of its products, including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. Given this broad range, a company's scope three emissions are often far larger than its scope one and two emissions put together. And this accounting is important because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, 
then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things. First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies, like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit, including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove, by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. At MasterCard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. At MasterCard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity 
by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy, and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day, guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. The scientific consensus is clear. The world has a huge carbon problem. Humans have released more than 2 trillion metric tons of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the first industrial revolution. And the vast majority of these emissions have occurred since the mid 1950s. This is more carbon than nature can reabsorb. And every year, humanity pumps out more than 50 billion additional tons of greenhouse gases. This blanket of carbon in our atmosphere is heating the planet and changing our climate. And this isn't a problem that lasts just a few years or even a decade. Once excess carbon enters the atmosphere, it can take thousands of years to dissipate. Already, the planet's temperature has risen by one degree Celsius. And if we don't curb emissions and temperatures continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. In fact, scientists agree that if we don't do anything, temperatures could rise somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. So what can we do? Well. It starts by understanding and getting real about carbon math. Scientists account for carbon emissions by classifying them into three categories or scopes. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions that your activities create, like the exhaust from the car you drive, or for a business, the trucks it drives to transport its products from one place to another, or the diesel generators it might run. Scope 2 emissions are indirect emissions that come from the production of the electricity or heat you use, like the traditional energy sources that light up your home or power the buildings owned by a business. Scope 3 emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all the other activities in which you're engaged, including the emissions associated with producing the food you eat or manufacturing the products that you buy. For a business, these emission sources can be extensive and must be accounted for across its entire supply chain, from the materials in its buildings, the business travel of its employees, to the full life cycle of its products, including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. Given this broad range, a company's scope three emissions are often far larger than its scope one and two emissions put together. And this accounting is important because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things.
First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies, like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit, including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove, by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted either directly or by electrical consumption since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At MasterCard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere and it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy, and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect. From our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another. To create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere. To create a world that's truly priceless. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At MasterCard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small businesses to the global digital economy by supporting 25 million women entrepreneurs through critical services, education, and access, and by ensuring people own, control, and benefit from their own data. We're working to protect the planet by committing to net zero emissions and operating on 100% renewable energy 
and by activating collective action to regrow 100 million trees through the Priceless Planet Coalition. And as always, we're working to empower people, supporting our own people, advancing equal opportunity for all, and investing $500 million in black communities to help stand against racism and advance opportunity. Because when people thrive, companies, communities, and economies thrive. Sustainability is something we live and breathe every day. Guided by decency, integrity, and respect from our board of directors to our college recruits. It's a global conversation we're right in the middle of. When I thank the entire MasterCard organization for its remarkable emphasis on inclusive growth. And it's one meaningful action after another to create prosperity, protect the planet, and empower people everywhere to create a world that's truly priceless. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD, tu ești viitorul. The scientific consensus is clear. The world has a huge carbon problem. Humans have released more than 2 trillion metric tons of greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the first industrial revolution. And the vast majority of these emissions have occurred since the mid-1950s. This is more carbon than nature can reabsorb. And every year, humanity pumps out more than 50 billion additional tons of greenhouse gases. This blanket of carbon in our atmosphere is heating the planet and changing our climate. And this isn't a problem that lasts just a few years or even a decade. Once excess carbon enters the atmosphere, it can take thousands of years to dissipate. Already, the planet's temperature has risen by one degree Celsius. And if we don't curb emissions and temperatures continue to climb, science tells us that the results will be catastrophic. In fact, scientists agree that if we don't do anything, temperatures could rise somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius. So what can we do? Well, it starts by understanding and getting real about carbon math. Scientists account for carbon emissions by classifying them into three categories or scopes. Scope one emissions are the direct emissions that your activities create, like the exhaust from the car you drive, or for a business, the trucks it drives to transport its products from one place to another, or the diesel generators it might run. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions that come from the production of the electricity or heat you use, like the traditional energy sources that light up your home or power the buildings owned by a business. Scope three emissions are the indirect emissions that come from all the other activities in which you're engaged including the emissions associated with producing the food you eat or manufacturing the products that you buy. For a business, these emission sources can be extensive and must be accounted for across its entire supply chain, from the materials in its buildings, the business travel of its employees, to the full life cycle of its products, including the electricity that customers may consume when using something like a phone, laptop, or gaming console. Given this broad range, a company's scope three emissions are often far larger than its scope one and two emissions put together. And this accounting is important because if we're going to avoid the worst aspects of a rapidly changing climate, then the world must reduce its carbon emissions and reach net zero across all scopes. Now, net zero doesn't mean that there will no longer be any carbon emissions at all, but it does mean that the world will need to remove as much carbon as it emits. This will require two things. First, we'll need to reduce carbon emissions very substantially over the next few decades. And second, we'll need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, starting with nature-based removal approaches, but ultimately through including new carbon removal technologies, like direct air capture approaches that literally remove carbon from the air. And while the world will need to reach net zero, those of us who can afford to move faster and go further should do so. 
That's why Microsoft is committing to become carbon negative by 2030, meaning that we'll reduce our emissions by half and remove from the atmosphere more carbon than we emit, including all of our scope one, two, and three emissions. It's why we're also committing to remove, by 2050, all of the carbon Microsoft has emitted, either directly or by electrical consumption, since it was founded in 1975. Simply put, the stakes are too high for us to not make bold changes now. The world is counting on all of us to act. În lumea nouă, oamenii au curajul să-și imagineze un viitor mai bun. Urmărește și tu platforma Climate Change Summit. BRD. Tu ești viitorul. At MasterCard, sustainability is core to our business. It's about us doing well by doing good. It's about powering an inclusive and sustainable digital economy that benefits everyone, everywhere. And it's focused in these three areas of impact. We're working to create prosperity by connecting 1 billion unbanked and underbanked people and 50 million small...
I'm in sync with the earth. Ten toes deep, flower child from the turf. I never switch sides, like even when I die, I'm a ride for the squad. Lot of ties in the hearse. I've been on the vibe, kinda hard to describe. I'm in between, I'm good and it's fine, but I'm tired of the grind. Then I come alive in the night to realize I'm in the middle of the time of my life. I'm never so packed for the stack, never lied on the back. Got a bag from the way that I write it. Queen looking Tyson, who that I survived doing 80 to the house. Then I hit her to the sky, change haters on a tirade. Talking to the crib and the face, be still, let that hate stuff fade. We all want the same, we all want a meal and a safe. I want to live like I'm trying to be enlightened. Trail spill from my lips, feel big from the bit. Take a sip till I pass out. Try and get grip, but it don't make sense. Cause you can lose life on this fast route. Yeah, turn thoughts to a cash cow. I might flip that to the glass house. I don't need the accolades, I'm in love with the chase. I just wanna eat, save a spot at the table. Beast with the slap, pin myself on the map. You know with the wind, but we knowing that it's cap. Five hour flights, couple nights at the flat. To be real, could you see me making moves while I'm at? I'm still on the grind, limit time when I chat. I'm burning down sage, keep the demons away. When I write it, give a piece of myself to the pain. Hello, back. I hope you had a, a good lunch, fast lunch. Fast lunch is always good, um, sort of, actually. I think we need more of a slow life than a fast life. So thank you for joining us uh, fast. Uh, I think you just saw something that uh, um, I saw it a couple of days ago. I was um, uh, absolutely fascinated by, by what uh, our team was able to, to do. We had a I think you saw the Times Square in New York, so uh, we, th we thought, you know, as climate change has no borders, we actually need to take the conversations that we host here in Romania across the world. Um, and we also, uh, with our friends from Frame Advertising, went with these holograms all around uh, Bucharest city center to show um, and to get out of the theater and the event arena. Because what we usually do, most of us in, in these uh, conversation platform world, is that we meet in very nice places like this one, but sometimes we forget that we need to go out. So this is what we did, and this is what we continue to do, and uh, I want to thank uh, Roxana and my team for making this uh, really, really spectacular. Now, um, how do we create change from the grassroots, and uh, just for the ones uh, online, uh, and I think we have now about 4,000 people watching. This is grass, this is real grass. Um, I shouldn't have ripped it, probably. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to make a, a point. And our next speaker is, is working, uh, I wouldn't say at the grassroots uh, level, um, but at the same time, uh, you know, making it happen, um, not just uh, uh, talking about it. Andreas Beckmann is CEO for CEE of uh, WWF, a passionate change maker and organization builder. He is a regional CEO uh, across 10 countries of Central and Southeastern Europe. He has extensive experience in strategy, policy, uh, marketing and environmental issues, as well as working across sectors from government to business and non-profit. Um, Andreas Beckton from WWF, one of my favorite organizations in the world. You have the floor. Thank you. Thanks. I want to talk about the elephant in the room. I want to talk about the bear in the room. I want to talk not just about the bears and the elephants, but also about the forests, the rivers, the wetlands, all of this wonderful flora and fauna that make up biological diversity that makes this wonderful world of ours a place, a living place. Um, in fact, they're not in the room. There's a bit in the room here. Uh, but I've heard very little this morning so far about biodiversity and its connection to climate change. And so that's what I want to talk about. I was going to talk about the role of, of civil society organizations like my own, about companies, about governments, about communities in addressing these massive challenges facing us. But at this point, I think it's important in this conversation that I focus especially on bio biodiversity. And in this presentation, I want to impress on you the challenge of our lifetime. More than 50 years ago, the US undertook exceptional efforts to achieve a moonshot, and what we need now is an earthshot. Exceptional efforts by all of us uh, to secure our, our future. So in the next 15 minutes, 
I'm going to talk about biodiversity, especially in that context. The challenge facing us is, I think, most starkly captured in, in the increasing images of, of hellfire and brimstone that we've been experiencing in recent years. Um, the, the fires in, in Australia, 2020, but also since then in, in Greece, in Turkey, in California, but also in Siberia, the Pantanal, the Amazon, for God's sake. And the challenge is no longer limited to these far-off places. It's also very close to us here at home. This last summer, we had exceptional drought. Uh, the, the river, uh, the levels of the, the Danube were so low that for a month and a half, there was no navigation on the Danube. The Danube, the largest river um, in, in this area. This picture here, that recent catastrophic flooding in Pakistan, which covered a third of the country, a, this massive country, also reminds us that the problem is not just one of not enough water, but also too much water. We talk about global warming, but more accurately, we, we should talk about climate change, because it's not just the increase in average temperatures, but then what that drives, these extremes of too much water, too little, flooding, drought, um, aridity, um, tornadoes, hurricanes, and so on and so forth. These are all increasingly loud alarm bells that are signaling to us that the world as we know it is in serious trouble. These phenomena are no surprise. We've been predicting them for, for years. Um, and in, in fact, if anything, the phenomena, the, the reality, the phenomena um, are more extreme than the predictions. The most recent IPCC report that came out in February tells us very clearly that the window of, of, of opportunity for us to avoid the most catastrophic consequences um, of climate change is closing. And the next decade will be decisive in determining the future of our civilization. People ref um, Sorry. There we go. This uh, situation is also having increasingly real economic, um, tangible consequences. Swiss Re, which is the uh, insurance company for insurance companies, uh, they obviously have a, a business interest in having accurate predictions, forecasts um, of losses. Um, their, their forecasts and also their reporting is showing increasing losses. These are insured losses that you see here, and of course the uninsured losses are even bigger. They're going in the same direction, not surprisingly. Climate change is having real impacts on health, our economies, our welfare and well-being. According to the um, Swiss Re report as well, um, we can expect a drop in the value of the global economy, of GDP, of about 18% if we don't take action. A fifth of the global economy wiped out by climate change. Um, impacts on harvests, harvest infrastructure, health, the costs are adding up also for us here in, in our region. For individuals, as communities, for us as companies and organizations, countries and the global community. But the problem is not just climate change, it's also nature loss. These are two overarching civilizational challenges that are in fact interrelated and interdependent. We cannot solve the climate crisis without addressing nature loss and vice versa. Climate change is a major driver of nature loss and the degradation of biological diversity. And in turn, the loss of nature, for example, forests with their ability to soak up and absorb carbon is an important driver for climate change. Indeed, due to deforestation, parts of the Amazon are now net emitters of carbon rather than carbon sinks. We often forget that the, 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 the values, uh, the, the goods, the services that nature provides us. If we count up these goods and services from, from clean water uh, to, to carbon sequestration, uh, climate regulation, uh, pollination, water and, uh, and forest and so on, we come up to something like $125 trillion per year in, in services that we provide and that we usually take for granted. Indeed, the biosphere, this biodiversity, the sphere, is the foundation for all sustainable development goals. Our society and our economy depends on the biosphere. And to put it simply, you cannot do business, let alone flourish, on a dead planet. 
The latest Living Planet report, which WF puts out every two, two years, it's coming out next week, the, next, the latest one, but the one from 2020, and um, I can tell you the next one is not going to say anything more positive, but the last one from 2020 tells us that we've lost 68% of wildlife populations over the last 50 years. Two-thirds of wildlife populations wiped out in my own lifetime. Failure to tackle nat nature's decline will increase nature-related risks, including by disrupting supply chains, threatening global food security, costing the global, global economy at least $479 billion a year. That amounts to $10 trillion or so by 2050. Big money. Indeed, those environmental risks, that, that message, that realization is sinking in. Environmental risks, including climate action, ac climate action failure, extreme weather and biodiversity loss, have held the top spots in perceptions of global risks for the past several years. In 2020, all top five perceived global risks were environmental. Of course, more recently, we've had some additions, uh, social cohesion erosion, livelihoods, uh, infectious diseases. Should point out that those are also connected to nature loss. Science tells us very clearly that now is the time to act and that our actions in the next years will truly determine the future of our civilization. We need to stop and to mitigate climate change. We need to limit greenhouse gas emissions to avoid the most catastrophic effects of climate change. But that's not enough. We need to find a way of, again, living in harmony with nature. WF's global goals are our theory of change, you could say. Um, sees us working for the benefit of people by conserving, protecting, regenerating and restoring habitats and species, uh, including forests, freshwater, oceans, but also wildlife. We do this by reducing the footprint of production and consumption, especially focused on food and also climate change. And then also important for this by, by creating system level change in finance, governance and also markets, as we heard uh, today, this morning. We need to work with nature rather than against it, most fundamentally. Rivers and, and wetlands provide us with a myriad of goods and services, from fish and fowl to carbon sequestration, water management, water purification, not to mention biodiversity and recreation. Wetlands function as gigantic sponges. They soak up water in times of flooding, and then they slowly release it in times of drought. But unfortunately, over 80% of the Danube floodplains have been lost over the last century, century and a half. And with them, many of the, the essential goods and services, fish stocks, for example, have plummeted in this time. Over the past uh, decades, my organization has been involved in protecting the most valuable remaining areas of wetlands in this Danube basin, but also restoring some of the areas um, that have been lost. We have about 30 to 40 wetland restoration projects um, that we've undertaken. Now, under the, under the impact of climate change, with greater extremes of flooding and droughts, there are increasing calls for old-fashioned infrastructure, uh, for, for higher dikes and irrigation schemes to deal with these problems. This is grossly short-sighted. It will only lead to greater problems problems of flooding downstream, but also faster dropping water tables as well. As we address climate change, we need to work with nature rather than against it. We look at forests, they provide us with much more than wood. They, in they inhale carbon dioxide, that spurs, that spurs global warming, and they exhale the oxygen that we need. They, don't, they not only sequester carbon and regulate local climate, but also work to prevent erosion, they help manage water, and of course, also support biodiversity and recreation. We need healthy forests, not only to help mitigate climate change, but also to create the resilience to adapt to the climate change that's already happening. At WF, we're working to protect the most valuable forests, um, for example, old growth forests, virgin forests, and to secure the sustainable management of other ones. Let me also mention wildlife. We also need to safeguard and to restore ecological, ecological connectivity. We build 
our transportation infrastructure without a thought of how it might impact the movement of other species other than our own. Roads cut off the movement of animals, they fragment habitats, and that then fragments populations. And with this, we lose not only wildlife populations and species, but also the resilience of our ecosystems in the face of climate change. We at WWF have been working with governments, spatial and transport, transportation planners, including some NGOs that are here, to identify key ecological corridors and to ensure that negative impacts from infrastructure are limited through the better planning or also through special measures like the green bridge that you see uh, in Slovakia in this picture. At international level, there's an increasing recognition of the twin challenges of climate change and nature loss and how these are interrelated. At European level, the EU has taken bold, uh, a leadership role uh, and made bold, bold commitments with regard to climate change, but also with biodiversity. The EU biodiversity strategy that is part of the Green Deal um, calls for ambitious targets of, of um, creating 25,000 free-flowing, 25,000 kilometers of free-flowing rivers, holding up, holding on to um, valuable forests. Um, that biodiversity is as important to that bigger target of uh, addressing climate change. Just a few more words um, in terms of, of, of climate policy, uh, especially from a Romanian uh, perspective or regional perspective. As we go forward, we do need to set targets for decarbonization. The uh, projections that you see here are for Romania, and as you can see, it's not going towards net zero. So in the next, um, uh, the, the planning that is coming, f uh, that is coming uh, uh, towards us uh, very soon, we need to have set targets for uh, reducing carbon in different uh, sectors. We also, as we heard this morning, we need to save energy. There's huge potential for that, especially in this region, uh, for example, on heating um, and uh, inefficient um, homes. But also in terms of renewables, we need to push those. Um, the drops in prices, the drops in costs has been absolutely remarkable, opening completely new possibilities for developing re renewables. But as we develop those renewables, again, we have to take into account nature and make sure that we don't lose more than we gain in terms of sustainable energy. Um, for example, for hydropower, uh, clean energy, renewable energy, theoretically, but it also has a massive impact on the river systems. Um, and not just on the river systems in terms of, of, of the the water and the fish, but also sediment flows and the hydrology of areas. So lots of knock-on effects that come from some of these that need to be taken into account. So we've been involved working with governments and other, uh, with other interest groups to try to find the right balance. There are now guidelines for development of hydropower in the Danube Basin that have been signed up to by all of the governments, all of the Danube governments, including Romania. These need to be implemented. Finally, just let me add that in terms of opportunities, going a little bit back to what I was going to talk about, uh, the steep drop in cost related to renewable energy um, underlines the immense opportunities offered by technology and innovation. We now have unprecedented uh, information and power in our pockets that allows us to map old growth forests, track illegal logging, to optimize production and consumption, including sharing resources from homes to cars. This is incredible. Amidst the huge challenges, this has unleashed huge possibilities. Businesses are a big part of the problem, and they must be a big part of the solution. They need to take action to mitigate risk, including regulatory, reputational, supply chain risks, but they can also seize opportunities, opportunities to innovate and to deliver solutions. We have a multiplicity of challenges with climate change, but also nature loss, and each of those those, those challenges are problems that need to be solved. And each of those problems demands a solution. Each of those solutions is potentially a business case. So there is a huge amount of opportunity in the, the challenges that are facing us, also from a business perspective. A lot of businesses are beginning to step up. Um, if we take over 3,000 companies with a market capitalization of $23 trillion, greater than the GDP of the United States, have now adopted science-based targets for reducing their carbon emissions in line with the, climate, uh, the climate, uh, Paris Climate Agreement. And a handful are now pioneering a similar approach uh, for nature as well. Let me just finish by saying, or quoting Sir David Attenborough. He says, 
What we do in the next 10 years will profoundly, will profoundly impact the next few thousand years. Nature once determined how to survive, how we survive, sorry. Now we determine how nature survives. That's true, but I forgot the last part. Nature once determined how we survive, now we determine how nature survives, which in turn determines whether we survive. That's what we need to take into account. So the future really depends on us, in companies, in organizations, in communities, in governments, as, as members of a global community, as consumers, as citizens, as activists or active people, as volunteers. We can all and need to contribute to addressing this uh, civilizational challenge. Let me come back to this, to this uh, image of a beautiful but very fragile planet on which we all depend for our welfare and our well-being. We're facing a truly civilizational challenge, an exceptional challenge facing all of us. And this exceptional challenge is also an exceptional opportunity. So please join us in seizing this. We need an Earth shot, not just a moon shot. And I think it is possible. Thank you. I told you, uh, he represents one of the organizations that I hold uh, dearest. I'm not looking for a job um, anymore, I think. Um, we do have some questions. I want to have my own first. Um, you mentioned nature-based solutions at one point in your speech. Um, can you give us a, a, a bit of an overview of some of the things that you've seen happening in Central and Eastern Europe? or one or two study cases, if you like, of how uh, instead of, and I'm going to trivialize, I'm sorry about that, but instead of cutting down trees, uh, uh, doing something else to increase um, welfare of citizens, but also to protect yep. uh, the world. So. Uh, maybe switch over to the wetlands, um, which I mentioned uh, briefly. Uh, and I mentioned the, the benefits of wetlands. Um, you know, if you don't have those, you need to then, in many cases, to deal with floodwaters, you need to have grey infrastructure. Um, wetlands can do that for you, often very cheaply, um, and provide a lot of other benefits in, it, in addition to that. Um, that. That message is sinking in, so there's a lot of support from, from Danube governments, um, uh, actually, for that. Uh, there's still a big challenge of actually making it happen. You still need somebody on the ground that is aligning all of the interests and then making it possible to, to open the dikes and reconnect the river to the floodplains and so on. You know, so that's a big challenge. But at the same time, uh, there is a lot of uh, support for that increasingly because of this recognition of the effect of the cost effectiveness and the extra benefits from wetland restoration. You could say the same thing, of course, for forests as well. Yeah. Um, there's another question about politics. <laughs> Do you think the current political system is up to the task? Probably not. Um, political mandates are four to five years, maybe shorter. Um, how can we hold them accountable for inaction? Uh, how much wine do you have? <laughs> Tonight? It's a philosophical <laughs> question going on for a long time. Uh, the kind of discussion I have with my 23-year-old my daughter. Um, I, I think we have to... We at WF accept the political system that we have and we need to work within it. Um, and uh, there, uh, so was, I was going to talk about, there is an important role for civil society organizations, there's an important role, of course, for government, for providing the structures, the framework for action, and then also very much for the private, uh, for the private sector as well, for delivering solutions, innovations. Again, like I said, a big part of the problem, but also, undoubtedly, we can't tackle these problems without the private sector. Yeah, we have a Polish question. Okay. Question from Poland. Um, it's mainly about cold. Um, so, um, summarizing it, um, Poland uh, and some other parts of CE are, to some extent, uh, dependent or uh, using a lot of coal. Um, what are the solutions that we can get on that, uh, from your perspective, as an, organi as an organization that wants to protect the biodiversity, and extracting coal is not really um, the best way of doing that? Um, so I'm not quite sure what to say. I mean, coal obviously needs to be phased out. Uh, we are working with other organizations, um, governments as well, to make sure that that's done in a, in a just way, a just transition, as I said, uh, because there certainly will be losers within this. Um, have active projects on that in, in uh, Bulgaria, for example. Um, 
will need transitions. Yeah. I'm not sure if I under quite understand the, the question. It's a very long question. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to read it, actually. Um, there's another one that, that actually, this is a, a question to most of the speakers that represent or work for NGOs. Um, what sort of a pitch would you make to a company or to the bank, not for a sponsorship, but for a partnership? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, you know, let's say, it's not one minute, you can have two. Yeah, that, that would be more, more than yeah, that. Um, no, I bet, so I, I, I'm working a lot with, uh, with a lot of uh, private sector partners, um, and I'm chairing the, the Global Partnerships Committee of WF, so overseeing the private sector engagement that we're doing. And what I'm seeing is a shift from what used to be a kind of philanthropy, CSR, you know, you give some money and do, we do something good for it, to a completely different approach. And I think that what's driving that, you know, focused on substance, and what's driving that is the realization among companies of how they are dependent on these ecosystem goods and services, uh, how they are threatened by climate change. Um, and, you know, if you are a beverage company, you need water. Uh, if you're a furniture company, uh, even if you're uh, any company, in fact, needs water. So one of the things that we've been doing is helping companies to understand that risk that they have. So we have a water risk filter, for example, that shows that can help companies understand the risk that they face from the lack of water, both now but also projected into the future. And then we can talk about, you know, what can we do under the circumstances. And what's interesting for us is working with those companies, not just in terms of their specific problems, but also taking it up to a higher level so that they also help to address the systemic issues that are facing it. Because, let's face it, if you're an individual company taking action, that won't solve the problems. We need to have systemic action. And that's where it gets really interesting, where we can then have alliances together with the private sector, which makes us much, much more powerful than just these, these crazy CSOs, NGOs, environmental groups going off and wanting to save the world. That, that cross-sectoral partnership really makes a difference. Yeah, and one question that I told you at the beginning that I, I might have, and we have like one or two minutes left. Um, there's organizations that are seen as activists and organizations that are seen as, as, as doing things in this field, right? Mm -hmm. Planting trees is the simplest of the things that I can mention, but there's a million other things. Um, and sometimes the activist organizations are seen, are, are more visible. Um, how do you think we can, we can increase uh, the power of organizations doing things, uh, you know, uh, on the grassroots uh, properly? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a natural tension. It's a tension uh, between organizations. My own organization is often attacked by more fundamentalist organiza organizations, you know, that we shouldn't work with the private sector, that we shouldn't do certain things that were too, too uh, uh, cooperational, let's say. Uh, I think both are needed. Um, I think we need organizations, I think we need individuals, not just among um, civil society organizations, but everywhere, you know, that will push the envelope and that will raise issues. But we also need others that can actually offer solutions and do the really hard work, uh, the often not dramatic, not very marketing friendly work of, of, of developing those solutions. And I feel more comfortable in the latter, uh, but we also have that tension within our own organization as well. Yeah. And uh, a difficult question at the end, maybe take a minute or two, not to think, but to answer. Uh, what would you say are the main risks when you talk about biodiversity for Central and Eastern Europe in the next uh, three to five years? The main risks, not taking action. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously it's the same as with climate change, right? Uh, it's it's uh, commitment in the end. Um, it's it's all of us at different levels in government, in private sector, in civil society organisations, scientists, whatever. Not seeing this as code red. This is serious. You know, we need to act, um, and we need to do that now. Lovely. Thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you. Can I have the? There's a, there's a dear friend in the audience or downstairs in. Her name is uh, Corina Morafa. You're going to see her, I uh, think, tomorrow. Um, there she is. The pink uh, hair. Um, and uh, what Corina put today, um, and she said, maybe it's, uh, we should call this Climate Action Summit. Um, so I think um, uh, what, what Andreas mentioned about uh, action is also what we want to do. Um, but in the same time, action requires change. So I think we also need to change. Um, now, uh, speaking of change, uh, 
I'm going to change the, the topic, but actually uh, it's very uh, similar to some extent. I'm very uh, happy and honored to, to welcome uh, uh, Mark Campanale. <coughs> Excuse me. Mark is founder of Carbon Tracker uh, Initiative, a non-profit think tank with offices in the US and UK. Uh, he has a long uh, career in sustainable finance for about 20 years. Uh, Carbon Tracker, for those of you that uh, don't know, is best known for its uh, work on, on, uh, on stranded assets and the carbon, carbon bubble, providing transition analysis for the members of the Climate Action, speaking of action, 100. So, uh, Mark, you have the floor. Thank you very much for that kind of introduction. So we're living in a, a remarkable decade. We've heard already in this conference that on one side, the warning signals are burning red. We've got extreme weather events, uh, temperatures going through the charts. But on the other side, we know that this is a decade of opportunity. We read just this week from the International Energy Agency, there are more jobs now in the clean energy system than there are in the fossil fuel system. We're going through a wonderful transformation. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to run through how I see the world. And so how do I see the world? I see the world through a financial lens. My background is in fund management and corporate finance. I'm always looking for an opportunity. In the past, I've worked with investors and pension funds. Um, so what does the picture look like? So um, just a reminder, we've got the highest concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for over 400,000 years. All the Critical emissions from burning coal, from gas, from oil, have all occurred in the last 50 years. That's what you're looking at on this chart. That's what the red and the green and the gray tell you. And it keeps going up. And there's a limit. We heard earlier from my colleague from SOCGEN, there is a carbon budget. How much of the CO2 can we put in the atmosphere before we should be really concerned? And here's some of the numbers. We're currently emitting, if you look at the top right, around 40 to 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide from industry from burning petrol in our cars, from coal in our coal-fired power stations. And oh, it comes back. And we have a budget. The atmosphere can only take so much more. If you want to keep to one and a half degrees, if you look at the white circle with a 66% chance, according to uh, the best analysis, we don't want to emit more than three to 400 gigatons of CO2. And that's at the extreme. But if we look at the proven reserves of coal, oil, and gas, We've got three times that amount. 90% of the world's fossil fuels will have to remain in the ground. How much budget do we have less before two degrees? Remember, we've not seen those levels of heating for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. London, which is where I'm from, uh, used to be a steamy swamp, which is why when we dig underneath London, if those of you visited London, think of this next time you're there, you can find alligators and crocodiles. London was a steamy swamp, and that was normal. And so we have about seven to ten years left of current emissions before we create the conditions associated with those kinds of warming. So as I heard earlier, this critical decade, we're going to have to lose about half of those emissions over the next ten years. That's a steep curve down. Now, as I said, I wanted you to think, you're running a pension fund. In your pension fund, you've got lots of oil and gas, you've got lots of power utilities, you've got car manufacturers, you've got cement, steel and aviation. In fact, about 25% of the value of your equities is linked to the fossil fuel system. About half of your corporate bonds, non-bank corporate bonds, is linked to the fossil fuel system. And we've got about $10 trillion of energy supply infrastructure and $22 trillion of demand infrastructure. We're going to lose about half of that over the next decade. If you're a banker, if you're an accountant, you're going to start looking over your spreadsheets and working out, can the companies we own pivot? So here's a question. If CO2 wasn't a problematic molecule, would there be all this fuss? Would we still transition? And the answer to that question is clearly yes. And it's simply because we're going through a remarkable technological transformation. It's not the first time I've said this, and others have said it before. We're the first generation in human history since the Neanderthals can do all these things without burning anything. We can heat our homes, we can cook, we can move from A to B, and we can power our systems without burning anything. We're moving from a system of molecules to electrons. Everything that requires us to heat our homes, we can do through electrification. 
And the driver of this is technology. Cheap, reliable, mass-produced, clean technologies. What you're looking at here is the very high costs of wind and solar that we talked about over the last 10 years ago will never get cheap. And what we've seen in any technological revolution, if those of you that for the first time when you try to buy yourselves a color TV, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, how expensive they were, technology costs drove them down. The same with a laptop, the same with your iPhone, exactly the same thing is happening with clean technologies. They're all reducing in price to the point where they're more competitive than traditional fossil fuels, with the exception of nuclear, which is in there. It's not a technology that the more you build, it gets cheaper. It's a technology the more you build, somehow, for some reason, it continues to be expensive. So the future really is going to be a future of electrons. And we see this in prices. We see this in markets. In the United Kingdom, when I wrote this back in April, this particular slide, gas was six, four times more expensive. Today, it's six to nine times more expensive than traditional, than, re than renewable energies. And yet somehow, you'll have people tell us that the answer to the climate crisis is that we need to build gas. The answer to the climate crisis is to build the cheapest, most reliable system. And today, that is solar and wind plus battery storage. And what you're looking at here is the cost downs of renewable energy technology. But have we got that message through to policymakers? Have we got that message through to the banks? Carbon Tracker, which is the nonprofit I set up, there's about 50 of us in the Tracker team, and a lot of people like me have our backgrounds in finance, and of course we're used to looking at the numbers, you're used to looking at the numbers. We went and gave a presentation to, into our UK Parliament, to our Energy Committee, and halfway through the committee, we start getting these questions, and suddenly it dawned on us that the politicians thought that fossil fuels were cheaper. We had to remind them that hadn't been true for years. Actually, it's the renewables that are subsidizing the fossil fuels. We've got to get that message across. Now, this technological trans transformation is universal. It isn't happening in isolated countries. These technologies are getting cheaper all around the world, including in Eastern Europe. So, as we compare manufactured energy to the energy we dig out of the ground, just think about it for one second. And tell me this is sane. We dig up and burn, or we dig up and drag out fossil fuels from one side of the world, like the tar sands in Canada. We boil them up, put them in a pipeline, transform them to a refinery. We then put them from a refinery into a tanker, take them across the other side of the world. We put it in a power station or in a car where we burn it and then worry about taking out the CO2. It's complete madness. It's expensive. All the cheap fossil fuels have been found, by and large, which is why we're going on to expensive areas. We're told somehow this is rational, when we can make it where we need it. That may mean moving manufacturing to parts of the world where we can find cheaper and reliable renewable energy. And then, once we've done that, we give 80, 90 percent of, of our needs and production needs to a small handful of countries. We give it to countries that are run by you know, oligarchs and corrupt countries, whether it's the Saudis or the Venezuelans or Russia, or dare I say, even the USA. And somehow this is a system which we think is rational. The rational system is where energy is distributed and, and run. So you can compare it. I've just put some notes up here. You probably won't be able to see it unless you're online. On one side, fossil fuels, it's finite. Most of it, all the good stuff we found, Renewable energies, the wind, the sun, the sea, it's infinite. It's scalable, up or down renew renewable energy. And there's what are called um, learning outcomes or predictable outcomes. Fossil fuels, we've used the same internal combustion engine and technologies. It's pretty much the same over the last 200 years. It hasn't evolved. We still put fuel in to a, a com combustion engine and out comes our energy, whereas we get great innovation in renewable energy, all these new technologies. We don't know which one's going to win with hydrogen and other technologies. There is no one single battery technology, but we're investing the tens of, of uh, billions in to find the, the best technology. Fossil fuels, most of it is wasted. It's the basic laws of, of physics, whereas renewable energy is obviously much more um, efficient. 
And there's a stock and flow model. Now, what do I mean by a stock and flow model? I just want to think of you about this. I think probably quite a few of you at home have, com have printers and computers, well, many of you, and if you have a computer, a printer, you'd be always asked yourself, why is the printer so cheap, but the printer ink is so expensive? Well, it's all in the design. You're not buying a printer, you're buying printer ink. You're buying a model that says you need new printer ink. That's how they make all their money. Whereas the fossil fuel system is the same. We build a system, a gas-fired power station, what they're really selling you is contracts to buy gas, or coal, or a car if it's petrol. In the new system that we're building today, all of that goes. It's a bit like having a printer that gives you free ink for the rest of its life. It's the same with solar and wind. You don't need a flow model. You don't need to transport fuels around the world. It's all there for you once you've built your system. And as it's built, and you've paid off the cost, it's essentially free. So one of the things that's going to happen is that energy is going to get cheaper, as well as it gets more reliable. And the energy system is going to halve in size. You're not going to need tankers and gas pipelines and trucks carrying coal. All of that goes in the new clean energy system that we're building around the world. So what would we invest in? I'm just going to give you some of the statistics. I said I, I like numbers, I like the world of finance. Most of the energy boom built today is clean energy, whether it's from solar or wind, and only the smallest amount today is being built using fossil fuels. The other thing that we know, and I heard today the phrase uh, rights law, and also Moore's law, is that the more you build, the cheaper it gets. And the cheaper it gets, the price, and then prices fall, it becomes more competitive, demand rises, deployment rises. It's very simple. On the left there, there's not a single technology that we're aware of from the mobile phone, from refrigerators, from dishwashers, that's gone through exactly the same phenomenon, a period of growth and then exponential growth in an S-curve and then rapid adoption where everyone has a computer, a mobile phone, an iPhone, pretty much. Certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, exactly the same phenomenon in the Southern Hemisphere. All of this is driven by falling costs for batteries. As I said, there's plenty of different technologies, whether it's lithium or alternative, metals it's going to use, and as the cost of gold falls, battery, um, battery demand and EVs rise. So what are you looking at here is global annual vehicle sales, which are electric. electric. Within, I think it's now, today, 50% growth year on year in electric vehicle sales. Electric vehicles, if you can get hold of one, because you're probably going to have to queue to get hold of one, certainly um, in the rest of Europe, the rest we know that EV demand is going through the roof. Based on current projected growth, all new car sales within the next five to ten years will, in our view, be electric vehicles or some hybrid system displacing. But the real question, if you care about climate, is how soon will demand for electric vehicles destroy demand and use of oil and gas? That's the real question. And what you're looking at there on the left is electric vehicle sales in purple in Norway. Most, if not all, car sales in Norway today are using uh, from electric. And there, in the dotted line, you've got the falling demand for oil. And on the right, just this is data from Bloomberg Neo Energy Finance in the last seven or eight years. This shows you the falling demand for oil. Now, just to put this into context, during the COVID crisis, there was a 5% fall in demand for oil, and we saw negative prices. That's what investors are concerned about when sectors such as oil and gas, when demand falls, prices fall. As prices fall and your costs are high, that's how profits are eliminated. And what you're looking at here is that exactly that chart I wanted to, to focus on, which is the rising use of electric vehicles as falling demand for, for oil. So um, why is this important? Um, if you're a car manufacturer, are you concerned that 97% of the cars on the road are internal combustion engine cars? No, you're not concerned about that. What you're really concerned about is what's on the chart on the right, which is who's taking all the new car sales. And obviously, in the global market today, it's companies like Tesla, which have been taking all the new car sales. On the, on the bottom right there, you can see Volkswagen. If you're the chief executive of Volkswagen, you're not, you don't care what's being driven on the road. That's all gone. What you really care about is what people are buying today. What's foremost in the mind of executives running companies like Volkswagen is why aren't people buying the old internal combustion engine car? 
And if you've got a diesel car, that's a stranded asset. What's the resale value of a diesel, diesel car at a time when people want to move to cheap electrics? And it's much, much cheaper to run an electric vehicle than it is to run an internal combustion. Thousands of parts in an internal combustion engine car, a lot less in an electric car. So much easier to maintain as well. But I don't want, I want, obviously I'm optimistic. I think this is irreversible, but this is the scale of the challenge to avoid the crisis. We're going to have to scale up these sales by a multiple of eight to ten fold for wind and solar. And with solar growing at 20% per annum, we've got around two terawatt hours of wind and solar growing at 20% per annum. Within 2030, that's going to be eight terawatt hours. And that's going to be roughly the same capacity as all the coal and all the, all the gas that's been built in the last hundred years. That just shows how fast this technology is growing. So what are the, as I come to my closing remarks, uh, investors, well, you make money from new technologies and companies and opportunity. You're always looking for what's growing. You always want to get rid of the companies where no one's buying the product. But then when you've got big companies like Exxon and Chevron in your portfolio, what are you going to do? These are the companies obviously making money today. And let's have a look at what they're planning to do. Well, these are the forecasts used by all the major oil and gas companies. They're forecasting more oil and gas use over the next 25 years. And this is why they're justifying their plans to invest even more of shareholder funds in growing it. And yet we know it has to drop by 3%. And that's where we get what we call stranded assets, which is where companies determined to stick to an old technology like gas-fired power or coal-fired power or the internal combustion engine think the market is going to remain the same. But markets do not stay still. They're driven by the laws of economics. Cheap, efficient reliability will always destroy incumbency. An international energy agency said under a 1.5 Celsius net zero scenario, no new investments is needed anywhere in any new coal, oil or gas. And that was last year. And we're going to see an absolute collapse in fossil fuel demand, leading to lower prices and lower profitability over the next decade, two decades. And even that famous left-wing journal Sorry, that's British humour for you. The Wall Street Journal has said trillions of assets will be left stranded as companies address climate change. At the end of 2019, General Motors announced a billion investment to produce a new generation of pickup trucks in its factory. These were EVs. And there will be write-downs of power plants, auto factories and fossil fuel reserves could cause losses, big losses, in the transition to renewable energy. So, to summarise... I'm convinced in this decade that we have everything, everything that we need. The technology are improving, we have created new manufacturing hubs, we've created competent workforces and who can take up the challenge of moving to elect electrification. People are realising that relying on one or two nations for your gas or for your coal or for your petroleum is a disaster. It's a political disaster and for people in society. And, and yet, when we have the incumbency, the oil and gas and the fossil fuels wanting to remain the same, I'm reminded of this old uh, story or slide. Of course we've had a fossil fuel system that we created well for the last 100, 150 years. So we have this undisciplined pursuit of more. And then we've got that denial. We're reading today of all the denial of the oil and gas companies about climate change. And you've got that denial and risk and peril just as people like Elon Musk, not too popular guy today if you've been reading the papers, um, making millions and billions from this transition and the incumbents grasping for salvation to eventually capitulation and to irrelevance. Investors, these companies like Exxon and Chevron and Shell and BP, what will they look like in 5, 10, 15 years' time? We've seen this playbook before. Just before Peabody Energy went bust, it said the, the future for coal was rosy. Kodak famously sold its digital film division, saying it will never take off and doubled down on traditional films just as it went bust. Blockbuster, the video store, if you remember that. Why didn't they become the Netflix, 
Something was stopping Blockbuster from becoming Netflix. They went bust. And Baldwin Locomotives. When asked to explain why this was a listed company on the New York Stock Exchange in the 1930s, why they were investing millions of shareholder funds in more efficient steam turbines, the chief executive said, mark my words, the steam engine will be the dominant form of transportation well into the 1980s, just before they went bust. Is history going to repeat itself? Thank you very much. Well, um, I liked the last slide, and I was, I was, I liked the last slide, and I was actually thinking of, uh, to ask you something completely different about uh, the Netflix and other types of companies that now have taken over the role of those companies. So um, I'm not going to go into that, but that's a different uh, question. We have a lot of questions for you and not a lot, a lot of time. Um, there's one that we got, and it's about China, to a large extent. Yeah. Um, and we've had this discussion in, in, uh, on this stage today, which is about dependency. Um, European dependency, uh, American dependency, but in particular European dependency on rare um, metals, minerals, and other types of supplies. So what's your take on that? And can we get off uh, or out of it, or should we? Yeah, well, first of all, rare um, metals, unlike the, the phrase, are not actually that rare. Um, they are located in different parts of the world, um, but there's plenty of availability. So we've looked at this, actually, and so is the International Energy Agency. There is plentiful supplies of those metals. The key thing, of course, is that once you've built your electric car and your electric battery, these are recyclable. Fossil fuels, you, you burn it. You've used it once. And we heard this morning from that excellent speech um, that in a year we typically burn what it took the planet a million, two million years to make. But of course, um, once you've got an electric vehicle going, those metals are infinitely recyclable and can be reused. The same with the batteries, actually. So there are, you know, there's going to be bumps along the way, but I'm not concerned that there's going to be a sudden shortage of metals. The geopolitics. Yeah, we need to get other countries, um, other regions, dialing up their production of these key metals. That's absolutely key. Yeah, uh, there's a question, there's two questions on hydrogen. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and they're you know, equally uh, important. The first one is about, do you see a hydrogen economy in Europe? And the second one is, um, is the hydrogen economy in Europe what we actually need? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So yes, I do see a role for hydrogen uh, in industry but for green hydrogen. Um, and it's going to be made from very, very cheap renewables. So in the UK, we've got about 80, um, I'm just trying to get the remember, it's gigawatts of wind in development that will be exporting electricity into Europe. We've got, we've got almost as much, if not more, than the Chinese are currently planning on building. And that's going to produce at night time lots of cheap, plentiful, reliable hydrogen. Now, if that can be true, if that's true, it can be used in industry, it can be used as a power source, it can be used in other, other um, inputs in industry as well. Um, I do see it. But then, um, do I see hydrogen, huge amounts of hydrogen being put into power stations, which some people are describing? Uh, not necessarily. I, I, I do see um, other uses for it. But... Uh, it's, it's, with Carbon Tracker, if you follow Carbon Tracker's research, we're going to be publishing on hydrogen, hopefully in the next month or two, and we're going to publish our views on it. Yeah. We have a question about mothers. I didn't want to read this, but I was thinking about my mother as well. Uh, and uh, fathers, etc. Uh, and let me quote this. You said that energy is uh, going to get cheaper. Tell that to my mum. Yeah, so well, I think this refers if quite a lot if to... Your, if your mother's got... Um, has been lucky enough to be able to put solar on the roof, not everyone can do that, then they're going to have a cheaper, reliable source of, of energy. And if they've got an old battery system that they've, they've got, or a new battery system, it's going to be cheaper. The problem we've got right now in Europe, and certainly in the UK, is the marginal supplier of energy sets the price of everyone. So we've got this weird system where Gas is around 330 pounds a megawatt hour in the United Kingdom, whereas renewables is 45 pounds a megawatt hour. Some are coming in at 37 pounds a megawatt hour. So clearly, gas is up to eight, nine times more expensive than renewables. But unfortunately, under the system we've got in Europe and other parts of Europe and in the UK, it's the price of gas that sets the energy price. 
So what we've got to do, and, and, and in the European Commission is the middle of designing or thinking through a new system, and the same in the UK, is we've got to separate out the, the different prices of energy from fossil fuels and renewables. So on your bill, you should be able to see this is how much the fossil fuels cost and this is how much the renewables cost. And you'll see very, very clearly in that system, renewables is the cheapest form of energy. And that they, we should split away the price of gas from the price of electricity. Unfortunately, the two are connected together. And that is critical. Otherwise, people won't see the good news. And there is lots of good news for people to see. Yeah, there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, um, and, and you know, banks and so on. Um, what is one or two opportunities that you see from your uh, world that we should focus on as entrepreneurs? You know, I should open a business in, or I should uh, change my business model to. Um, well, so retrofits and energy efficiency is a bit of a no-brainer. You can actually go in and change the energy system in a factory and take half of the savings. And I've got friends doing that, and they've got a very, very good business. The area that I know best and is uh, the area of investment management. So my friends who've set up fund management companies investing in renewables, um, one who set up 25 years ago has got a very successful fund management company called Impacts. He started off, he, he grew to 500 million. My fund, my colleagues' funds, we had 2 billion. We thought we had him hands down. Today, he's got 40 billion under management. And his share price has gone from 7p to 5 pounds. So I wish I was in his business. Yeah. Uh, and one final question, uh, maybe a bit more political. Um, how do you see the UK and the EU working together in the future when it comes to energy and energy, co energy from consumption, supply, demand, but also working together? Uh, to answer that question, uh, all you need to know is I proudly took up my Italian citizenship last year and I now carry an Italian passport. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure if that's a good question these days. Um, but we can talk about Italy's role in the EU. Uh, no, let's not do. No. My point being is I think the UK has made a huge error. And, uh, and a lot of people who were promised something realised they were sold a pack of lies, essentially. And it's, it's coming through politically and economically. And uh, it's not a great moment. And from my point of view, as a European, it's not a great moment in Britain's history. Well, I think but I still love the country. Uh, it's warts and all, and you're, you're in it for everything. God save the king, I heard. Well, um, that was Mark. Uh, it was great to have you with us. Uh, Delighted to be and, and here. Talk. Thank you for uh, He's going to join us again uh, tomorrow from 11, if I'm not mistaken, in a panel on renewables um, and uh, what do we do with renewables in the end. Thank so you much. Thank you so much. It. Thank, thank you. you. Now, we've been talking a lot about sustainability, and uh, I'm very happy to introduce to you um, <coughs> excuse me, our next speaker um, is representing uh, MasterCard, our sustainability partner, and we're very proud to have them uh, with us and very thankful. Um, she is a Global Head of Sustainability Innovation Lab, a VP Strategic Growth at MasterCard, uh, Malin Berge, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it uh, correctly, uh, is a global executive focusing on enabling solutions, partnerships and system change to accelerate the sustainability transition, uh, leading MasterCard's Global Innovation Agenda for Sustainability. She is responsible for the company's uh, initiative in sustainability at the global level. She's also a member of the Innovation Senior Management team. I already have two questions for you, by the way, on innovation. Um, and head of the Sustainability Innovation Lab in Stockholm uh, in Sweden. Uh, she has uh, 15 years in, in retail and technology and sits on the board of the Swedish Postcode Association, uh, which runs the People's uh, Postcode Lottery. Uh, she's also a member of the World Economic uh, Forum uh, Shaping the Future of Consumption Platform. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Malin Berge uh, from MasterCard to join us on stage right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. So in the next 10 years, I believe there will be two types of companies. There will be those who have actively supported the transition to low carbon economies, and there will be those who don't exist anymore. I'm Malin Birch. I have the privilege, as you heard, to lead MasterCard's sustainability innovation agenda globally. That is all about collaboration, and co-creation, and that is why I invite all of you today to take a stance and take an even more active role to collaborate with each other on the sustainability transition 
and co-create with each other. According to recent research, we see that we consume as if we had 1.7 planet Earths. You know what that is like? It's like we um, live our everyday lives, we have a lifestyle that requires us to finance 40% of our expenses with our pension savings. How does that feel in the tummy? Not good, right? That's nothing you would like your family members, your nears and dears, to live by. But that is what we do today with the planet. And even if the planet will be left, humanity is at risk. And as Johan Rockström, chief scientist at Conservation International, co-director at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, put it a few years back, our actions the next 10 years, sorry, our actions the next 50 years will impact the future of humanity the next 10,000 years. The next 10 years, towards 2030, must see the most profound transformation humanity has ever seen. It's the decade of action. And we see that as citizens, consumers, regulators, governments, pick up the adaption and maturity to really enter this sustainability transition. Our latest research shows that 85% of global consumers want to live a sustainable lifestyle, yet they are unable to do so. Governments are picking up with EU and the EU Green Deal. We now see that the 2050 net zero uh, region really looks at decoupling economic growth from use of resources. This means that it's up to the private sector to respond to consumers and citizens' readiness and uh, desireness to live more sustainably and respond to the government leadership, which is actually there more than ever before. And at MasterCard, we of course have a net zero commitment. We do many things to ensure that we minimize the carbon footprint of our own operations, go one, two, three, we work with our suppliers, where 78% of our emissions lie. But this is not where we can have the maximum impact, right? Our maximum impact lies in our business model, bringing together 2.9 billion people through 22,000 banks across the globe, many of them actually in this room today. It's thanks to our collaboration with banks reaching 90 million uh, merchants, furthermore reaching nearly 3 billion people. It's there we have the maximum role and maximum positive impact in the sustainability transition. And this means that we need to invite our ecosystem for collaboration. Because global consumption today shows that 60% of emission relates to what we buy or the production of the things that we buy as consumers, as businesses, as governments. So of course we as MasterCard have a role to bring this ecosystem of banks, merchants, producers, raw material owners, etc., etc to really mobilize and create this action towards decoupling global commerce and the economic growth from the negative impact on people and planet. So how do we do this at MasterCard? How do we harness this massive potential for change? Well, it's obvious that we cannot do it alone. And let me take you a few years back and share another example, which is not about the climate transition, but very much related to a world that fits for everyone. In 2015, our previous CEO went into a World Bank IMF meeting and shared the current status of financial exclusion. Two billion people living in poverty without the ability to having a bank account. And he put up his hand and he said, by 2020, MasterCard and its ecosystem of partners will have brought in 500 million people into the digital economy so they can access the basic democratic rights in society. In addition, we, together with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, created a 
sorry, a financial inclusion lab in Nairobi, Kenya. This was really to spearhead the future solutions for the agriculture sector, farmers, micro-merchants, etc., and make sure that the whole ecosystem collaborated across governments, NGOs, civil society, banks, retailers, and so forth. Because it, because it took all of us to do this together. End of 2020, we reached that financial inclusion target on 500 million people. We doubled it. One billion by 25 is now our goal. And that is why we use, or as you see, we use those labs as catalysts to drive out new solutions and co-create them with our partners. Other examples include our cybersecurity center in Israel, our AI center in Canada, and most recently, we have now set up the Global Sustainability Innovation Lab in Stockholm. This is all about figuring out how a decoupled global consumption system can actually work and providing a platform to drive out new innovation. Of course, we need new solutions. We need to be a build shop for our partners and ecosystem, but also to drive the e execution, implementation, make sure the business model works, make sure the distribution systems works, etc. So, Together with our partners, we create digital solutions which, which really accelerates the sustainability transition. And I'm going to share a few examples later on today. We built it around three main areas. This is the balance between the innovation and execution. So we have an R&D team of front-end developers, back-end developers, designers and so on. Um, design thinking experts, of course, who really looks at what solutions can further respond to consumers' desire to live more sustainably? What solutions can, can be real tools that consumers can use to encourage more sustainable consumption choices? And in order to do so, this team also with the R&D Center focuses on traceability and transparency in value chains. Because if we don't know the sustainability metrics or the social data from raw material through the supply chain until something is sold, how could you then inform a consumer what is a sustainable consumption choice? Secondly, we have labs as a service because at least the banks that we work with have been going through a massive digitalization transition recent years and are still very much in the midst of it, which means that when these sustainability-centric business cases, projects, initiatives comes, a normal response is, perfect, we need to do that, we need to bring that to our customers, but we have to wait 12, 18, 24 months because we have an IT backlog which puts this on priority 27. So then we have equipped teams across the globe, in Singapore, Miami, Dubai, London, New York, that have the same capabilities as I described in the R&D team, but for our customers. So depending on each customer's topic and challenge and the implementation that they want to do or the prototype that they want to build, test in the markets, we bring our teams to them to do it on behalf of them and with them. And thirdly, we have the Experience Center in Stockholm. This is a physical space where we invite uh, customers and partners to tap into the latest research, prototypes, concepts, etc. But of course, also available to anyone, anyone, anywhere in the world. So virtually, you can connect to the MasterCard Experience Center in the next half an hour and get an, uh, access to the latest consumer research and data that we have, as an example. So I mentioned enabling sustainable consumption choices. Let me go into one of the solutions that we are partnering with the Swedish fintech economy to create and bring to customers um, within 22,000 banks across the globe. I think we've heard previously today as well that education has a hugely important role to start behavioral shifts. So how can someone, myself, you in the audience, understand what, is, what the impact is of a transaction for the climate if you don't get educated around that. 
So when the Swedish uh, fintech economy came to us and said, we have mapped all the CDP data going into Standard & Poor's database true cost, covering 15,000 companies equivalent to 99% of global market cap, and we can map the emissions to each transaction through the MasterCard infrastructure. Of course, we started to work with them and see how can we integrate that in our offering so every bank in the world can bring this to every MasterCard user in the world. And that is now available independently of where you live, uh, what offering you have. Every bank can bring this to the customers. And it's really important that our enablement of sustainable consumption choices doesn't lie necessarily in our own new technology. I think most of the solutions, both to tap into the cognitive dissonance of consumers, as this is doing, as well as the traceability and transparency in value chains, those are out there and there are other teams, experts in the specific part of the value chain in this enablement that we can collaborate with, that we can bring to the banks and the merchants. That is why the philosophy around collaboration and co-creation is so important. So I've already shared our two main focus areas, and this is really where we will have 99% of our R&D efforts for a foreseeable time, because we've said that by 2030, we should enable sustainable consumption choices for 3 billion people. Basically, every person paying with a MasterCard should be able to do a more sustainable consumption choice than an alternative. And this is all about decoupling the economic growth from the use of resources, just as EU Green Deal is focusing on, as I mentioned. For us, in the business of global commerce, we see that this means that we are moving from an old economy, which is more product-centric to service-centric, we move from linear into circular, and so forth. In this image, you see representative coverage of both new business models, new behaviors, new regulation required. And I think that is, of course, the three levels of enablement that we see. You need new enabling technologies to support this. We need blockchain-based technologies to create the traceability and value chains. We need new legislative agendas and regulations so we support the transparency amongst producing companies in the world. And we also need this human behavioral shift amongst all of us and to invite everyone for that behavior shift. So I'm going to share with you a very simple first kind of conceptual prototype because I want to share what we bring to our partners in the next couple of months. I won't be able to go into I mean, our agenda working with sustainability innovation at MasterCard. It's about two to seven years from now. What I will share is very much in the near term. And if you want to hear more what we do on the longer term agenda, I invite you to come and have a virtual session with our experience center. But so, We've really looked into what can we do in the immediate term, in addition to educating consumers what the carbon emissions is for each transaction. Well, we think that we can also start showing what good looks like. We have loyalty programs with banks um, across the globe, thousands and thousands and thousands, trying to drive specific consumer behavior. Now we are creating the next generation of such a loyalty and rewards program where we focus on only enabling products, services that are more sustainable than the alternative choice for the consumer. It should have a significantly, significantly lower impact on the planet compared to established alternatives. We, um, let's see, I don't want to play this movie too quickly. I think it's fine. So um, I'm going to share a prototype with you. Before starting that, um, what you will see is a consumer using one of the alternative merchants connected to this solution. In this case, it's a car sharing solution. Um, a bit connected to Sweden, where we have the lab. It's 
the Volvo M solution. And this person signs up to Volvo M, registers his or her MasterCard, and by consuming the service, depending on how far you drive this car, you will earn certain points that you can then redeem in the system of pre-selected, vetted, sustainable merchants or products and services. So she signs up in the Volvo M service, provides the details for her MasterCard, uses the service and gets a notification about the points earned. Could be any kind of currency, doesn't necessarily need to be points, of course. And then go into um, a cohesive set, a marketplace type of platform where you have all the information about both your carbon calculator, total emissions based on your consumption, but also, of course, where you can claim your rewards. And you can either do it, as you see here, examples about renting power tools or consuming plant-based foods or buying a train ticket. Um, or you can, of course, also donate to uh, climate projects. This individual particularly decides to buy a train ticket with the points she earned from the car sharing app. It's just one example. This goes into market tests in Q1 in Scandinavia. And we have a number of, of banks and, of course, merchants working with us. And this is fairly brave, I would say. For the first time, banks are collaborating around a loyalty program. And I think it's required in this sustainability transition. You need to think beyond individual competitiveness and see how can you be relevant to your customer base in the maximum possible way and drive those new solutions efficiently by collaborating with others. You can compete on some areas, and you collaborate on some. I don't have any bank brands on our <laughs> partners here today, because actually everyone has a little bit of, of behind-the-scenes mentality currently. I hope that next time we see each other, I can openly share about all the banks that we do projects with. But they tend to be a little bit uh, more behind-the-scenes. So. What you have here is a representation I wanted to share because it, it requires all various actors in society. You have the economy as a fintech, COAS as um, science-based uh, innovation leaders, Lighthouse Massive brings together startups um, focusing on impact. Houdini is the Patagonia of the Nordics. Axfood is one of the largest grocery retailers in the Nordics. But finishing off with you today, I will actually bring you into the future. This is something different that we do in order to invite leaders in our ecosystems to tap into the right brain, to work with their empathetic listening, and put themselves in a future 30 to 50 years from now. So while the team behind the scenes is preparing now, I will invite you to lean back really comfortably in your chair, close your eyes if you dare, and take a deep breath. And we can take another deep breath. And I invite you to a day in Morgan's life taking place 30 to 50 years from now. Can I get some help to shoot it off? Thank you. You can keep taking that slow, deep breath, and very soon you will enter a day somewhere 2050, 2060, 2070. Let's see if we can get this rolling. It's at least nice to take a break in the day with your eyes closed. And here we go.
Defying Expectations, Monday, September 3rd, 2330. What would she want? Everyone finds parents difficult in one way or another. But Morgan's mum, who'd raised her alone, was aggressively, infuriatingly unconventional. Morgan both admired her for it and found it very trying. Her mother always expected a lot, but was mysterious about what exactly it was she expected. Morgan had mostly given up trying to fulfill her expectations and tried to practice acceptance. This year, though, for her mother's 75th birthday, she was determined to try and find something that she would really love. She could have asked her Zora to run a simulation to try and identify the perfect gift, but that felt like cheating. Somehow she knew her mum would know that she had let her assistant do the job for her. She spent hours logged into the soup, trying to find the perfect thing. The immersive virtual marketplace was like falling into a vibrant, ancient market district along the Silk Road, except that, unlike ancient Samarkand, the latest sense caster tech could be found alongside food items from all over the world, their provenance dashboard and minute-to-minute price index projected alongside each item, flashing happily. Still logged into the virtual suit, late at night, following her nose, she struck aromatic gold. An intoxicating smell, oh so familiar, teased her nostrils. She navigated off the main street and down a small alleyway, the aroma getting stronger all the time. There it was, a small mountain of freshly roasted Colombian coffee beans, rare indeed. Colombia had taken action early and was a pioneer of the new economic model. Their coffee was delicious and very hard to get. She wondered why it was hidden down this side alley. She sighed, stopped asking questions, paid the merchant's assistant a quarter of an earth coin to secure pickup, delivery, and drop off using the zero carbon Ziphia swarm. While Morgan was distracted by something else in the souk, her order flew out of the virtual world into the real world and was received by the Colombiano Supremo Coffee Company, headquartered in Manizales. Morgan logged out of the souk, a satisfied smile on her lips. Her mum always said she hated surprises, so Morgan sent the tracking token to her mum's assistant straight away. Her mum logged into the real-time tracking service and followed along eagerly as the package was cycled to a nearby Ziphia Swarm distribution pad. She oohed and awed as she watched it being picked up by a flying fish drone and flown to Puerto Bolivar, where the drone joined the rest of the regional swarm. The package was then sailed at incredible speeds to her mum's home in the roving archipelago. Individual Ziphia drones peeling off to make other deliveries along the route by sea and air. She was there to meet it on arrival. Despite the fact that her mum had tracked its progress in detail, The package arrived just in time for her mum to complain that Morgan had been, once again, in danger of forgetting her birthday. Morgan, your mum is on standby. Hey mum, how are you? You like it? Yay! That makes me very happy. Yeah, of course I'd love to have a cup with you next time I visit. Yes, just one cup, I promise. I know it's expensive, Mum. I bought it. So, I have some news. I met someone. They're amazing. What? No, we haven't met in the real world yet. Yeah, that's just because you don't understand how the technology works. Wow, thanks for that advice. Okay, love you. I have to go now. Okay, bye. Welcome back to 2022. I wouldn't say this is exactly the future we all desire, but it's one way of putting how we can land living in balance with the planet in a one and a half degree lifestyle. 
And it's not just a gimmick, because this is how we have wanted to bring in science into the work that we do. So the story you heard about um, Morgan is written by Dr. Andrew Marys from Stockholm Resilience Center, and it's based on over 100 scientific articles, combined with the emerging technologies that we see, combined with the Moore's law of all various types of new technology applications, and it's a way to democratize the access to latest research. Because we have all read about the IPCC report, perhaps a summary in a newspaper. Some of you have read parts of the report, and probably one or two in this room have read the actual scientific articles behind the report. And we want to make sure that when, when we look at what the future can bring in terms of new applications that MasterCard can enable with the partners and network, it's actually based on what the science tells us. So this and much more is available in our Sustainability Innovation Lab, of course. Um, this is one way of how it might look. Um, the drones can have had all various um, uh, design in your own minds as you listen to this. The methodology per se is all about you listen, you feel, you imagine, because you've all created something the last few minutes here, and then based on that you act. Um, some of you recognize this gentleman, and I think what he tells is really that we overestimate what we can do in the long term and underestimate in the short term. We all know the carbon law. We need to reduce the emissions with 50% every decade. So we just need to get to work and collaborate and co-create to do that together. Thank you so much. As, um, thanks so much. I might actually keep uh, the other guy on the back. Yeah, yeah. I think it's nicer. <laughs> He's uh, also joining us. You can actually, after the next panel, you can uh, meet Bogdan, who is um, sort of a uh, well, former colleague with, uh, with this gentleman, Bogdan Putinica, is the general manager of, of Microsoft Romania. Um, so as a, as a futurist, and as a foresight expert, that thing was really uh, very good. Um, and it made me think about the long-term perspective that not many of us care, understand, or can envisage. Uh, I know you said that we need to explore more to hear about what happens um, seven years from now or something, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, I really like that, that, that thing. I mean, it's really brilliant. Do you think we could have that in Romania? And Absolutely. I next mean, next year. Next year. Futuring is a you know very established uh, methodology, and I think uh, it is proven to bring out creativity in a totally different way. We have chosen to do this for the sustainability transition, but you can use, of course, the methodology for any type of complex materia. Um, we created four stories um, from our side that relates to various everyday examples. It's about the future of tourism and experiences, this case about the future of logistics and supply chain. We have, speaking about the law, uh, last speaker here, we have an individual connection to biodiversity projects and the future of uh, fashion consumption and production. And for us, it's really important because we believe within these stories there are specific solutions for the commerce ecosystem to try yeah. and figure out now. Um, when can we buy a train ticket in, in Romania to go from Bucharest to Brasov using uh, and getting loyalty points? That's, I mean, the train, the train infrastructure per se is someone else's job. <laughs> but if someone fixes <laughs> the rails and the connections and a single ticket from Romania to Sweden, I will make sure there will be loyalty points to lovely, that ticket. Lovely. Now, there's a lot of questions. I, I, for the sake of time, I, I won't go to, sure. to, to all of them. But um, you mentioned financial education at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, Romania and many countries in the region um, are in one of the lost places usually when it comes to financial education. Um, in the same time, I'm wondering when we talk about sustainability education, let's yeah. call it, um, uh, how do you uh, see your role in the next three, two, three years, right, as sustainability educators? Because if I have two cards, uh, I have more cards actually, but, but uh, how can I become, how can you? As a consumer, how can I, as a consumer, be also educated by you to become more sustainable? 
So what our research shows when we look into this, because it's a specific focus of ours, not the education per se, but what can drive a shifted behavior. And we see that for some individuals, the education is really a mind shift. Like, now I finally understand and I get data and I'm fairly, you know, um, driven by factual and, and numbers. And then the reason for why we deploy and focus on bringing this new loyalty scheme to market as quickly as possible, it's because not all individuals are like that to, to have the information available. Actually, in some cases, that creates rather a, a negative experience. It, it, for some individuals, it works at, as a stick rather than a carrot. And therefore, this reverse model of trying to reward the right type of behavior is just targeting another segment and other type of individuals with other drivers. Yeah. Um, there's a question. Um, what is the biggest challenge that you see in consumer behavior or changing behaviors, especially when we talk about climate change? Because I'm, I'm, it's not easy, right? I think um, a decarbonized consumption needs, needs to evolve. I think we all know, actually, if we look at um, the science and the research, it's about repair, reuse, recycle, rent. Um, and it's about not creating more atoms to drive global commerce, because we can drive economic growth, pro profit and GDP, because that's the system that the whole world has agreed to follow at this point but with less impact on, on people and planet. So um, I believe a lot in the circular economy. We see emerging consumer offers um, in northern part of Europe, western part of Europe, and we just need to make sure the governments are there to enable them and provide the right incentives for them to grow, because scalability is a little bit difficult here in Europe. These models tend to be more successful in the US at the moment with a bigger market and a simpler kind of um, overall go-to-market. So I think the regulation needs to be there and stimulate uh, yeah. the growth of And probably companies. works better in countries like India or uh, large countries um, that, unlike the EU, are not as uh, broken in, in small pieces, right? Um, but speaking of small pieces, um, we have a saying that, that small ideas can lead to big changes. Um, Indeed. And a, a hub or a lab in itself is or should be a place. My dad is a chemist, so I've lived all my childhood in labs, right? Um, is, is a place for experiments and failure. Yeah. Um, financial education or education in general, at least in this part of the world, doesn't really talk about failure. Um, how do you see, and this is more of a personal question perhaps, but how do you see, how do you think we can increase the acceptance of failure in today's society? I mean, putting a context like this platform for innovation and execution and using the word lab, I mean, your interpretation of lab is perhaps white coats and microscopes. That's not what we have in Stockholm. <laughs> but um, just using the word lab relates to experimentation, learning practices, being a learning organization. Um, but I think there is actually something I want to build on based on your previous comment as well. Um, if we speak about India and really big markets, unfortunately, I don't see that it's our role to decarbonize uh, consumption in India at this point. Because if we look at the data again and the, the urgency that we have, the top 1% of the world's population represents 15% of global emissions with their consumption. The top 10% represents 53%. So our focus will really be, in this case, the top of the pyramid, whereas our financial inclusion work previously have been more on the bottom of the pyramid. So yeah. it's really different groups. Can I ask you to go to the next slide? You want to join us? Well, we did, sort of. <laughs> I can't see it now. But, but the slide says, come join us. So how can companies, uh, uh, not just banks or financial inter intermediaries, but also the supply chain, how can they join uh, this movement in itself? So there are various um, projects ongoing. So reach out to us and we will either identify that there is something where you can participate, which is already ongoing actively, um, or, I mean, many of, of our customers reaches out to us because they need a mind shift shift in the organization as well. Um, so we need to try and be that catalyst for them to start changing the way they lead, the way they come as C-suite to the office on Monday morning. And that's also something we can help with with our practices and tools. 
Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Taksumike. Uh, that was uh, Malin Berge from uh, Sweden, from MasterCard. Uh, thank you so much for the trip. Um, uh, it's not easy in these times where uh, there's a lot of work to do. But I think this is, uh, has been for us uh, uh, extremely meaningful to have you here and to have uh, MasterCard as a sustainability partner. So thank you again and a big, uh, 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 and a big um, round of applause, if you want. Uh, thank from Malin. you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, until the seating is done behind me, so this is how magic happens. Now, besides that, um, until we uh, move to the next uh, session, um, I just want to give you a bit of a tour of what happens tomorrow. Um, so we do want to, <coughs> excuse me, have you here with us um, early uh, in the morning. We start with a very, very special moment. You do not want to miss what happens tomorrow at 9 uh, a.m. Um, it is something that you have never seen in your life. I promise you, you have never seen something like this in your life. Uh, no pressure to the uh, team. Um, uh, we have uh, also Ingmar Renzog uh, from uh, We Don't Have Time. Uh, we start with Linda Zeilina, then uh, talking about sustainable finance in Central and Eastern Europe and many other panels um, and speeches. Hmm, magic. Um, has happened. Now, um, <coughs> excuse me. We're going to have a session now in, in English about Romania, but it's not just about our country, it's actually a meta conversation on how do we make the shift to this new economic model that I was talking about previously. How do we change companies? How do we change philosophies of supply and demand? And how do we push for a more sustainable uh, future in the end? Um, I'm very happy to, to invite. On stage, uh, François Bloch, Cecilia Tudor, Cosmin Vladimirescu, and Stamatis Sapkas to join us for this. How do we make the shift to a new economic model? And I'll you have the floor. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. It's. Um, it's like being in a garden here. Yeah. Uh, you, you know the, um, the left side of the backstage, the left for you, it's called the, the, the garden uh, side. And uh, we were there waiting for, for our entrance. And, and I realize now that we move from that garden to, to this garden here. We have real grass be on, on our feet. We have real plants uh, behind. And we will have a conversation in, uh, in, that, uh, in that garden with, um, with our guest, Cecilia uh, Tudor. Uh, from uh, from Renault, uh, country uh, uh, manager, general manager for the for the south uh, east uh, part. If I get it correctly, uh, sorry, my machine is not picked up. Sorry, uh, we have um, Stamatis uh, Sapkas, uh, CFO uh, for Global Wealth Group, and we have uh, Cosmin Vladimirescu, country manager Mastercard uh, Romania. W uh, welcome, uh, welcome uh, everyone. Um, as, as it was mentioned um, earlier, we, we want to talk about uh, the business side uh, now, business side in, uh, in Romania, but you, but you will see uh, beyond, uh, beyond Romania, the business side of the change. We, we spoke a lot today about uh, climate change and, uh, and the need uh, for everyone uh, to adapt, to transition, to pivot, depending on the, the word you want to, uh, to use, towards uh, the objective of uh, decarbonizing uh, the economy and to diminish the uh, ecological uh, footprint uh, to reach this famous uh, 1.5 degrees uh, goal. And this goal can be achieved, of course, if we all uh, play, play our parts. But in our business, uh, we like to talk about uh, products, services, and on one side, it is about redesigning, rethinking uh, the, the products. And on the other side, of course, is on using the product, consuming the, the products. And we will be discussing uh, today uh, both sides of that, uh, that equation. So we will look at uh, what's happening on the uh, automotive uh, industry, on the, the real estate, as well as, uh, as financial services. And, and the, the discussion will be around the uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, the view of the customer will be important as well as your future plans. 
So maybe I will ask um, the, the, the first question um, about uh, the mega trends uh, related to climate change, which is affecting your, your business and, uh, and uh, industry. So how would you describe the, the main challenges but also the, the opportunity. So maybe, Cecilia, if you want to, to start. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, um, to participate to this uh, forum, Francois, and I would like to congratulate you and Beredet team uh, for this initiative, and also for the green grass, real green grass uh, here on the stage. It's a little, little bit difficult to wear high heels on the <laughs> real green, but it is uh, okay. Uh, coming back to your uh, question, um, you know that I'm coming from uh, uh, a spectacular uh, industry as uh, it is involved in the climate uh, change uh, debates. And I give you some figures. Uh, transportation generates 25% uh, of uh, uh, CO2 emissions, uh, out of which 45% are coming for, from uh, passenger uh, uh, road vehicles. Uh, and as the popul population grows, uh, and uh, also people needs uh, grows, uh, the automotive industry role is, is becoming more and more important in the um, uh, reduction of uh, greenhouse uh, gas. Uh, we are all, I imagine, we are all uh, aware of uh, European uh, strategy, um, aiming to, to respond to, to this climate uh, change uh, major uh, issue. Whether if you are, if you are t talking about Euro 7 uh, pollution standard, uh, which will be released in the next uh, period, or we are talking about um, larger projects um, strategically sought out for a, over a longer period of, uh, of time. Um, also, I would like to, uh, to talk about fit, fit for 55, uh, which is a, a, a package, I would say, of uh, regulation uh, that will that impacts uh, really impacts the automotive uh, industry, and this is um, involving uh, carbon neutrality by uh, uh, 2050 in Europe, and also the reduction by 55 percent of uh, uh, green, green, green greenhouse uh, gas uh, uh, emission by 2030, comparing to the level of 1990. In other words, uh, in, from now, by 2050, uh, all, nearly all the cars that uh, will be on the roads should be uh, carbon neutral. And that's impacting a lot the, the automotive uh, <coughs> industry. We have to change all our range, all our models, but it's also an opportunity to evolve, an or, also an opportunity to partner, also an opportunity to um, accompany our uh, clients in order to, for them to make the right uh, uh, choices. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Maybe, uh, Stamatis, you can tell us about the, the real estate. Uh, of course, the electrification is not so much the, uh, the major challenge and opportunity for you. Sure, but, uh, you know, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate in the, in the panel and uh, listening to very interesting discussion points. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of food for thought uh, that is being you know, displayed over, you know, during the course of the day, and hopefully we'll have a little bit more on, on this front as well. What is, um, what is interesting is you know, how companies have evolved and how companies are measured and how this has evolved <coughs> over, over the recent past. Historically, you know, companies, and we all come from the corporate world, we were judged on financial results, but this is far from the truth uh, now. It's a combination of financial results as well as being you know, the overall way that we conduct our business and the overall footprint that we leave behind you know, and creating long-term sustainable value. Real estate clearly is in the, in the center of this, and we've seen this evolution of, you know, from pure financials to having an, a full-shaped uh, program or, you know, focused on ESG, which has, you know, created more and more traction, especially 
you know, since the, um, the COVID-19, um, basically in the last three years, which has accelerated all this evolution. Obviously, real estate, you know, by default creates uh, carbon emissions. It's, you know, we house uh, businesses, but the way we operate in that environment and the way the, you know, the, the offering of that space has uh, really changed over, over time. At Global Worth, for example, you know, at the center of how we developed the, the group has been investing in uh, green uh, properties. You know, most of our portfolio is in green assets. We have about 2.9 billion in, in green properties. That's, you know, about 95% of all of, all our, of all our assets, which is, you know, moving in the right way in providing the right uh, space so corporates, businesses, and people can, uh, can, uh, can grow. It's also very um, interesting that the way the whole uh, world has uh, evolved with increased regulation, increased focus on uh, sustainability, on carbon footprint, uh, initiatives 2030, 2050, uh, but how we, how we get there. Um, and this is something that all of us are focusing on. It's, uh, we're looking at how we operate, how we uh, can improve our carbon footprint. For example, in the real estate business, there's more and more focus on, you know, on Class A buildings with high green credentials. This has shifted from the past where you, know, you had a nice building and people went in. Uh, and this has almost, you know, even in the last couple of years, has increased further from the perspective that more certifications, more proof of health and safety in the building, in the buildings, and how we um, how how we do that. A building that it's well operated, which has you know good credentials, it always you know reduces its carbon footprint, and this is the goal that we that we that we strive on. Also, the fact that you know and everything is interlinked. Also, the fact that there is increased regulation and reporting for, for all of us on financial metrics and non-financial metrics also gives us more opportunities to reflect on what we do, how other people are, are doing things, and how we can improve the way we operate um, our business. And that you know, also adds pressure, but good pressure, to all of us to be, you know, continue to excel more and more. And finally, you know, technology is, is key to be able to achieve all these targets and you know, all these improvements that we all strive on, if it's you know, electric cars, if it's uh, you know, kinetic floors that we add in our, in our buildings, if it's uh, the way we um, you know, arti using artificial intelligence to, more, to operate and monitor how our business and our buildings operate to maximize their efficiency and hence reduce carbon footprint and, uh, and the like. I think with this is... Um, a fantastic time to uh, continue moving ahead. There is much momentum that has been gained over the last couple of years, and we continue to, you know, strive to the to the future. Thank you, thank you, Cosmin. You want to share with us the the, the trends for for Mastercard in, uh, in in Romania? We had your your colleague just before giving us uh, some yeah. ideas about yeah. what's happening with uh, with data, for example. So, what do you see on your side? Well. First of all, thank you for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's an honor to talk about this, this topic, which is very close to my heart. And I want to start by saying that I don't stand before you just as what's written on the name tag. I'm not just Cosme from MasterCard. I'm also a father of two who plans to stick around to see his grandkids grow. In a, in a greener world. I mean, I would love for my kids and for my grandkids to be able to see at least as much as what I saw and what I witnessed and to enjoy uh, what makes Earth uh, amazing, right? So having said that, having these two hats, I'm going back to the to the Mastercard way, to the Mastercard vision, and to Mastercard's power of changing things, not not by ourselves, not alone, definitely, but working together with governments, with philanthropies, with corporates, in order to deploy uh, what is a a sustainable, inclusive economy, uh, which 
allows everybody everywhere to, has act, to have access to financial services and to all digital services. Um, and this is our goal. This is what we want to, to achieve. Maybe Stamatis was talking about pressure, right? Maybe one additional reason. Good pressure. Good pressure. Good pressure. Uh, this is what I meant as well. Maybe an additional reason for uh, me, us, feeling this pressure is because we are Romanians. Yeah, so we know that that still 40% of the 19 million population in Romania, which is completely financially excluded. Now, we do have the tools to bring them into this inclusive economy uh, to financially equip, equip them and obviously also to educate them. But we, we need to pull together uh, in order to shorten the, the distance between them and the financial um, industry. Uh, but we're getting there. I think we're, we're doing great progress. Um, definitely, this is part of our strategy of or goal of uh, doing good by doing well, which means um, bring everybody together in, in this uh, thriving economy, uh, also helping the, um, uh, the planet to become, to become greener and, and better. Um, and we believe that by doing this, people will progress, they will reach their full potential, economies will, will grow, and uh, at the same time, businesses will, will grow as well. Now, coming back to your initial question, uh, what's, the, what's the pressure, uh, how we set our priorities, what challenges are we facing? Um, I would like to mention a few. So first of all, we are fully aligned with the UN business uh, objective of 1.5 uh, Celsius degrees. Um, we are investing heavily into using um, green energy, renewable energy, and uh, we've already managed to have our operations running on uh, this renewable energy. We pledged initially to have a neutral carbon footprint by 2050 and uh, because we do things because they are hard, difficult, not because they are easy, um, we decided to move that timeline ahead a bit by 10 years. So now. Our goal is to, to be carbon neutral uh, by 2040. Thank you. Thank you. To, to, to complement your answer, on the, to, to give a broader view on the, on the financial services and to talk a bit about uh, the banks, I will add to this the fact that the, the banking business is shifting a bit from uh, pure financial into advisor and this is getting more and more important to, to have a discussion with our, with our clients uh, about, uh, about this, uh, this topic, that to understand their market, their ecosystem, their transition as well and to see how we, can, we could accompany them in this, uh, in this transition. Of course, uh, it's, it requires uh, a lot of trainings uh, of our staff and I'm sure that this is also uh, something in which you, you need to invest in all your your companies and, and this event of, is, is a way as well uh, uh, to, to, to generate this, uh, this willingness of uh, gathering information and, uh, and self-developing uh, to, to better understand what's, uh, what's happening. Uh, and then a, a very important piece for us is the change into the way we look at, uh, at uh, credit files. Uh, when I started in the banking industry, we were uh, looking at the credit file purely based on, uh, on financial metrics and, uh, and business plan and projections, uh, but all, uh, all financial. And now we need to add um, uh, more analysis on the ecological and, uh, and social impacts, and we need to, to develop new models, of course, uh, 
uh, to gather data and then uh, to build um, to build our uh, our analysis on, uh, on on this and to complement the, the traditional uh, financial analysis. So, so this is a major change uh, in the way banks are approaching uh, approaching uh, credits. I think just just sure. just just to add because you you mentioned about you know banks, we see more and more the the you know funds investing in green initiatives and being available to, to corporates. So, you know, a few years ago, you didn't have the concept of green financings or green bonds or green loans or companies moving uh, into uh, green loan frameworks and the like, which effectively regulates how you deploy capital. And, it, you know, the more that you are committed to green initiatives, the more financing and the more focus these, uh, these initiatives uh, receive from uh, from, from investors and, and financial institutions as well. Yeah, of course, of course. If we if we talk now about the um, the demand side and, and we and we look at the the, the customer, uh, Cecilia, you yeah. uh, maybe uh, you can share with us your your expectation the, the expectation of your your consumer and their needs, and maybe talk a bit about this famous. Uh, uh, sharing economy where there is no need to own the car as we as we learned uh, a few hours ago because we just use it uh, mm. for, for a few percentage and we need to now um, learn how to share a car. Yeah, it's true. Um, so, um, I would say that um, our customer expectation and uh, more than this, the um, um, Needs the um, needs for mobility are changing a lot uh, in the last years, um, and uh, what we've not noticed in the automotive uh, industry that our customers are looking more and more for fit for purpose uh, uh, solutions, um, uh, aiming to, to to reduce the cost of their uh, journey, and also using uh, vehicles. Um, uh, which are um, environmentally friendly, finally. So, uh, more and more the automotive industry um, needs to, to change and to reinvent itself, because otherwise, others from the market will seize this, um, this opportunity. And uh, for us, it's not, it's not only um, an opportunity to change our range and our models, it's also an opportunity to, um, as I said, and as Cosmin already said, to accompany our customer in order to um, help them to, to choose and to change. And uh, I think that Cosmin is a vivid example uh, here that our customers are more and more preoccupied um, of having a, a better life, a healthier life in a greener uh, environment. Um, and I think that they are uh, becoming more and more conscious that each of us and uh, uh, all together finally we can make, uh, make a difference uh, on our lives. Um, Francois, you were talking about um, uh, car sharing, uh, share mobility. Uh, there are studies um, saying that a personal car is uh, uh, used only 10% of uh, his time. Uh, having this, know, knowing this, some of our client, uh, clients, of course, they are turning to a uh, new solution of mobility. And one of uh, these solutions is, of course, uh, shared mobility, car sharing. Um, Renault uh, understood very well this uh, trend on the, on the market um, and we have uh, almost 10,000 electric uh, cars which are in use in 20, 20 European uh, cities. And the, uh, if uh, in Western Europe the, um, uh, the things are moving faster than the, here in Romania, also here in Romania we made I would say small steps, but uh, efficient one, once I would, I would say. And we have a 300 electric car um, in Spark Fleet, Spark being one of the most important uh, company of car sharing, uh, car sharing in, uh, uh, in Romania. I think that uh, you, you, you already saw this, uh, this car, these cars on the, on, the, on the road. And this is also proof that uh, Romanians consider this shared mobility 
um, an easily accessible one and uh, uh, an eff efficient one in terms of uh, um, environment protection. I think that I... Yes, thank you. But is it good for your business at the end? Um, because you will sell I more, I would uh, say less that cars? it's an op Yeah, we will. Uh, we can sell more. Uh, we could sell more mm, less car, but also it's an opportunity to develop this kind of uh, mobility. The fact that we have uh, we've already invested uh, in share mobility and uh, we have 10,000 cars in Europe, 300 cars here in Romania. Even if the market is not uh, shared mobility is not so developed, means that. Uh, we are involved in this business and we provide providing uh, models for uh, this uh, this activity so it's good so it's an opportunity yeah, as well yeah it's an opportunity as well thank you thank you so on the on the real estate the the sharing mobility is probably uh, we you call that co-working well it's not just the, the co-working i would say from from our perspective the way we we develop our businesses you know look looking and talking to our stakeholders to our you know, including our tenants, the, uh, the wider communities that we're part of. I mean, if you consider that, you know, overall we have about uh, 1.4 million square meters of, of space in which on a normal base 250,000 people visit or pass through. You know, for us, the, um, the goal is to provide the right spaces so the people who come, work, visit our, uh, visit our properties can do that in a... Uh, in healthy environments, in environments where they can uh, feel comfortable, the, where the, you know the business can strive, and they can because they spend you know quite a bit of time of their of their day there. So providing the right accommodation for that uh, for that to happen is is the key goal and target for for us. Clearly, you know we also try to facilitate change. You know, we electric charges in uh, either are already installed or being stored in our in our properties or uh, providing the, the faci those facilities to provide for a greener economy, as well as you know, the buildings themselves providing a more efficient uh, operating environment for, uh, for ourselves, the tenants, and the wider uh, you know, group of people that uh, either work and live or are, you know, are a part of our um, community, of, uh, of the globalist community. Yeah, I can tell you that uh, as an employer, I can testify on the fact that the quality of the environment at, at, at work is a very important piece of the employer proposition. And in the, in the tight labor market that we have in Romania, having a good office space is something which is now critical uh, for our businesses. For, 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 for us, and I think also for, for yourselves as, a, as corporates and as, as tenants, it's, it's clear that you know, being... Uh, Operating in the right environment, you know, improves also the efficiency, improves also the um, collaborative in, uh, spirit of the people working there. So if you feel good where you work, then you, you know, be able to produce more and more efficiently and at, at, at better times. So, and we see as well more and more technology entering into the into the buildings. For sure, uh, you know, you are in one of our uh, in one of our properties. You know, it's. Uh, it's an excellent building, high spec, uh, environmentally friendly, but we always try to push, push the envelope. Every building, we keep adding a little bit more. Our latest office, which was Global World Square in, uh, in Bucharest, you know, was ranked third globally as, uh, in, in, um, in, in green efficiency uh, at, at the time. So it's always you know, something pushing, pushing ahead and always trying to find the next thing that we can you know, help the community and, uh, and, and our stakeholders to, uh, to improve uh, their participation, their occupation. Thank you. Kosmin, what do you see from your customers? What are the needs? What are the questions they're asking? What do they want from you? <laughs> well, um, I have some numbers. I, I have a, a recent study which was done last year, a global study. But before that, I can tell you that and this won't be a surprise for, for anyone. We've been witnessing this, this trend, this migration towards uh, a conscious consumption over the last decade. Um, that's a certainty. We've also, we have also witnessed the fact that the pandemic accelerated this, this trend. So now I think we are at the turning point. Sorry. I have a slight mic issue, but 
hey, I think it's okay to have issues, right? As real as the, as the grass here, uh, and as real as the, the problems we're, we're discussing about. So, I think the society is at a turning point in regards to both supply and demand of this um, new type of, of options, the sustainable options. Um, and let me tell you what were the results of, uh, of this global uh, survey which we did in 2021, so last year. 58% of the respondents said that they are much more mindful about the impact that they have over the environment, and 85% said that they are willing to change the way they live, they, the type of things that they, that they buy, in order to positively impact the, the environment. More than 60% of the, of the consumers acknowledge the fact that companies have a, have a role uh, and they should behave in a more sustainable and eco-friendly way. So they are very much aware that they have to do something and they are willing to do something, to change something. But they are also expecting us to do something different, to change uh, our way of doing things. Obviously, uh, we've all seen this, the main channel for um, distributing information about this is social media. They are openly talking about this in, in social media. Three issues consumers want companies and brands to focus on are reducing waste, close to 40%, 37% of them. Reducing air and water pollution, 35%. And tackling the issue of plastic pollution in packaging and products, also 45%. They are much more aware of the purchases uh, as triggered most probably by the pandemic, 42%. So, yeah, I would say that they, they understand that they have an impact, they want to have a positive impact, they uh, expect some support from, from us. So us as a technology company, we are putting into their hands the right tools, I say, to understand the impact that they have over the environment. There's the carbon calculator, Malin was, was talking about this uh, a bit earlier. Um, and we're also showing them, together with our partners, the way they can either limit the impact that they have, or they can offset the carbon footprint. So there are ways of, of doing this. So that's an interesting uh, area for you, I'm sure, to, to study, to draw conclusion. And, uh, and do you see already the change in behavior, or, or do you, ju do yes. you just see the change, the, the, the willingness to change? Yeah, obviously. I mean, people were honest, and they said that they are willing to do something, and I think we are all witnessing this. I mean, there's an increased appetite for uh, greener energy. Uh, we all have friends, or we know somebody who just uh, got a new solar panel on their roof or they're thinking about buying an electric car. Um, and I think that, you know, it's not only our duty as leaders of, of our companies to find solutions, I think that also we should be openly sharing our view, our experience, uh, to be sort of like a, like a green ambassador, if I may say this, right? Because we are, we are maybe at the forefront of, of this. Maybe we have, because we, we are sitting on all this data, right? And we, we are interested. And, um, and also, I think it's in our DNA to instill change, to drive it. Uh, and I think it's our duty to socialize a bit the, the way we are seeing things, the things that we are doing, what 
can one do in order to offset its, uh, his carbon footprint and stuff like, stuff like that. Yeah. Excellent transition to my next question, oh. what, we, what we can do. <laughs> uh, what we can do. So we, we, we spoke about the, the main challenges, we spoke about the, um, the, the, the customer uh, side. So what do we do from, the, from there? So what do we do next? What do you do next year or within the next few months or within three years, I think? You have a plan. I will tell you what is our ambition in 10 years, in more than 10 years, and then I will refer to the next two years. So, um, our ambition is to reach, uh, the ambition of Renault I'm talking about, is to reach carbon neutrality by 2040 uh, in Europe and then by 2050 worldwide. Uh, um, but uh, we put in place a lot of activity and projects, of course. Um, uh, but today I will refer to a recent plan that will be effective in the next uh, two years, which is tomorrow for uh, the automotive industry. So I, I will mention two, two of this uh, plan. Uh, one, the first one is related to, to, the, to the range. Um, and to the electrification of all new passenger car models that we will launch. Uh, we started to launch, in fact, in 2021. Until 2025, we will launch seven models, seven new model electric car, passenger cars. Um, we already launched three of uh, them, two in 2021, this year, Megane Electric, which we've just launched in uh, Romania this month, in September. And in 2024, um, uh, we will launch two other models and in 2025, 20, uh, other two models. Um, also, the group has created in uh, France uh, the biggest uh, production seat for uh, electric vehicles in order to, um, to provide electric uh, vehicles to the, to the European uh, market. Um, uh, and uh, I will. Uh, I want to tell you also about the project here in Romania. Um, in order to, because we identify solution in order to reduce the um, the carbon the carbon uh, footprint or, of our activity here also. And um, we are work, working um, uh, on a project uh, for use the photovoltaic, as Cosmin uh, already talked about photovoltaic uh, panels. Uh, we have a big project to install photo photovoltaic uh, panels um, uh, uh, in the factory at Mioven and also T2 Technical uh, Center. And I hope, we hope that this project will be uh, effect effective uh, next year, so in 2024. Um, and we've started um, uh, to make awareness campaign with tips and tricks in order to um, um, help our customer and to teach our ha customer on how to, um, to be more friendly with the environment, how to drive a more sustainable uh, um, a car, and how finally to, to prepare uh, together ourself, uh, uh, ourselves for a greener tomorrow. Thank you. So, on the real estate, what is the for the next I will, I will take the, the pass from uh, the photovoltaic uh, <laughs> element. It's something that we, you know, we're also adding share. to... <laughs> share mobility. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, some of our I industrial parks uh, yeah. in Romania. In addition to that, we will, you know, we are continuing to invest in our uh, uh, existing <coughs> portfolio to improve operations and efficiencies both from uh, the equipment side and also to you, through the use of uh, um, a technology, artificial intelligence and the like. I think, it, uh, and also we are, you know, currently, and we've been over the past, uh, in the recent months, further analyzing the sort of like carbon footprint of, of our assets and how we can, you know, set more um, uh, specific targets based on science-based uh, uh, the, the initiatives. Um, I think these are sort of like the more imminent step and, uh, you know, as we, as I said, you know, we've every, every time we try to keep the, uh, push the envelope, trying to find the new technologies to provide the right uh, 
mix that will offer the right spaces for, uh, for, for our tenants. It's interesting to see how, uh, when we talk about environment and uh, improvement and efficiency, uh, very often we, we start talking about technology, digital, etc. So it's really complementary, it's not at all uh, in we're, opposition. I, I, we're not alone in this world, so, the, you know, with the, as I said in the beginning, we're not like, uh, you know, strictly financially driven. Now with the concept like, you know, of stakeholders, identifying your, your stakeholders, what your stakeholders want, what they like. I mean, we started back in, <clears throat> I mean, we are a new, relatively new company. We was, the company was established in 2013. So by 2017, 2018, we had like a full-fledged program of analysis of our stakeholder preferences, see what's important to them, where we can, you know, help them assist and, uh, you know, get to their goals. And that also drives the way we uh, execute our and implement our strategy. So it's not just, you know, building a building and with four, uh, you know, four walls and that's it. It's a, it's a live organism and, uh, you know, all of you, part, it's part of that, uh, that organism. And that's what we, you know, we try to help you to provide um, the, the right, you know, the ingredients to be able to, uh, to operate. grow, uh, uh, you know, the business and create a sustainable future. Thank you. Cosmin, your next plan? <clears throat> yeah, so, very good question. Um, so, I'm very much aware of the fact that for 50 some years we've been at the heart of commerce, flowing money, making sure that payments go safely, fast, secure, affordable, every single place in the planet where trade was needed to be, to be made. And I think that, I think that it's our duty to make sure that we stay in the middle of things. And our job now is to create synergies between governments, corporates, people around the world to make sure that on one hand, they fully understand the impact that they need to have over the, uh, over the planet. The fact that the time to act is now. We don't have any time left to, to waste. And for the ones who've already understood that, is to make sure that they are all pulling together in the in the right direction. Now, um, our plans obviously uh, include uh, pushing forward our current initiatives, such as the Priceless Planet Coalition, and we aim to restore to plant 100 million trees by the end of 2025. Um, to continue um, deploying carbon calculator to empower consumers to better understand uh, what's the impact of uh, the, the consumption and how to improve things there. To use our uh, capabilities in the data and services uh, branch of, uh, of MasterCard to help consumers and companies develop the products and services that they, that they need in order to, to become all greener. Thank you. Thank you. So m maybe we can, uh, we, we can conclude um, uh, here. So what we have been discussing today is that, of course, we, uh, we all take this uh, climate change uh, very seriously and in our, in our long-term uh, plan because we are pushed from, uh, from all sides. Uh, uh, we, we are pushed from the, the civil society, of course. We are pushed by the regulators. We are pushed by our governments. We are pushed by our customers. And what we see, and, and I think that this was a, a common theme that we have discussed, is that, yes, it is, it is a challenge and it is a hard work, but we see opportunities as well to, to, develop, uh, to develop our activities. In order to, to do this, we all need to 
push in the same direction as, uh, as you were saying, and this is, this is uh, very important because customers are not only demanding specific products, but they are demanding behaviors for, from us, new behaviors and, 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 and new proofs that we have understood exactly uh, what, is, what is the issue and that we are responding uh, adequately uh, to, the, to the problem. Uh, so it is for all of us a marathon, uh, not, a, not a sprint. However, we have to, uh, to run relatively fast because uh, uh, clock is, uh, clock is uh, ticking and this is why uh, I was insisting a bit when we were preparing this session on the immediate uh, next steps to show that we cannot wait until uh, 2040, 2050 with, with all our commitment for the, for the net zero, uh, etc. It will be too late uh, to, to wake up at the, at the last minute, but I think that in, uh, in our industries uh, we, are, we, are moving, uh, we are moving forward. We are, taking the, the teams with us. Uh, we spoke about the importance of uh, training as well uh, in order also to, uh, to be able to have the right conversation with our clients. So, thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you very much for your participation today. Thank you, Cosmin, for being a, a partner in this, uh, in this event. And uh, I wish you a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you from me as well, so uh, uh, great to have you with us. Um, we're going to switch to the next uh, panel in a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, I want to thank again um, François Bloch, uh, Bloch <coughs> excuse me, uh, Cecilia Tudor, uh, Stamati Sapkas, and uh, Cosmin Vladimirescu for, for taking on this, uh, this challenge. Now, um, I don't know about you, but one of my first memories in adolescence was connected to something called Windows 95. Um, are there any people in the room that used a 486 computer? Okay. Do you remember um, Office uh, and the Microsoft? So I, I guess you'll remember uh, Windows uh, 95. I'm going to switch because uh, the magic has happened. Um, uh, it's more than two, two decades since I've uh, continuously used Microsoft products and I'm very, very excited uh, that we have Microsoft as a partner um, in the Climate Change Summit and I want to thank uh, them uh, with this occasion, on this occasion for uh, joining uh, the stage. Um, Microsoft is a company that doesn't really need an introduction and neither does uh, Bogdan Putenica, the, the general manager for Romania, but nevertheless, I will actually do one. Um, he has extensive expertise in managing software service operations, leading expertise build up and innovation in fast uh, changing settings. He has uh, more than 20 years uh, in rich and uh, diverse business experiences. Um, he is an author and speaker on leadership and business topics. Um, and um, I must say that uh, he's also um, not just a great um, business leader, but I dare to say a great uh, people leader. So um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, with your, you know, a warm welcome to Bogdan Putinica, General Manager from Microsoft Romania. Thanks, Ciprian. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, to be able to share with you our perspective on a very important topic. We all know that uh, climate is changing and we are very, very close to the brink of the point of no return. There is a latest analysis, obviously by British scholars, that uh, is showing that we are very close to a 50-50 point of no return, uh, reaching the 1.5 degrees warming across the globe versus the industrial age. So the time to act is now, and I'm really happy to be here to share how technology can be used and put in the work of you know, driving this fight against climate change. There is a saying from a EU commissioner, uh, probably you heard Margaret Vestanger, saying that digitization, together with the fight for um, keeping the weather or the climate as it is, is something that it shouldn't stop. And uh, we at Microsoft has put and has constructed tools and technologies exactly to drive this fight forward. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is data. How do we measure the stuff that we do? How do we measure the stuff that we impact our planet with? And for that, Microsoft has published a study 
a statistical exercise and a mathematical wonder. It's called Digi Digital Future Index. It is a sum of more than 2,400 2, public data sources that have been analyzed, gathered, consolidated, and uh, nevertheless referenced between each other, showing how technology can actually impact climate, how technology can help drive the change in the positive way when it comes to climate change. We have found more than 50 correlation, correlations that are powerful, direct, and are linking technology, digitization, skills, to a greener, more healthier planet. We have found that digital technology, together with digital skills, can actually help every country that deploys them in the right way. We have seen countries that are advanced in digital technologies. We have seen populations that are more ready when it comes to skills, living a more greener life, breathing a better air, and obviously leaving a less mark on the planet than before. We have seen impact generated by public policies. We have seen governments impacting the way we look at weather, the way we look at technology, and the way we look at how this is changing across the years. There is a very strong correlations in correlation in countries that have taken this fight forward, and we have multiple examples to see and to share, but I would like to focus the conversation a little bit on how we at Microsoft are impacting this. We have seen, for example, adoption of cloud technologies in the CE area, reducing energy consumptions by more than 93%, 93% less energy consumption driven just by adoption of something that is really popular those days, using the cloud. We have seen companies, and I have an example from Greece, a power utility company reducing their emissions by 160 metric tons of uh, CO2 over the year, over one year, by using the cloud. So this is really powerful. We have an example, because I know you would probably look, look forward to that. An example for Romania, there is a company called Securify, which is using AI and the power of Microsoft Cloud to inspect thousands of kilometers of oil pipes reducing waste, finding breakages, and trying to leave a better mark on the planet. I think if the, uh, if the movie is ready, I'd like to share that with you. It's a very clear example of how that is being used in Romania. Sunt Andrei Gogan, CEO la Securify. La Securify dezvoltăm sisteme de analiză video folosind algoritm de inteligență artificial. Aș vrea să vă prezint un concept dezvoltat împreună cu Microsoft România și anume inspecția video a conductelor de petrol utilizând algoritm de inteligență artificială. Acest concept folosește inovația tehnologiilor Azure Cloud și AI pentru a contribui la identificarea unor potențiale soluții la unele dintre principalele provocări de mediu. Conductele petroliere sunt vaste infrastructuri de multe ori aflate în terenuri dificile. Defectele coroziuni, lovituri de pe conducte, pot duce la scurgeri de combustibil. Scurgerile pot afecta mediul și pot fi sursa unor accidente teribile. Cu toate acestea, odată cu progresul și inovația în domeniul tehnologiei, inteligența artificială poate ajuta în prevenirea unor posibile dezastre. Putem folosi AI-ul pentru analiza în timp real a imaginilor, preluate cu ajutorul dronelor sau de la sistemele de supraveghere, pentru a detecta defecte de pe conducte, sau chiar PET de petrol. Haideți să ne uităm cum ar funcționa un astfel de sistem. Sistemele de AI analizează cadru cu cadru, pixel cu pixel, imaginile video cu conductele petroliere, și alertează echipele de monitorizare când ceva nu este conform. Dacă sistemul bazat pe AI raportează o eroare la o conductă sau un rezervor, echipele de intervenție pot răspunde imediat. AI-ul funcționează perfect cu senzorii Internet of Things, IoT și Big Data. Sistemul preia imaginile de la dronă, le transmite în Microsoft Azure, le analizează folosind algoritmi de AI, iar datele analizate sunt consolidate și corelate cu alte informații trimise de către alți senzori. Dacă o informație este de tip alertă, aceasta este transmisă instant sub formă de e-mail, push, pe telefonul mobil sau SMS, către echipele de intervenție. 
Inteligența artificială monitorizează astfel încât să limiteze și chiar să oprească aceste tipuri de evenimente. În final, totul se reduce la o mai bună protecție împotriva scurgerilor de petrol și altor circunstanțe periculoase. Aceasta este doar una dintre utilizările sistemelor de AI pentru a ne îmbunătăți viața și proteja mediul. Well, incredibil. And this is just a very simple and straightforward use of technology. We've been talking during the day and also in my, my early speech about skills and we've, what we found out analyzing all the data that we have available at, uh, at our disposal that we need technical skills. We need actually to tween digitization with green projects and green policies, which is actually one of the reasons why I have a lot of enthusiasm looking forward at uh, the Resilience and Recovery Fund projects that are coming in Romania later this year and probably in the next years as well. There is a strong push for green, there is a strong push for technology, and I hope there will be a strong push for cloud, because this is actually showing how technology can make an impact. In Microsoft, we are also not just part of the conversation. We take our own pledges and commitments against green goals. The company is committing that by 2030 we will reach carbon negativity, which is slightly better than carbon neutrality, which is a very popular term those days. But we look at negativity and we are switching our data centers, which are spread all over the world, to renewable power sources. For some of you that are following this, you've probably noticed a research project that a couple of years ago we have run um, on the coast of England. We've actually submerged a cylinder, uh, a train-sized cylinder, which was actually a very, very small data center, underwater, in the ocean, to see what happens with technology. And there were a couple of very interesting learnings coming out of that experiment. First of all, the, the data center was submerged for close to two and a half years. And during those years, the error rate of the technology inside this closed environment was actually much less than a normal data center that we operate in a physical setup somewhere on the planet Earth. Obviously, you know, we could joke that it's because of lack of human intervention, the level of errors were such, such, such small. But it, there are also some other things uh, related to cooling, the atmosphere in the data center, which was, uh, which was a gas different than oxygen, and so on. But those kind of initiatives get us closer to something that I think will benefit us all. If we can take those kind of pledges seriously, we as a society, as an economy, not just Microsoft, I think we will see an impact being generated. We are also part of something that we call climate innovation funds, which is, which is our own investment fund valued at a billion dollar that Microsoft is deploying around the world, investing in, co in companies that can actually promote and take forward this initiative that we are talking about. There are a couple of investments and they will continue as well in the next couple of years. So we are pretty serious about that. But this is part of a dialogue that we should all have as a society, as an economy, together with public sector. I've been talking about public sector policies, they are relevant and the state has a, has a major role in that. And it all starts with us, with, with the people, with, with the humans that form the society. And we've seen Romania being in, in, in the front line of talent when we talk about uh, Europe, when we talk about worldwide, actually. Our people are one of the strongest values that this country has. More than 200,000 of them are working in the technical sector. And I think this number is growing every, every year. So from our perspective, the country and overall, I think the educational system has to double down on, on this talent. It is a very strong force of change and of revolution in the society. And I would like to see more of those policies being implemented and driven at the country level. And talent is a very, I would say, present topic, which I know a lot of people are asking us about, you know, how is it going? Do you still have people? Do you still have talent? And maybe that's a conversation for a dialogue that will follow later on. But, you know, I would be happy to, to take more questions if there are any, and happy to engage with you if you would like to, to learn more about our policies as a technical company in this field. Really happy to be here, Ciprian. Thank you for inviting us. So, uh, the questions already... Uh, Go. Uh, ah, it works, technology. 
technology always works, but sometimes technology doesn't work. Um, right. So I will start with a question on my own, and then I have a lot of questions that we got on the online um, and in the event app where these people and others are actually asking. Um, sometimes technology feels like a fake promise. Mm. We have this technology, so therefore the solution is right, it's going to happen. But uh, the transition is not always uh, sinuous. It doesn't really happen. We have, in theory, technologies available around the world to help us move forward, but that doesn't really happen. So how can we break that, that lag that it, it always seems to happen uh, between, you know, we have the tech, but it doesn't really get, uh, it's not really implemented or it's not really um, in the market. Well, Ciprian, talking about tech adoption, it's, it's a really good topic and I think we need a full day for that. But I'll give you a couple of points from, from my perspective. Um, technology is there. We already have the power, we already have the brains, we already have the muscles to use technology. And why we don't use it? Because change is difficult, first of all. Industries are still living probably a, a medieval age of technology. You know, we, we talk about gas emissions and stuff like that. But, you know, we need coal, we need steel, we need... Uh, you know, chemical industries and so on. This takes time and money. Governments are just beginning to probably engage and if you're following the COP sessions and summits, you know, you see governments coming together and talking with an increased sense of urgency about the need to change it, about the need to adopt. And I would like to actually put a little bit of faith into that, you know, because if we do it or if we don't do it, you know, the change is here. We all know the data, science is showing us that temperature is rising and you know there is a point a dipping point where you know nothing can be done anymore we all seen the the ice caps melting and stuff like that and yes i think it takes a little bit of courage i think it takes a little bit of realism to to say okay we need to do and we need to stop talking uh, it starts with every single one of us you know how do we recycle how do we behave with the nature with the planet and in the end i think this change will scale up into governments, into public policies, into industry adoptions and stuff like that. I'm really happy to see companies taking, uh, and you know, the panel before was talking about that. Companies are taking this really seriously. There is a level of ethics in the, in the CSR approaches that you know, we are bringing, in the ESR approaches that we are bringing to those conversations, when environment is suddenly a variable that is part of the strategy of every such company. And yes, I think there will come a time, if not already, you know, the beautiful story of Patagonia, you know, with the, with the owner giving away the company to, to basically protect and fight against climate change, where people will actually have a choice. They will have a choice to say, okay, I like this company more, I like this company less, and by this choice I'm reducing my carbon footprint or the impact that I'm doing. Yeah, I have a lot of questions. Uh, one on... on how do we measure? But before that, yeah. um, I have a question which is actually about companies and organizations. So mm. um, the question is, how do you reward or if reward financially your executives for non-financial environmental performance? And what is a fair share of uh, the variable pay component for uh, reaching such results? So this is a very complicated question because th th there aren't that many um, examples. But Absolutely. in the future, well, first of all, um, I think it starts with commitment. And we as a publicly traded company, we made several such pledge pledges in the past years. You know, we've committed to reduce our carbon footprint to become negative and so on. Those are uh, corporate macro objectives. You know, it's beyond the KPI. It's something that is part of multi-annual strategies that the market, the street is actually looking at. And they are punishing the company or, you know, rewarding the company, if you want, from a share value perspective, if we actually make true to our promises. Fundamentally, for Microsoft, I think this is a, a question of trust in our, uh, in our capability to deliver on our promises. Obviously, there is no game here. So, you know, what we say we will do and we are doing, we are spending the money and making the right moves towards this. And this is, I think, the fundamental way of keeping ourselves responsible, making public pledges to the society, to the public, and living up to those expectations. I think it's in the, in, if you aren't in the um, uh, vertebral um, principle of how we operate. You know, we are trusting, we are ethical, and we do what we say. That's, I think, the best measure of success when it comes to financial performance in those kind of objectives. Yeah. Um, speaking of performance, uh, we need to measure performance, but we also need to measure the way our companies behave mm. uh, in terms of. Uh, 
behavior, if you like, not just towards the planet, but also towards the people. Sure. Um, how can we m m better use technology to measure our own, as companies, uh, our own uh, output in the end? Well, um, there is something that I think is fundamentally helping societies in this region that we are living at sea. And, you know, in the next years, we will scale this model in other, other areas. Using technology and using cloud, we've consolidated, and I've shared with the audience earlier before, uh, I think a trove of data. 2,400 public sources of data are being gathered into a single portal, Digital Future Index which allows you to, to build correlations. What is the ratio of uh, skills versus, let's say, um, uh, the clean air landscape in a certain country, and so on. So, you know, using these kind of things, and using, obviously, the power of cloud for sustainability, which is, you know, our own strong product in this space, you can measure, you can capture data, you can analyze data, you can cross-reference data, and I think when it comes to, to sustainability, you can see what's the impact of what you're doing. Companies use this kind of technology, for example, um, um, water supply companies, you know, they, they take all this, da all this data, it's really not so much uh, brain surgery in it, sensors, inputs, variations, and they see, you know, if their production uh, chain, if their industrial approach to, to the operations are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it takes an enormous amount of calculation and, and power to do that. That's why cloud, I think, comes very natural into this. It's a very straightforward approach to sustainability. Yeah. Um, similar to banks, yeah. you work with everyone. Yeah. Um, and Microsoft has been working for decades with and for everyone to some extent. Um, and we have been also working for you to some extent as customers, right? Um, if you look at the, the customers, and you naturally have most of the people within reach, um, what are some of the sustainability challenges that you feel companies large, medium, uh, even the state uh, have, and, and how can technology actually help them uh, achieve more progress faster because what we've had one of the conclusions that I draw from today is that we don't really have that much time and time is actually against us or we are against it to some extent. Well, this is a pretty good question, Ciprian. Um, everybody, I think, you know, is in a rush to do something and of course, if you take this from a theoretical approach, what should we do? Uh, first of all, we should start with understanding the problem. What is the problem? <laughs> what are we doing? What is the outlook or the outcome of what we're doing? And for this, technology is really good. Okay, as a human being, you can remember so many things, but technology can keep track of years, of past performance, of current performance, and why not provide um, estimations of your future impact when it comes to this. Understanding what you do, I think, is the first step um, in, in taking the right decisions. And then, of course, when you, when you actually start doing something, measure that impact. For this, I think our approach is, is very simple. We suggest, you know, uh, a very, you know, I've been talking about doubling down on talent, doubling down on technology, on investment, on public policies, on leaking uh, digitization to green impact, I think is fundamental. And it starts, obviously, from, you know, the, the, the bottom ones of us to the top ones, you know, the macro policy makers they have to link those two together. And Romania, I think, is beginning to do stuff. I've seen companies in Romania acting on that. And when you talk about fast, every single time you talk about fast, 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 you know, what can you use as fast? You know, obviously, technology, computers. They are built to be fast, resilient, and so on. And think about the example that I quoted earlier. A simple use or migration, if you want, from, you know, traditional technology setups to the cloud, reduces your ele electricity bill by 93%. That's a very simple and, you know, out there step that you can do as a company and with they, immediate impact. And these days, uh, well, bills... Uh, <laughs> Energy bills are to the roof. Yeah. There's, a, there's a complicated question. Uh, can technology help us prevent or detect greenwashing? Um, I mean, this is, to a large extent, um, about the way we perceive certain companies and their actions as being, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't say fake, but, but overinflated. Um, but I would reverse this question to um, how can companies that want to be active in climate actually become active in climate by using technology? Is there something there that, that they can use 
not just to become more sustainable, but to actually act more sustainable uh, outside there? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, I think for a company those days, you know, that is in is in 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 the search for, I think, generating impact. For me, this is a very powerful word, impact. Okay, a company can take this very pragmatically and say, okay, I'm buying. Uh, uh, green certificates for this amount of dollars uh, every year and you know this is a cost for my business and I want to take it down and reduce it but for companies that are seeking to generate impact I think it starts with a very clear strategy you know and this is never going to be short term it, I think it takes a lot of time to change I think it takes a lot of time to retool to re-industrialize to reassess supply chain industry chains and so on and you know you have to start somewhere what are, you, what are you going to do? For us, for example, in Romania, one way that we are driving this impact that I, I talk about so often is by helping people become more digital. This is an immediate, I think, impact that we as Microsoft can drive into, in, into Romania, and I'm a strong believer in education. If we help the workforce of the country become more digital, if we help the government digitalize public services, I think the direct correlation that our data shows is that this will lead to a greener future for the country. And of course, we are just one company showing that. There are many other companies on this stage talking about this. And again, don't forget, we live in Romania, so change takes time. I think change takes time all throughout Central and Eastern Europe, and I dare to say around the world um, these days. Change, unless we're in a country that moves already fast, is, yep. is, is slow. Now, you said about public service, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, services. So tomorrow from three, we have in the climate uh, futures uh, stage a conversation with the Romanian ministers of uh, economy and environment. And I would really like you to ask them a question, and I will write it down, um, because we talk a lot about the green and digital economy hmm. uh, in Europe, and this is, you know, one, uh, one future that we would like to go towards. Um, what would you ask the government, in this case, these two ministers? Um, and uh, hmm. what's, a, what's a question that the business environment, in, in the end, uh, would like to always put? Well, when it comes to, to our government, I think, um, you know, oversimplifying, and since it's just one question, uh, I will ask them to give a clear roadmap. Um, roadmap being the translation in public speech of uh, milestones, deadlines, of when and what they are going to do to actually build upon this, this enormous potential that we have as a country to link the two topics together, digital and green. And this is an easy question for each of them. I think they have pages of strategies that you know, they can talk about for hours. But I would, again, twist the question, as you are saying, when and what? A roadmap, you know. Give us a roadmap from you know, your position as a government official. For the next couple of years, of course, you don't know what happens next year in, in, in public governments here. You can change or you can be, be replaced. But I think you know, we all need that. You know, we need to see a plan, or at least a plan, and then we need to keep ourselves accountable for executing against that. Well, our plan is to thank you very much <laughs> uh, at this point. Uh, it's great to have you on board, uh, not just you personally, but also the company. Um, and we're very thankful uh, for kicking it off. Um, and uh, let's give a big round of applause. Thank to, you, Ciprian. To thank, you. thank you, everybody. Now, last but not least, um, uh, we have a special moment in, in the summit. Um, uh, and we have a message um, all the way from India, from Sadhguru, from our uh, first uh, Climate Change Summit edition. Um, so for those of you that uh, don't know him, he's ranked most, uh, among the 50 most influential people in India. He's a yogi, uh, he's a New York Times best-selling author. He has been uh, confirmed the Padma Vibhushan by the Government uh, Award of India, the highest uh, civilian award. Uh, he's also the founder of the world's largest people's movement, Conscious Planet Safe Soil, which has worked with over nine, uh, 3.9 billion people, uh, among many, many other things. Uh, so let's see um, a short video, um, if we can, from Sadhguru. Greetings and best wishes to all of you who are at the Climate Change Summit. My uh, respects to the Prime Minister of Romania, many ministers from various other countries, the business leaders, the civic leaders, and all responsible people who are working for this cause 
of uh, climate action to address the climate change situation in the world. As all of you know, in Europe, this year, Europe and UK have been reeling under drought conditions. There are many, many reasons. All of it is not immediately changeable. One important thing that we can do is definitely change the quality of the soil. If the organic content in the soil is much higher than what it is right now, the water retention capability of the soil is greatly enhanced. Enhancement of organic content by one percentage in the soil adds 20,000 gallons of water per acre. There you have your firefighter right there and drought fighter right there, famine fighter right there. This is an express need. I congratulate all of you for having assembled to address this issue that soil organic content and enhancing the soil organic content, leaving living soils for future generations is the most important responsibility that we hold as a generation of people. Let's make it happen. Thank you very much. Once again, I congratulate all of you. My best wishes with you. Thank you very much. And speaking of food, we talked about food earlier and it's important to eat, but most of the time the food comes from the soil. So I think that we have another short video from uh, Sadhguru and then we wrap it up um, if the tech team is ready, let's see uh, the second video where we talk about soil and uh, what do we do with the land that we grow our uh, food and uh, not only uh, on. Namaskaram to all of you. Please pardon me if I say something which is uh, mm, <laughs> maybe a little unscientific in your perception. I am not a scientist by any standards, but I've lived on this planet. People say, hasn't everybody lived on this planet? No, I disagree with that because most people live in their heads. I live on this planet because I don't have anything much in my head. I just live on this planet like a worm. And I know this planet by my life's experience. Generally, the international East scientists agree that uh, 32 to 36 percent of the global warming could be happening because of agricultural activity and especially soils being left open during summers, a ploughed soil being left open without any shade or without any cover or without any living crop on top of it. I was talking to uh, an environment minister of a particular nation, an important nation in the world, uh, and uh, this person told me, Sadhguru, I was there for six days in the COP26. I did not hear the word soil. I, I cannot understand how you can address climate change, how you can address sustainability on the planet without addressing soil. It is the thing. The soil is a living entity. I don't have to tell you this, all of you are invested in this, but I'm saying we are not... the larger world is not understanding that soil is a living entity. We are trying to treat it like material. It is not material, it is a living soil. It is out of this a worm, an insect, a bird, an animal, a tree, and you and me have come out of. Most people don't get this till you bury them, that is a whole problem. We, we must understand it's a living soil. In this country, we have referred to... in India, we have always referred to soil as mother soil. And if we do not see the aliveness of the soil, uh, we will miss the whole point. Yes, climate change is a concern, it's a great concern, I'm not trying to in any way bring down the significance of that. Yes, carbon emissions are a great concern, but soil is something very, very important because other things can be fixed in reasonable amounts of time. But if soil goes bad, then life is gone in many ways. So it's extremely important, as all of you know, that uh, many responsible agencies in the world have clearly said we approximately have uh, about 80 crops worth of topsoil on the planet, which is just 40 to 60 years' time. So what is our plan for the future? I feel soil is not our property. Soil is definitely not our property, it's our legacy. The previous generations have given it to us, to give it in that condition at least to the next generation is a fundamental responsibility that we have as a, as a generation of people. Uh, this is not about me, this is not about you, this is a generational responsibility that we must fulfill.
So let's not forget um, that uh, climate change has no borders. And as you've seen, uh, all the way from New York to India and many other countries, um, there's a constant and, and uh, I'd say complicated uh, need to be addressed, uh, which is that uh, solutions to climate change are not necessarily just uh, not just not easy, um, but they actually require uh, you know, more complex problem solving. Now, uh, on this uh, topic of problem solving, I don't have a problem, uh, but I do hope that tomorrow you have a problem, and that problem is deciding which stage are you going to go to. So tomorrow morning we meet here, we start at 9, so please, please be here by maximum, let's say, 8.30, uh, roughly, 8.45. Um, we have uh, two uh, stages tomorrow, again, it's a full day, um, uh, and we are very happy and thankful uh, to have you uh, with us and uh, roughly, I think, uh, between five and 6,000 people that watched uh, today or are actually watching even now um, uh, our uh, Climate Change Summit uh, from, um, uh, I think, Australia all the way to, to, to New York. Now, um, a big thank you to our founding partners from uh, Berede and uh, our partners uh, from Microsoft, our sustainability partner from MasterCard, our strategic partner, the Secretariat General of the Romanian Government, Oshan, uh, Global Solution Center from Societe Generale and NL. Uh, and um, um, a huge thanks on my behalf um, to um, uh, my team from Social Innovation Solutions. Uh, it's not easy to do this, um, but it's also very nice. And we're not doing this uh, because it's uh, not just, well, maybe it's hard, but we're doing this because we feel that it matters. Uh, I want to say a, a, you know, a personal thanks to Roxana, who's uh, right here on the left. Uh, for taking uh, care of all the people that came um, and I hope uh, we meet again tomorrow. Don't forget, I'd say maximum 8.45. Um, uh, and I think that's about it. I declare the first day of Climate Change Summit closed um, and I wish you all a pleasant evening. See you tomorrow morning and thanks to all the speakers for uh, joining us from all over the world. Thank you.